Section 1 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. Preface, First Part, Chapter 1, Part 1. Preface. This narrative will comprehend not only all the explorations made in past ages, but also all the new discoveries which have of late years so greatly interested the scientific world. In order to give to this work, enlarged perforce by the recent labors of modern travelers, all the accuracy possible, I have called in the aid of a man whom I with justice regard as one of the most competent geographers of the present day, Monsieur Gabriel Marcel, attached to the Bibliothèque Nationale. With the advantage of his acquaintance with several foreign languages which are unknown to me, we have been able to go to the fountainhead and to derive all information from absolutely original documents. Our readers will, therefore, render to Monsieur Marcel the credit due to him for his share in a work which will demonstrate what manner of men the great travelers have been, from the time of Hanno and Herodotus down to that of Livingstone and Stanley. Jules Verne Chapter 1. Celebrated Travelers Before the Christian Era. Hanno 505, Herodotus 484, Pythias 340, Nearchus 326, Eudoxus 146, Caesar 100, Strabo 50. The first traveler of whom we have any account in history is Hanno, who was sent by the Carthaginian Senate to colonize some parts of the western coast of Africa. The account of this expedition was written in the Carthaginian language and afterwards translated into Greek. It is known to us now by the name of the Periplus of Hanno. At what period this explorer lived, historians are not agreed, but the most probable account assigns the date B.C. 505 to his exploration of the African coast. Hanno left Carthage with a fleet of sixty vessels of fifty oars each, carrying thirty thousand persons, and provisions for a long voyage. These emigrants, for so we may call them, were destined to people the new towns that the Carthaginians hoped to found on the west coast of Libya, or, as we now call it, Africa. The fleet successfully passed the Pillars of Hercules, the rocks of Gibraltar, and Theuda, which command the strait and ventured on the Atlantic, taking a southerly course. Two days after passing the Straits, Hanno anchored on the coast, and laid the foundation of the town of Thumiaterian. Then he put to sea again, and doubling the Cape of Solo Ice, made fresh discoveries, and advanced to the mouth of a large African river, where he found a tribe of wandering shepherds camping on the banks. He only waited to conclude a treaty of alliance with them before continuing his voyage southward. He next reached the island of Cern, situated in a bay and measuring five stadia in circumference, or as we should say at the present day nearly 925 yards. According to Hanno's own account, this island should be placed, with regard to the Pillars of Hercules, at an equal distance to that which separates these pillars from Carthage. They set sail again, and Hanno reached the mouth of the river Shreets, which forms a sort of natural harbor. But as they endeavored to explore this river, they were assailed with showers of stones from the native Negro race, inhabiting the surrounding country, and driven back, and after this inhospitable reception they returned to Cern. We must not omit to add that Hanno mentions finding large numbers of crocodiles and hippopotami in this river. Twelve days after his unsuccessful expedition, the fleet reached a mountainous region, where fragrant trees and shrubs abounded, and it then entered a vast gulf which terminated in a plain. This region appeared quite calm during the day, but after nightfall it was illumined by tongues of flame, which might have proceeded from fires lighted by the natives, or from the natural ignition of the dry grass when the rainy season was over. In five days, Hanno doubled the cape, known as the Hespera Keras. There, according to his own account, he heard the sound of fifes, 
cymbals, and tambourines, and the clamor of a multitude of people. The soothsayers, who accompany the party of Carthaginian explorers, counsel flight from this land of terrors, and, in obedience to their advice, they set sail again, still taking a southerly course. They arrived at a cape, which, stretching southwards, formed a gulf called Notu Keras, and, according to Monsieur Davizac, this gulf must have been the mouth of the river Oru, which falls into the Atlantic almost within the Tropic of Cancer. At the lower end of this gulf they found an island inhabited by a vast number of gorillas, which the Carthaginians mistook for hairy savages. They contrived to get possession of three female gorillas, but were obliged to kill them on account of their great ferocity. This Notu Keras must have been the extreme limit reached by the Carthaginian explorers, and though some historians incline to the belief that they only went to Bojador, which is two degrees north of the tropics, it is more probable that the former account is the true one, and that Hanno, finding himself short of provisions, returned northwards to Carthage, where he had the account of his voyage engraved in the temple of Baal Moloch. After Hanno, the most illustrious of ancient travelers was Herodotus, who has been called the father of history, and who was the nephew of the poet Panyasis, whose poems ranked with those of Homer and Hesiod. It will serve our purpose better if we only speak of Herodotus as a traveler, not an historian, as we wish to follow him so far as possible through the countries that he traversed. Herodotus was born at Heliconarsus, a town in Asia Minor in the year B.C. 484. His family were rich, and having large commercial transactions, they were able to encourage the taste for explorations which he showed. At this time, there were many different opinions as to the shape of the earth, the Pythagorean school having even then begun to teach that it must be round. But Herodotus took no part in this discussion, which was of the deepest interest to learned men of that time and, still young, he left home with a view of exploring with great care all the then known world, and especially those parts of it of which there were but few and uncertain data. He left Helicarnassus in 464, being then twenty years of age, and probably directed his steps first to Egypt, visiting Memphis, Heliopolis, and Thebes. He seemed to have specially turned his attention to the overflow of the banks of the Nile, and he gives an account of the different opinions held as to the source of this river, which the Egyptians worshipped as one of their deities. When the Nile overflows its banks, he says, you can see nothing but the towns rising out of the water, and they appear like the islands in the Aegean Sea. He tells of the religious ceremonies among the Egyptians, their sacrifices, their ardor in celebrating the feasts in honor of their goddess Isis, which took place principally at Bucyrus, whose ruins may still be seen near Boucher, and of the veneration paid to both wild and tame animals, which were looked upon almost as sacred, and to whom they even rendered funeral honors at their death. He depicts in the most faithful colors the Nile crocodile, its form, habits, and the way in which it is caught, and the hippopotamus, the momot, the phoenix, the ibis, and the serpents that were consecrated to the god Jupiter. Nothing can be more lifelike than his accounts of Egyptian customs, and the notices of their habits, their games, and their way of embalming the dead, in which the chemists of that period seem to have excelled. Then we have the history of the country from Menes, its first king, downwards to Herodotus's time, and he describes the building of the pyramids under Cheops, the labyrinth that was built a little above the lake Morris, of which the remains were discovered in A.D. 1799, Lake Morris itself, whose origin he ascribes to the hand of man, and the two pyramids which are situated a little above the lake. He seems to have admired many of the Egyptian temples, and especially that of Minerva at Sais, and of Vulcan and Isis at Memphis, and the colossal monolith that was three years in course of transportation from Elephantina to Sais, though two thousand men were employed on the gigantic work. After having carefully inspected everything of interest in Egypt, Herodotus went into Libya, little thinking that the continent he was exploring extended thence to the Tropic of Cancer, 
He made special inquiries in Libya as to the number of its inhabitants, who were a simple nomadic race, principally living near the sea coast. And he speaks of the Ammonians, who possessed the celebrated temple of Jupiter Ammon, the remains of which have been discovered on the northeast side of the Libyan desert, about 300 miles from Cairo. Herodotus furnishes us with some very valuable information on Libyan customs. He describes their habits, speaks of the animals that infest the country, serpents of a prodigious size, lions, elephants, bears, asps, horned asses, probably the rhinoceros of the present day, and cynocephaly, animals with no heads, and whose eyes are placed on their chest, to use his own expression foxes hyenas porcupines wild zaras panthers etc he winds up his description by saying that the only two aboriginal nations that inhabit this region are the libyans and ethiopians according to herodotus the ethiopians were at that time to be found above elephantina but commentators are induced to doubt if this learned explorer ever really visited ethiopia and if he did not he may easily have learnt from the egyptians the details that he gives of its capital mero of the worship of jupiter and bacchus and the longevity of the natives there can be no doubt however that he set sail for tyre in phoenicia and that he was much struck with the beauty of the two magnificent temples of hercules he next visited tarsus and took advantage of the information gathered on the spot to write a short history of phoenicia syria and palestine we next find that he went southward to arabia and he calls it the ethiopia of asia for he thought the southern parts of arabia were the limits of human habitation he tells us of the remarkable way in which the arabs kept any vow that they might have made that their two deities were uranius and bacchus and of the abundant growth of myrrh cinnamon and other spices and he gives a very interesting account of their culture and preparation we cannot be quite sure which country he next visited as he calls it both assyria and babylonia but he gives a most minute account of the splendid city of babylon which was the home of the monarchs of that country after the destruction of nineveh and whose ruins are now only in scattered heaps on either side of the euphrates which float a broad deep rapid river dividing the city into two parts on one side of the river the fortified palace of the king stood and on the other the temple of jupiter belus which may have been built on the site of the tower of babel Herodotus next speaks of the two queens, Semiramis and Nitocris, telling us of all the means taken by the latter to increase the prosperity and safety of her capital, and passing on to speak of the natural products of the country, the wheat, barley, millet, sesame, the vine, fig tree, and palm tree. He winds up with a description of the costume of the Babylonians, and their customs, especially that of celebrating their marriages by the public crier. After exploring Babylonia, he went to Persia, and, as the express purpose of his travels was to collect all the information he could relating to the lengthy wars that had taken place between the Persians and Grecians, he was most anxious to visit the spots where the battles had been fought he sets out by remarking upon the custom prevalent in persia of not clothing their deities in any human form nor erecting temples nor altars where they might be worshipped but contenting themselves with adorning them on the tops of the mountains he notes their domestic habits their disdain of animal food their taste for delicacies their passion for wine and their custom of transacting business of the most utmost importance when they had been drinking to excess their curiosity as to the habits of other nations their love of pleasure their warlike qualities their anxiety for the education of their children their respect for the lives of all their fellow creatures even of their slaves their horror both of debt and lying and their repugnance to the disease of leprosy which they thought proved that the sufferer had sinned in some way against the sun the india of herodotus according to monsieur vivian de saint martin only consisted of that part of the country that is watered by the five rivers of the Punjab, adjoining Afghanistan, and this was the region where the young traveler turned his steps on leaving Persia. He thought that the population of India was larger than that of any other country, 
and he divided it into two classes, the first having settled habitations, the second leading a nomadic life. Those who lived in the eastern part of the country killed their sick and aged people and ate them, while those in the north, who were a finer, braver, and more industrious race, employed themselves in collecting the auriferous sands. India was then the most easterly extremity of the inhabited world, as he thought, and he observes that the two extremities of the world seem to have shared nature's best gifts, as Greece enjoyed the most agreeable temperature possible, and that was his idea of the western limits of the world. Medea is the next country visited by this indefatigable traveler, and he gives the history of the Medes, the nation which was the first to shake off the Assyrian yoke. They founded the great city of Ecbatana, and surrounded it with seven concentric walls. They became a separate nation in the reign of Deoces. After crossing the mountains that separate Media from Colchis, the Greek traveler entered the country, made famous by the valor of Jason, and studied its manners and customs with the care and attention that were among his most striking characteristics. Herodotus seems to have been well acquainted with the geography of the Caspian Sea, for he speaks of it as a sea quite by itself and having no communication with any other. He considered that it was bounded on the west by the Caucasian mountains and on the east by a great plain inhabited by the Massagite, who, both Arian and Diodorus Siculus think, may have been Scythians. These Massagite worshipped the sun as their only deity, and sacrificed horses in its honor. He speaks here of two large rivers, one of which, the Araxes, would be the Volga, and the other, that he calls the Ista, must be the Danube. The traveler then went into Scythia, and he thought that the Scythians were the different tribes inhabiting the country that lay between the Danube and the Don, in fact, a considerable portion of European Russia. He found the barbarous custom of putting out the eyes of their prisoners was practiced among them, and he notices that they only wandered from place to place without caring to cultivate their land. Herodotus relates many of the fables that make the origin of the Scythian nation so obscure, and in which Hercules plays a prominent part. He adds a list of the different tribes that compose the Scythian nation, but he does not seem to have visited the country lying to the north of the Euxine or Black Sea. He gives a minute description of the habits of these people, and expresses his admiration for the Pontus Euxinus. The dimensions that he gives of the Black Sea, the Bosphorus, of the Propontis, the Palus Maiotis, and of the Aegean Sea, are almost exactly the same as those given by geographers of the present day. He also names the large rivers that flow into these seas. The Ister, or Danube, the Boristhenes, or Dnieper, the Tanais or Don, and he finishes by relating how the alliance and afterwards the union between the Scythians and Amazons took place, which explains the reason why the young women of that country are not allowed to marry before they have killed an enemy and established their character for valor. After a short stay in Thrace, during which he was convinced that the Gite were the bravest portion of this race, Herodotus arrived in Greece which was to be the termination of his travels, to the country where he hoped to collect the only documents still wanting to complete his history, and he visited all the spots that had become illustrious by the great battles fought between the Greeks and Persians. He gives a minute description of the pass of Thermopylae, and of his visit to the plain of Marathon, the battlefield of Plataea, and his return to Asia Minor, whence he passed along the coast on which the Greeks had established several colonies. Herodotus can only have been twenty-eight years of age when he returned to Halicarnassus in Caria, for it was in B.C. 456 that he read the history of his travels at the Olympic Games. His country was at that time oppressed by Ligdamus, and he was exiled to Samos, but though he soon after rose in arms to overthrow the tyrant, the ingratitude of his fellow citizens obliged him to return into exile. In 444, he took part in the games at the Pantheon, and there he read his completed work, which was received with enthusiasm, and towards the end of his life he retired to Thurium in Italy, where he died B.C. 406, 
leaving behind him the reputation of being the greatest traveler and the most celebrated historian of antiquity. End of First Part, Chapter 1, Part 1 Recording by William Tomko Section 2 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part Chapter 1, Part 2 After Herodotus, we must pass over a century and a half and only note, in passing, the physician Stesius, a contemporary of Xenophon, who published the account of a voyage to India that he really never made. And we shall come in chronological order to Pythias, who was at once a traveler, geographer, and historian, one of the most celebrated men of his time. It was about the year B.C. 340 that Pythias set out from the columns of Hercules with a single vessel, but instead of taking a southerly course like his Carthaginian predecessors, he went northwards, passing by the coasts of Iberia and Gaul to the furthest points which now form the Cape of Finisterre, and then he entered the English Channel and came upon the English coast, the British Isles, of which he was to be the first explorer. He disembarked at various points on the coast and made friends with the simple, honest, sober, industrious inhabitants who traded largely in tin. Pythias ventured still further north and went beyond the Orcades Islands to the furthest point of Scotland, and he must have reached a very high latitude, for during the summer the night only lasted two hours. After six days further sailing, he came to lands which he calls Tool probably the jutland or norway of the present day beyond which he could not pass for he says there was neither land sea nor air there he retraced his course and changing it slightly he came to the mouth of the rhine to the country of the ostians and further inland to germany thence he visited the mouth of the tanius that is supposed to be the elbe or the odor and he returned to marseilles just a year after leaving his native town pythias besides being such a brave sailor was a remarkably scientific man he was the first to discover the influence that the moon exercises on the tides and to notice that the polar star is not situated at the exact spot at which the axis of the globe is supposed to be some years after the time of pythias about b c three twenty six a greek traveller made his name famous this was Neorchus, a native of Crete, one of Alexander's admirals, and he was charged to visit all the coast of Asia, from the mouth of the Indus to that of the Euphrates. When Alexander first resolved that this expedition should take place, which had for its object the opening up of a communication between India and Egypt, he was at the upper part of the Indus. He furnished Neorchus with a fleet of thirty-three galleys, of some vessels with two decks, and a great number of transport ships, and two thousand men. Nearchus came down the Indus in about four months, escorted on either bank of the river by Alexander's armies, and after spending seven months in exploring the delta, he set sail and followed the west line of what we call Beluchistan in the present day. He put to sea on the 2nd of October, a month before the winter storms had taken a direction that was favorable to his purpose, so that the commencement of his voyage was disastrous, and in forty days he had scarcely made eighty miles in a westerly direction. He touched first at Stura and at Coristus, which do not seem to answer to any of the now existing villages on the coast, then at the island of Crocala, which forms the bay of Caranthia. Beaten back by contrary winds, after doubling the Cape of Mons, the fleet took refuge in a natural harbor that its commander thought that he could fortify as a defense against the attacks of the barbarous natives, who, even at the present day, keep up their character as pirates. After spending twenty-four days in this harbor, Nearchus put to sea again on the 3rd of November. 
severe gales often obliged him to keep very near the coast, and when this was the case he was obliged to take all possible precautions to defend himself from the attacks of the ferocious Beluchis, who are described by Eastern historians as a barbarous nation with long disheveled hair and long flowing beards, who are more like bears or satyrs than human beings. Up to this time, however, no serious disaster had happened to the fleet, but on the 10th of November, in a heavy gale, two galleys and a ship sank. Nearchus then anchored at Crocala, and there he was met by a ship laden with corn that Alexander had sent out to him, and he was able to supply each vessel with provisions for ten days. After many disasters and a skirmish with some of the natives, Nearchus reached the extreme point of the land of the Orites, which is marked in modern geography by Cape Morant. Here he states in his narrative that the rays of the sun at midday are vertical, and therefore there are no shadows of any kind. But this is surely a mistake, for at this time in the southern hemisphere the sun is in the Tropic of Capricorn and beyond this his vessels were always some degrees distant from the tropic of cancer therefore even in the height of summer this phenomenon could not have taken place and we know that his voyage was in winter circumstances seem now rather more in his favor for the time of the eastern monsoon was over when he sailed along the coast which is inhabited by a tribe called ichthyophagi who subsist solely on fish and from the failure of all vegetation are obliged to feed even their sheep upon the same food the fleet was now becoming very short of provisions so after doubling cape posme nearichus took a pilot from these shores on board his own vessel and with the wind in their favor they made a rapid progress finding the country less bare as they advanced a few scattered trees and shrubs being visible from the shore they reached a little town of the name of which we have no record and as they were almost without food nearchus surprised and took possession of it the inhabitants making but little resistance Kanasida or chubar as we call it was their next resting place and at the present day the ruins of a town are still visible in the bay but their corn was now entirely exhausted and though they tried successively at Kanati, Troas and Dagasira for further supplies, it was all in vain, these miserable little towns not being able to furnish more than enough for their own consumption. The fleet had neither corn nor meat, and they could not make up their minds to feed upon the tortoises that abound in that part of the coast. Just as they entered the Persian Gulf, they encountered an immense number of whales, and the sailors were so terrified by their size and number that they wished to fly. It was not without much difficulty that Nearchus at last prevailed upon them to advance boldly, and they soon scattered their formidable enemies. Having changed their westerly course for a north-easterly one, they soon came upon fertile shores, and their eyes were refreshed by the sight of cornfields and pasture lands interspersed with all kinds of fruit trees, except the olive. They put into Badis, or Jask, and after leaving it and passing masita or musindan they came in sight of the persian gulf to which nearchus following the geography of the arabs gave the misnomer of the red sea they sailed up the gulf and after one halt reached harmozia which has given its name to the little island of ormuz there he learnt that alexander's army was only five days march from him and he disembarked at once and hastened to meet it no news of the fleet having reached the army for twenty-one weeks, they had given up all hope of seeing it again, and great was Alexander's joy when Nearchus appeared before him, though the hardships he had endured had altered him almost beyond recognition. Alexander ordered games to be celebrated, and sacrifices offered up to the gods. Then Nearchus returned to Harmosia, as he wished to go as far as susa with the fleet and set sail again having invoked jupiter the deliverer he touched at some of the neighboring islands probably those of eric and kismis and soon afterwards the vessels ran aground but the advancing tide floated them again and after passing bestian they arrived at the island of kaish that is sacred to mercury and venus 
This was the boundary line between Carmania and Persia. As they advanced along the Persian coast, they visited different places, Gillam, Indarabia, Shevu, etc., and at the last named was found a quantity of wheat which Alexander had sent for the use of the explorers. Some days after this they came to the mouth of the river Araxes that separates Persia from Susiana, and thence they reached a large lake situated in the country now called Norgaston, and finally anchored near the village of Degela at the source of the euphrates having accomplished their project of visiting all the coast lying between the euphrates and indus nearchus returned a second time to alexander who rewarded him magnificently and placed him in command of his fleet alexander's wish that the whole of the arabian coast should be explored as far as the red sea was never fulfilled as he died before the expedition was arranged it is said that Nearchus became governor of Lycia and Pamphylia, but in his leisure time he wrote an account of his travels, which has unfortunately perished, though not before Arian had made a complete analysis of it in his Historia Indica. It seems probable that Nearchus fell in the Battle of Ipsu, leaving behind him the reputation of being a very able commander. His voyage may be looked upon as an event of no small importance in the history of navigation. We must not omit to mention a most hazardous attempt made in B.C. 146 by Eudoxus of Cyzicus, a geographer living at the court of Eurgetes II, to sail around Africa. He had visited Egypt and the coast of India when this far greater project occurred to him one which was only accomplished 1,600 years later by Vasco da Gama. Eudoxus fitted out a large vessel and two smaller ones and set sail upon the unknown waters of the Atlantic. How far he took these vessels we do not know, but after having had communication with some natives whom he thought were Ethiopians, he returned to Mauritania. Thence he went to Tiberia and made preparations for another attempt to circumnavigate Africa. But whether he ever set out upon this voyage is not known. In fact, some learned men are even inclined to consider Eodoxus an impostor. We have still to mention two names of illustrious travelers living before the Christian era, those of Caesar and Strabo. Caesar, born B.C. 100, was preeminently a conqueror, not an explorer, but we must remember that in the year B.C. 58 he undertook the conquest of Gaul, and during the ten years that were occupied in this vast enterprise he led his victorious legions to the shores of Great Britain, where the inhabitants were of German extraction. As to Strabo, who was born in Cappadocia, B.C. 50, he distinguished himself more as a geographer than a traveler, but he traveled through the interior of Asia and visited Egypt, Greece, and Italy, living many years in Rome, and dying there in the latter part of the reign of Tiberius. Strabo wrote a geography in seventeen books, of which the greater part has come down to us, and this work, with that of Ptolemy, are the two most valuable legacies of ancient to modern geographers. End of First Part, Chapter 1, Part 2 Recording by William Tomko Section 3 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 2. Pausanias 174, Fahayan 399, Cosmos Indicopleustes, 500, Arculfe, 700, Willibald, 725, Soliman, 851. In the first two centuries of the Christian era, the study of geography received a great stimulus from the advance of other branches of science. But travelers, or rather explorers, of new countries were very few in number. 
Pliny, in the year A.D. 23, devoted the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth books of his natural history to geography, and in A.D. 50, Hippolus, a clever navigator, discovered the laws governing the monsoon in the Indian Ocean and taught sailors how they might deviate from their usual course so as to make these winds subservient to their being able to go to and return from India in one year. Arian, a Greek historian born A.D. 105, wrote an account of the navigation of the Euxine or Black Sea, and pointed out as nearly as possible the countries that had been discovered by explorers who had lived before his time. And Ptolemy, the Egyptian, about A.D. 175, making use of the writings of his predecessors, published a celebrated geography in which, for the first time, places and cities were marked in their relative latitude and longitude on a mathematical plan. The first traveler of the Christian era, whose name has been handed down to us, was Pausanias, a Greek writer living in Rome in the second century, and whose account of his travels bears the date of A.D. 175. Pausanias did for ancient Greece what Joanne, the industrious and clever Frenchman, did for the other countries of Europe in compiling the Traveler's Guide. His account, a most reliable one on all points, and most exact even in details, was one upon which travelers of the second century might safely depend in their journeys through the different parts of Greece. Pausanias gives a minute description of Attica, and especially of Athens, and its monuments, tombs, temples, citadel, academy, columns, and of the Aeropagus. From Attica, Pausanias went to Corinth, and then explored the islands of Aegina and Methana, Sparta, the island of Serigo, Messene, Achaea, Arcadia, Boeotia, and Phocis. The roads in the provinces, and even the streets in the towns, are mentioned in his narrative, as well as the general character of the country through which he passed, although we can scarcely say that he added any fresh discoveries to those already made, he was one of those careful travelers whose object was more to obtain exact information than to make new discoveries. His narrative has been of the greatest use to all geographers and writers upon Greece and the Peloponnesus and an author of the sixteenth century has truly said that this book is a most ancient and rare specimen of erudition it was about a hundred and thirty years after the greek historian in the fourth century that a chinese monk undertook the exploration of the countries lying to the west of china the account of his travels is still extant and we may well agree with M. Charton when he says that this is a most valuable work carrying us beyond our ordinarily narrow view of Western civilization. Fa Hayan, the traveler, was accompanied by several monks, wishing to leave China by the west. They crossed more than one chain of mountains, and reached the country now called Kan Chiao, which is not far from the Great Wall. They crossed the river Cha Ho and a desert that Marco Polo was to explore eight hundred years later. After seventeen days' march, they reached the lake of Labnor in Turkestan. From this point, all the countries that the monks visited were alike as to manners and customs, the languages alone differing. Being dissatisfied with the reception that they met with in the country of the Orgas, who are not a hospitable people, they took a southeasterly course towards a desert country where they had great difficulty in crossing the rivers, and, after a thirty-five days' march, the little caravan reached Tartary in the kingdom of Khotan, which contained, according to Fahayan, many times ten thousand holy men. Here they met with a cordial welcome and after a residence of three months were allowed to assist at the procession of the images a great feast in which both brahmins and buddhists join when all the idols are placed upon magnificently decorated cars and paraded through streets strewn with flowers amid clouds of incense the feast over the monks left khotan for Kokonyar, and after resting there fifteen days we find them further south in the balistan country of the present day a cold and mountainous district where wheat was the only grain cultivated and where Fahayan found in use the curious cylinders on which prayers are written and which are turned by the faithful with the most extraordinary rapidity thence they went to the eastern part of afghanistan 
It took them four weeks to cross the mountains, in the midst of which, and the never-melting snow, they are said to have found venomous dragons. On the further side of this rocky chain, the travelers found themselves in northern India, where the country is watered by the streams which, further on, form the Sindh, or Indus. After traversing the kingdoms of Ocheng, Suhotu, and Kiantho-Wai, they arrived at Folucha, which must be the town of Peshawar, standing between Kabul and the Indus and twenty-four leagues farther west, they came to the town of Hilo, built on the banks of a tributary of the river Kabout. In these towns, Fahayan specially notices the feasts and religious ceremonies practiced in the worship of Fo or Buddha. When the monks left Quito, they were obliged to cross the Hindu Kush mountains, lying between Turkestan and the Gandhara the cold being so intense that one of their party sank under it after enduring great hardships they reached banu a town that is still standing and then after again crossing the indus they entered the punjab thence descending towards the southeast with a view of crossing the northern part of the indian peninsula they reached mathura a town in the province of agra and crossing the great salt desert which lies to the east of the indus traveled through a country that fahayan calls a happy kingdom where the inhabitants are good and honest needing neither laws nor magistrates and indebted to none for their support without markets or wine merchants and living happily with plenty of all that they required where the temperature was neither hot nor cold this happy kingdom was india Fahayan followed a southeasterly route and came to Farooq Abad, where Buddha is said to have alighted as he came down from heaven, the Chinese traveler dwelling much upon the Buddhist creed. Thence he visited the town of Kanoji, standing on the right bank of the Ganges, that he calls Hang, and this is the very center of Buddhism. Wherever Buddha is supposed to have rested, his followers have erected high towers in his honor. The travelers visited the temple of Chihuan, where for twenty-five years Fo practiced the most severe mortifications, and where he is said to have given sight to five hundred blind men. They are said to have been much moved by the sight of this temple. They set out again, passing Kapila and Gorukhpur, on the frontier of Nepal, all made famous by Fo's miracles and then reached the celebrated town of Palian Fu, in the delta of the Ganges, in the kingdom of Magadha. This was a fertile tract of country inhabited by a civilized, upright people who loved all philosophic researches. After climbing the peak of Vautour, which stands at the source of the Diardanes and Banura rivers, Fahayan descended the Ganges visited the temple of Isi Patan that was frequented by magicians and astrologers, reached Benares, the kingdom of splendors, and a little lower down, the town of Tomoliti, situated at the mouth of the river, a short distance from the site of Calcutta in the present day. Fahayan found a party of merchants just preparing to put to sea with the intention of going to Ceylon. He sailed with them and in fourteen days landed on the shores of the ancient Taprobana, of which the Greek merchant Jambolos had given a curious account some centuries previously. Here the Chinese monk found all the traditions and legends regarding the god Fo, and passed two years in searching ancient manuscripts. He left Ceylon for Java, where he landed after a very rough voyage, in the course of which, when the sky was overclouded, he says, we saw nothing but great waves dashing one against another lightning crocodiles tortoises and monsters of the deep he spent five months in java and then set sail for canton but the winds were again unfavorable and after undergoing great hardships he landed at the town of shantong of the present day then having spent some time at nankin he returned to Fianfu his native town, after an absence of eighteen months. Such is the account of Fahayan's travels, which have been well translated by Monsieur Abel de Ramusat, and which give very interesting details of Indian and Tartar customs, especially those relating to their religious ceremonies.
The next traveler to the Chinese monk, in chronological order, is an Egyptian called Cosmos Indicopilustes, a name that M. Charton renders as cosmographic traveler in India. He lived in the 6th century and was a merchant of Alexandria, who, on his return from visiting Ethiopia and part of Asia, entered a monastery. His narrative is called The Christian Topography of the Universe. It gives no details of its author's voyages, but begins with cosmographic discussions to prove that the world is square, and enclosed in a great oblong coffer with all the other planets. This is followed by some dissertations on the function of the angels, and a description of the dress of the Jewish priests. Cosmos also gives the natural history of the animals of India and Ceylon, and notices the rhinoceros and buffalo, which can be made of use for domestic purposes. The giraffe, the wild ox, the musk that is haunted for its perfumed blood, the unicorn, which he considers a real animal and not a myth, the wild boar, the hippopotamus, the phoca, the dolphin, and the tortoise. Afterwards, Cosmos describes the pepper plant as a frail and delicate shrub, like the smallest tendrils of the vine, and the cocoa tree, whose fruit has a fragrance equal to that of a nut. From the earliest times of the Christian era, there has been a great love for visiting the Holy Land, the cradle of the new religion. These pilgrimages became more and more frequent, and we have many names left to us of those who visited Palestine during the first centuries of Christianity. One of these pilgrims, the French bishop Arculfe, who lived towards the end of the seventh century, has left us an account of his travels. He sets out by giving a topographical description of the site of Jerusalem, and describes the wall that surrounds the holy city, then the circular church built over the holy sepulchre, the tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the stone that closed it, the church dedicated to the Virgin Mary, the church built upon Calvary, and the Basilica of Constantine on the site of the place where the real cross was found. These various churches are united in one building, which also encloses the tomb of Christ and Calvary where our Lord was crucified. Arculfe then descended into the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is situated to the east of the city, and contains the church that covers the tomb of the Virgin. He also saw that of Absalom, which he calls the Tower of Jehoshaphat. He describes the Mount of Olives that faces the city beyond the valley, and he prayed in the cave where Jesus prayed. He also went to Mount Zion, which stands outside the town on the south side. He notices the gigantic fig tree on which, according to tradition, Judas Iscariot hanged himself, and he visited the church of the guest chamber, now destroyed. After making the tour of the city by the valley of Siloam and ascending by the brook Cedron, the bishop returned to the Mount of Olives, which was covered with waving wheat and barley, grass and wild flowers, and he describes a place where Christ ascended from the summit of the mountain. On this spot a large church has been built, with three arched porticos that are not roofed over or covered in any way, but are open to the sky. They have not roofed in this church, says the bishop, because it was the place whence our Saviour ascended upon a cloud, and the space open to heaven allows the prayers of the faithful to ascend thither. For when they paved this church, they could not lay the pavement over the place where our Lord's feet had rested as, when the stones were laid upon that spot, the earth, as though impatient of anything not divine resting upon it, threw them up again before the workmen. Beyond this, the dust bears the impression of the divine feet, and, though, day by day, the faithful who visit the spot efface the marks, they immediately reappear, and may be seen perpetually. After having explored the neighborhood of Bethany, in the midst of the grove of olives, where the grave of Lazarus is said to be, and where the church, standing on the right hand, is supposed to mark the spot where our Lord usually conversed with his disciples, Arculfe went to Bethlehem, which is a short distance from the holy city. He describes the birthplace of our Lord, a natural cave, hollowed out of the rock at the eastern end of the village. The church, built by St. Helena, 
the tombs of the three shepherds upon whom the heavenly light shone at the birth of our Saviour, the burial places of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that of Rachel, and he visited the oak of Mamre, under which Abraham received the visit of the angels. Thence Arculfe went to Jericho, or rather the place where the town once stood, whose walls fell at the sound of Joshua's trumpets. He explored the place where the children of Israel first rested in the land of Canaan, after crossing the river Jordan, and he speaks of the church of Galgala, where the twelve stones are placed, which the children of Israel took from the river when they entered the promised land. He followed the course of the Jordan, and found near one of the bends of the river, on the right bank, and among the most beautiful scenery, about an hour's walk from the Dead Sea, the place where our Lord was baptized by St. John the Baptist. A cross is placed to mark the spot, but when the river is swollen, it is covered by the water. After examining the banks of the Dead Sea, and tasting its brackish water, he viewed the source of the Jordan, at the foot of Libanus and explored the greater part of the lake of Tiberias. Visiting the well, where the woman of Samaria gave our Lord the water he so much needed, seeing the fountain in the desert of which St. John the Baptist drank, and the great plain of Gaza, where our Lord blessed the five loaves and two fishes, and fed the multitude. Next he went down to Capernaum, of which there are now no remains, then visited Nazareth, where our Lord spent his childhood, and ended his journey at Mount Tabor in Galilee. The bishop's narrative contains both geographical and historical accounts of other places, beyond those immediately connected with our Lord's life on earth. He visited the royal city of Damascus, which is watered by four large rivers. Also Tyre, the chief town of Phoenicia, which, though once separated from the mainland, was joined to it again by the jetty or pier made by the orders of Nabucodonosor. He speaks of Alexandria, once the capital of Egypt, which he reached forty days after leaving Jaffa, and lastly of Constantinople, where he often visited the large church in which the woods of the cross is preserved, upon which the Saviour suffered for the salvation of the human race. The account of this journey was written by the Abbe de saint Colomban at the dictation of the bishop, and not many years afterwards the same journey was undertaken by an English pilgrim and accomplished in much the same way. The name of this pilgrim was Willibald, a member of a rich family living at Southampton who, on his recovery from a long illness, dedicated him to God's service. All his early life was spent in holy exercises in the monastery of Waltheim. When he was grown up, he had the most intense wish to see St. Peter's at Rome, and was so set upon this that he induced his father, brother, and young sister to wish to go there also. They embarked at Southampton in the spring of 721, and, making their way up the Seine, they landed at Rouen. We have but few details of the journey to Rome, but Willibald mentions that after passing through Cortona and Lucca, at which latter place his father sank under the fatigue of the journey, and died, he reached Rome in safety with his brother and sister, and passed the winter there. But they were all in turn attacked with fever. When Willibald regained his health, he determined to continue his journey to the Holy Land, he sent his brother and sister back to england while he joined some monks who were going in the same direction as himself they went by terracina and gaeta to naples and set sail for reggio in calabria and catania and syracuse in sicily whence they again embarked and after touching at cos and samos landed at ephesus in asia minor where they visited the tombs of st john the evangelist of Mary Magdalene, and of the seven sleepers of Ephesus, that is, seven Christians martyred in the time of the emperor Decius. They made some stay at Patara and at Mytilene, and then went to Cyprus and Paphos. We next find the party, seven in number, at Edessa, visiting the tomb of St. Thomas the Apostle. Here they were arrested as spies, and thrown into prisons by the Saracens, but the king, on the petition of a Spaniard, set them at liberty. 
As soon as they were set free, they left the town in great haste, and from that time their route is almost the same as that of the Bishop Arculfe. They visited Damascus, Nazareth, Cana, where they saw a wonderful amphora on Mount Tabor, where our Lord was transfigured, and the Lake of Tiberias, where St. Peter walked upon the water, Magdala, where Lazarus and his sister dwelt, Capernaum, where our Lord raised to life the son of the nobleman, Bethsaida in Galilee, the native place of St. Peter and St. Andrew, Chorazan, where our Lord cured those possessed with devils, Caesarea, and the spot where our Lord was baptized, as well as Jericho and Jerusalem. They also went to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the Mount of Olives, and to Bethlehem, the scene of the murder of the innocents by Herod and Gaza. While they were at Gaza, Willibald tells us that he suddenly became blind, while he was in the church of St. Matthias, and only recovered his sight two months afterwards, as he entered the church of the Holy Cross at Jerusalem. He went through the valley of Diospolis, or Lydda, ten miles from Jerusalem, and then went to Tyre and Sidon, and thence by Libanus, Damascus, Caesarea, and Emmaus, back to Jerusalem, where the travelers spent the winter. This was not to be the limit of their exploration, for we hear of them at Ptolemais, Emesa, Jerusalem, Damascus, and Samaria, where St. John the Baptist is said to have been buried, and at Tyre, where it must be confessed that Willibald defrauded the revenue of that time by smuggling some balsam that was very celebrated, and on which a duty was levied. On quitting Tyre, they went to Constantinople and lived there for two years before returning by Sicily, Calabria, Naples, and Capua. The English pilgrim reached the monastery of Monte Cassino just ten years after his first setting out on his travels. But his time of rest had not yet come, as he was appointed to a bishopric in Franconia by Pope Gregory the Third. He was forty-one years of age when he was made bishop, and he lived forty years afterwards. In 938, he was canonized by Leo the Seventh. We will conclude the list of celebrated travelers living between the first and ninth centuries by giving a short account of Soliman, a merchant of Bassora, who, starting from the Persian Gulf, arrived eventually on the shores of China. This narrative is in two distinct parts, one written in 851 by Soliman himself, who was the traveler, and the other in 878 by a geographer named Abu Zaid Hassan, with the view of completing the first. Renaud, the Orientalist, is of opinion that this narrative has thrown quite a new light on the commercial transactions that existed in the ninth century between Egypt, Arabia, and the countries bordering on the Persian Gulf on one side, and the vast provinces of India and China on the other. Soliman, as we have said, started from the Persian Gulf after having taken in a good supply of fresh water at Muscat, and visited first the Second Sea, or that of Oman, he noticed a fish of enormous size, probably a spermaceti whale, which the seamen endeavored to frighten away by ringing a bell. Then a shark, in whose stomach they found a smaller shark, enclosing in its turn one still smaller. Both alive, says the traveler, which is manifestly an exaggeration. Then, after describing the remora, the dactylopterae, and the porpoise, he speaks of the sea near the Maldive Islands, in which he counted an enormous number of islands, among them he mentions Ceylon, by its Arabian name, with its pearl fisheries, Sumatra, inhabited by cannibals, and rich in gold mines, Nicobar, and the Andaman Islands, where cannibalism still exists even at the present day. This sea, he says, is subject to fearful water spouts which wreck the ships and throw on its shores an immense number of dead fish, and sometimes even large stones. When these tempests are at their height, the sea seethes and boils. Soliman imagined it to be infested by a sort of monster who preyed upon human beings. This is thought to have been a kind of dogfish. Arrived at Nicobar, Soliman traded with the inhabitants, bartering some iron for coconuts, sugar cane, bananas, etc. He then crossed the sea and seems to have made for Singapore and northwards by the Gulf of Siam.
Soliman put into a harbor near Cape Varela to revittle his ships, and thence he went by the China Sea to Jehan Fu, the port of the present town of Che Kiang. The remainder of the account of Soliman's travels, written by Abu Zaid Hassan, contains a detailed account of the manners and customs of the Indians and Chinese. But it is not the traveler himself who is speaking, and we shall find the same subject spoken of in a more interesting manner by later authors. We must add, in reviewing the discoveries made by travelers sixteen centuries before and nine centuries after the Christian era, that from Norway to the extreme boundaries of China, taking a line through the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, and the Sea of China, the immense extent of coast bordering these seas had been in a great measure visited. Some explorations had been attempted in the interior of these countries for instance, in Egypt as far as Ethiopia, in Asia Minor to the Caucasus, in India and China, and if these old travelers may not have quite understood mathematical precision as to some of the points they visited, at all events the manners and customs of the inhabitants, the productions of the different countries, the mode of trading with them, and their religious customs were quite sufficiently understood ships could sail with more safety when the change of winds was no longer a subject of mere speculation the caravans could take a more direct route in the interior of the countries and the great increase of trade which took place in the middle ages is surely owing to the facilities afforded by the writings of travelers end of first part chapter two recording by william tomko Section 4 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 3, Part 1. Celebrated Travelers Between the 10th and 13th Centuries. Benjamin of Tudela, 1159 to 1173, Flan de Carpin, or Carpini, 1245 to 1247, Rubuquis, 1253 to 1254. In the course of the 10th and at the beginning of the 11th century, a considerable amount of ardor for exploration had arisen in northern Europe. Some Norwegians and adventurous Gauls had penetrated to the northern seas, and, if we may trust to some accounts, they had gone as far as the White Sea and visited the country of the Samoyeds. Some documents say that Prince Maddock may have explored the American continent. At all events, we may be tolerably certain that Iceland was discovered about A.D. 861 by some Scandinavian adventurers, and that it was soon after colonized by Normans. About this time, a Norwegian had taken refuge on a newly discovered land, and surprised by its verdure, he gave it the name of Greenland. The communication with this portion of the American continent was difficult and uncertain, and one geographer says it took five years for a vessel to go from Norway to Greenland and to return from Greenland to Norway. Sometimes in severe winters the northern ocean was completely frozen over, and a certain horrigate, guided by a goat, was able to cross on foot from Norway to Greenland. We should keep in mind that the period of which we are speaking is the time when legends and traditions were very plentiful, and gained ready credence. Let us return to well-authenticated facts, and relate the journey of a Spanish Jew, whose truthfulness is beyond question. This Jew was the son of a rabbi of Tudela, a town in Navarre, and he was called Benjamin of Tudela. It seems probable that the object of his voyage was to make a census of his brother Jews scattered over the surface of the globe. But whatever may have been his motive, he spent thirteen years, from 1160 to 1173, exploring nearly all the known world and his narrative was considered the great authority on this subject up to the 16th century. Benjamin of Tudela left Barcelona, and traveling by Tarragona, Guironde, Narbonne, Bizies, Montpellier, Sunel, Posquies, St. Giles, and Arles, reached Marseilles. Here he visited the two synagogues in the town and the principal Jews, and then set sail for Genoa, arriving there in four days. The Genoese were masters of the sea at that time, and were at war with the people of Pisa, a brave people 
who like the Genoese, says the traveller, owned neither kings nor princes, but only the judges whom they appointed at their own pleasure. After visiting Lucca, Benjamin of Tudela went to Rome. Alexander the Third was Pope at this time, and according to this traveller he included some Jews among his ministers. Among the monuments of special interest in the Eternal City, he mentioned St. Peter's and St. John Latern, but his descriptions are not interesting. From Rome by Capua and Pozzuoli, then partly inundated, he went to Naples, where he seems to have seen nothing but the five hundred Jews living there. Then by Salerno, Amalfi, Benevento, Oscali, Trani, St. Nicholas of Bari, and Brindisi, he arrived at Otranto, having crossed Italy, and yet found nothing interesting to relate of this splendid country. The list of the places Benjamin of Tudela visited is not interesting, but we must not omit to mention one of them, for his narrative is most precise, and it is useful to follow his route by the maps specially prepared for this purpose by Le Luel. From Otranto to Zantung, his halting places were Corfu, the Gulf of Arta, Ocellos, an ancient town in Anatolia, Anatolia in Greece, on the Gulf of Patras, Patras, Lepanto, Crisa, at the foot of Mount Parnassus, Corinth, Thebes, whose two thousand Jewish inhabitants were the best makers of silk and purple in Greece, Nagropont, and Zetun. Here, according to the Spanish traveller, is the boundary line of Wallachia. He says the Wallachians are as nimble as goats, and come down from the mountains to pillage the neighbouring Greek towns. Benjamin of Tudela went on to Constantinople by way of Gardiki, a small township on the Gulf of Volo. Amros, a port much frequented by the Venetians and Genoese, Piscina, a town of which no traces are left, Salonica, the ancient Thela Salonica, and Abydos. He gives us some details of Constantinople. The Emperor Emmanuel Comenus was reigning at the time and lived in a palace that he built upon the seashore, containing columns of pure gold and silver, and the golden throne studded with precious stones, above which a golden crown is suspended by a chain of the same precious metal, which rests upon the monarch's head as he sits upon the throne. In this crown are many precious stones, and one of priceless worth. So brilliant are they, says the traveller, that at night there is no occasion for any further light than that thrown back by these jewels. He adds that there is a large population in the city, and for the number of merchants from all countries who assemble there, it can only be compared to Baghdad. The inhabitants are principally dressed in embroidered silk robes enriched with golden fringes, and to see them thus attired and mounted upon their horses, one would take them for princes. But they are not brave warriors, and they keep mercenaries from all nations to fight for them. One regret, he expresses, and that is, that there are no Jews left in the city, and that they have all been transported to Galata, near the entrance of the port, where nearly 2,500 of the sects, Rabbinites and Karites, and among them many rich merchants and silk manufacturers, but the Turks have a bitter hatred for them, and treat them with great severity. Only one of these rich Jews was allowed to ride on horseback. He was the emperor's physician, Solomon, the Egyptian. As to the remarkable buildings of Constantinople, he mentions the Mosque of St. Sophia, in which the number of altars answers to the number of days in a year, and the columns and gold and silver candlesticks are too numerous to be counted. Also the Hippodrome, which at the present day is used as a horse market, but was then the scene of combats between lions, bears, tigers, and other wild beasts, and even birds. When Benjamin of Tudela left Constantinople, he visited Gallipoli and Kilia, a port on the eastern coast, and went to the islands in the archipelago. Mytilene, Chios, whence there was much trade in the juice of the pistachio tree, Samos, Rhodes, and Cyprus. As he sailed towards the land of Aaron, he passed by Misis, by Antioch, where he admired the arrangements for supplying the city with water, and by Latakia on his way to Tripoli, which he found had been recently shaken by an earthquake that had been felt for miles round. We next hear of him at Beirut, at Sidon, and Tyre, celebrated for its glass manufactory, at Acre, at Jaffa near Mount Carmel, at Capernaum, at the beautiful town of Caesarea, at Samaria, which is built in the midst of a fertile tract where there are vineyards, gardens, orchards, and olive gardens, at Nabolus, at Gibeon, and then at Jerusalem. In the holy city it was but natural that the Jew could see nothing that would have interested a Christian visitor. For him, Jerusalem appeared only a small town, defended by three walls, and peopled with Jews, Syrians, Greeks, Georgians, and Franks of all languages and nations. He found four hundred horse soldiers in the city ready for war at any moment. A great temple in which there is a tomb of that man, as the Talmud styles our Saviour, and a house in which the Jews had the privilege of carrying on the work of dying. But they were few in number, scarcely two hundred, and they lived under the Tower of David at one corner of the city. 
Outside Jerusalem, the traveler mentions the tomb of Absalom, the sepulchre of Osseus, the pool of Siolam near the brook Sedon, the value of Jehoshaphat, and the Mount of Olives, from whose summit one can see the Dead Sea. Two leagues from it stands the pillar of Lot's wife, and the traveler adds that though the flocks and herds which pass this pillar of salt are continually licking it, yet it never diminishes in size. From Jerusalem, Benjamin of Tudela went to Bethlehem, and inscribed his name on Rachel's tomb, as it was customary for all Jews to do who passed by it. And from Bethlehem, after counting twelve Jewish dyeing establishments, he went on to Hebron, which is now deserted and in ruins. After visiting, in the plain of Machpelah, the tombs of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Lee, and passing by beth Jarim, Skio, Mount Moriah, beth Nubi, Marama, Joppa, Jebne, Esotus, Escalon, built by Edras, Lud, Tiberias, where are some hot springs, Gish, and Merom, which is still a spot visited by Jewish pilgrims, Kadesh, and Laish, near the cavern, where the Jordan takes its rise, the traveler left the land of Israel, and entered Damascus. The following is his description of this city, where the Turkish rule begins. It is a very large and beautiful city, walled round, and outside the walls for fifteen miles are gardens and orchards, and of all the surrounding country this is the most fertile spot. The town stands at the foot of Mount Hermon, whence rise the two rivers, Abana and Farpa. The first passes through the city, and its waters are taken into the larger houses by means of aqueducts, as well as through the streets and markets. This town trades with all the world. The river Farpar fertilizes the orchards and gardens outside the town. There is an Ishmaelite mosque, called Goman Damascus, meaning the synagogue of Damascus, and this building has not its equal. It is said to have been Benhadden's palace, and it contains a glass wall built apparently by magic. This wall has 365 holes in it, answering to the days of the year. As the sun rises and sets, it shines through one or other of these holes, so that the hour of the day may thus always be known. Inside the palace, or mosque, are gold and silver houses, large enough to hold two or three persons at a time if they wish to wash or bathe in them. After going to Galad and Salk, which are two days' journey from Damascus, Benjamin reached Baalbek, the Heliopolis of the Greeks and Romans, built by Solomon in the Valley of the Lebanus, then to Tamdor, which is Palmyra, also built entirely of great stones. Then, passing by Karinshen, he stopped at Hamach, which was partially destroyed by an earthquake in 1157, which overthrew many of the Syrian towns. Now comes in the narrative a list of names, which are of no great interest. We may mention among them Nineveh, whence the traveler returned towards the Euphrates, and finally that he reached Baghdad, the residence of the Caliph. Baghdad was of great interest to the Jewish traveler. He says it is a large town three miles in circumference, containing a hospital both for Jews and sick people of any nation. It is the center for learned men, philosophers, and magicians from all parts of the world. It is the residence of the Caliph, who at this time was probably Mostagid, whose dominion included western Persia and the banks of the Tigris. He had a vast palace, standing in a park watered by a tributary of the Tigris and filled with wild beasts. He may be taken as a model sovereign on some points. He was a good and very truthful man, kind and considerate to all with whom he came in contact. He lived on the produce of his own toil, and made blankets, which, marked with his own seal, were sold in the market by the princes of his court to defray the expense of his living. He only left his palace once a year at the Feast of Ramadan, when he went to the mosque near the Basora Gate, and there acting as Iman, he explained the law to his people. He returned to his palace by a different route which was carefully guarded all the rest of the year, so that no other passer-by might profane the marks of his footsteps. All the brothers of the Caliph inhabit the same palace as he does. They are all treated with much respect, and have the government of provinces and towns in their hands, the revenues from them enabling them to pass a pleasant life. Only, as they once rebelled against their sovereign, they are now all fettered with chains of iron, and have guards mounted before their houses. Benjamin of Tudela visited that part of Turkey in Asia which is watered by the Euphrates and Tigris, and saw the ruined city of Babylon, passing by what is said to be the furnace into which Shadrach, Meshach, and Abnego were thrown, and the town of Babel, which he describes as follows. The tower built by the tribes that were dispersed is of bricks. Its largest groundwork must be two miles in circumference. Its length is 240 cubits. At every ten cubits there is a passage leading to a spiral staircase which goes to the upper part of the building. From the tower there is a view of the surrounding country for twenty miles. But the wrath of God fell upon it, and it is now only a heap of ruins. From Babel the traveler went to the synagogue of Ezekiel, situated on the Euphrates, a real sanctuary where believers congregate to read the book written by the prophet. Then traversing Akazontus, etc., to Sura, 
once the site of a celebrated Jewish college, and Safshahib, whose synagogue is built with stones from Jerusalem, and crossing the desert of Yemen, he passed Tamar, Tilamar, and Chayabar, which contained a great number of Jewish inhabitants, to Wesseth, and thence to Basora on the Tigris, nearly at the end of the Persian Gulf. He gives no account of this important town, and thence he seems to have gone to Karna to visit the tomb of the prophet Edras. Then he entered Persia and sojourned at Chonistan, a large town partly in ruins, which the river Tigris divides into two parts, one rich, the other poor, joined by a bridge over which hangs the coffin of Daniel the prophet. He went to Amaria, which is the boundary of Medea, where he says the impostor David Elroy appeared, the worker of false miracles, who was none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, but called among the Jews of that part by the former name. Then he went to Hamadan, where the tombs of Mordecai and Esther are found, and by Dabrastan he reached Ispana, the capital of the kingdom, a city measuring twelve miles in circumference. At this point, the narrative of the traveler becomes somewhat obscure. According to his notes, we find him at Shiraz, then at Samarkand, then at the foot of the mountains in Tibet. This seems to have been his furthest point towards the northeast. He must have come back to Nazapur and Chuzestan on the banks of the Tigris. Thence, after a sea voyage of two days to El Khalif, an Arab town on the Persian Gulf, where the pearl fishery is carried on. Then, after another voyage of seven days and crossing the Sea of Oman, he seems to have reached Quilion on the coast of Malabar. He was at last in India, the kingdom of the worshippers of the sun and the descendants of Cush. This country produces pepper, ginger, and cinnamon. Twenty days after leaving Quilion, he was among the fire worshippers in Ceylon, and thence, perhaps, he went to China. He thought this voyage a very perilous one, and says that many vessels are lost on it, giving the following singular expedient for averting the danger. You should take on board with you several skins of oxen, and if the wind rises and threatens a vessel with danger, all who wish to escape envelop themselves each in a skin, sew up this skin so as to make it as far as possible watertight, then throw themselves into the sea, and flocks of the great eagles called griffins, thinking that they are really oxen, will descend and bear them on their wings to some mountain or valley, there to devour their prey. Immediately upon reaching land, the man will kill the eagle with his knife, and leaving the skin, will walk towards the nearest habitation. Many people, he adds, have been saved by this means. We find Benjamin of Tudela again at Ceylon, then at the island of Socotra in the Persian Gulf, and after crossing the Red Sea, he arrives at Abyssinia, which he styles the India that is on terra firma. Thence he goes down the Nile, crosses the country of Aswan, reaches the town of Holvan, and by the Sahara, where the sand swallows up whole caravans, he goes to Zelea, Kus, Feona, and Misraim or Cairo. The last is a large town containing fine squares and shops. It never rains there, but this want is supplied by the overflow of the Nile once a year, which waters the country and renders it very fertile. He passed Gazeth on living Misram, but does not mention the pyramids, and just names Anshwans, Butig, Sefita, and Damaria. He stopped at Alexandria, built by Alexander the Great, a city of great commerce frequented by merchants from all parts of the world. Its squares and streets are thronged with people, and so long that one cannot see from one end to another. A dike or causeway runs out a mile into the sea, on which a high tower was built by the conqueror, and on the top of it a glass mirror was placed, by which all vessels could be seen while still fifty days sail away, coming from Greece, or the east on their way to make war upon or otherwise harm the town. This tower if we may credit the writer, is still of a use as a signal to vessels coming to Alexandria, for it can be seen day or night, a great flaming torch being kept lighted at night, visible a hundred miles off. What are our lighthouses when even with the electric light they are only visible thirty miles away? From Damietta, the traveler visited several neighboring towns. Then returning there, he embarked on board a vessel, and twenty days afterwards landed at Messina. He wished to continue the census that he was making, so by way of Rome and Lucca he went to St. Bernard. He mentions visiting several towns both in Germany and France where Jews had settled, and according to Chateaubriand's account, Benjamin of Tudela's computation brought the number of Jews to about 760,165. In conclusion, the traveler speaks of Paris, which he seems to have visited. He says, This great town numbers among its inhabitants some remarkably learned men, who are unequaled for learning by any in the world. They spend all their time studying law, and at the same time they are very hospitable to all strangers, but especially to all their Jewish brethren. Such is the account of Benjamin of Tudela's travels. They form an important part of the geographical science of the middle of the twelfth century. As we have used the modern names, 
it is easy to follow the short account of his route that we have given on an atlas of the present day. End of First Part Chapter 3 Part 1 Recording by Todd Section 5 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 3, Part 2. Next in order of succession, we come to the name of Jean de Plan de Carpin, or, as some authors render it simply, Carpini. He was a Franciscan or Grey Friar, born in 1182 at Perugia in Italy. It is well known what inroads the Mongolians had made under Genghis Khan, and in 1206 this chieftain had made Korokorum, an ancient Turkish town, his capital. This town was a little north of China. His successor Ohadai extended the Mongolian dominion into the center of China, and after raising an army of 600,000 men, he even invaded Europe. Russia, Georgia, Poland, Monrovia, Silesia, and Hungary all became the scenes of sanguinary conflicts which almost always ended in favor of the invaders. The Mongols were looked upon as demons possessed with superhuman power, and Western Europe was terrified at their approach. Pope Innocent IV sent an ambassador to the Tartars, but he was treated with arrogance. At the same time he sent other ambassadors to the Tartars living in northeastern Tartari, in the hope of stopping the Mongolian invasion, and as a chief in this mission, the Franciscan Carpini was chosen, being known to be a clever and intelligent diplomatist. Carpini was accompanied by Stephen, a Bohemian. They set out on the 6th of April, 1245, and went first to Bohemia, where the king gave them letters to some relations living in Poland, whom he hoped might facilitate their entrance into Russia. Carpini had no difficulty in reaching the territory of the Archduke of Russia, and by his advice they brought Reaver and other furs as presents for the Tartar chiefs. Thus provided, they took a northeasterly route to Kiev, then the chief town of Russia, and now the seat of government of that part. But they traveled in fear of the Lithuanians, who scoured the country at that time. The governor of Kiev advised the Pope's envoys to exchange their own for Tartar horses, who were accustomed to seek for their food under the snow, and thus mounted they had no difficulty in getting as far as Donalisha. There they both were attacked by severe illness. When nearly recovered they bought a carriage, and in spite of the intense cold set out again. Arrived at Kiev on the Dnieper, they found themselves in the frontier town of the Mongol Empire, and hence they were conducted to the Tartar camp by one of the chiefs, whom they had made their friend by gifts. In the camp they were badly received at first, but being directed to the Duke of Carenza, who commanded an army of 60,000 men forming the advanced guard. This general sent them with an escort of three Tartars to Prince Bathe, the next in command to the emperor himself. Relays of horses were prepared for them on the road. They traveled night and day, and thus passed through the Corman's country lying between the Dnieper, the Tanas, the Volga, and the Yek, frequently having to cross the frozen rivers, and finally reaching the court of Prince Bathy on the frontiers of the Corman's country. As we were being conducted to the prince, says Carpini, we were told that we should have to pass between two fires, in order to purify us from any infection we might carry, and also to do away with any evil designs we might have towards the prince, which we agreed to do, that we might be freed from all suspicion. The prince was seated on his throne in the midst of his courtiers and officers in a magnificent tent made of fine linen. He had the reputation of being a just and kind ruler of his people, but very cruel in war. Carpini and Stephen were placed on the left of the throne, and the papal letters, translated into a language composed of Tatar and Arabic, were presented to the prince. He read them attentively, and then dismissed the envoys to their tents, where their only refreshment was a little porringer made of millet. This interview took place on Good Friday and the next day Bathy sent for the envoys, and told them they must go to the emperor. They set out on Easter day with two guides, but having lived upon nothing but millet, water, and salt, the travelers were but little fit for a journey. Nevertheless their guides obligated them to travel very quickly, changing horses five or six times in a day. They passed through almost a desert country, the Tatars having driven away nearly all the inhabitants. They came next to the country of the Canaanites to the east of Comania, where there was a great deficiency of water, in this province the people were mostly herdsmen, under the hard yoke of the Mongolians. Carpini was traveling from Easter Day to Ascension Day through the land of the Canaanites, and thence he came to the Bessarian country, or what we call Turkestan in the present day. On all sides the eye rested on towns and villages in ruins. After crossing a chain of mountains, the envoys entered Karakheti on the 1st of July. Here the governor received them very hospitably, 
and made his sons and the principal officers of his court dance before them for their amusement. On leaving Karakiti, the envoys rode for some days along the banks of a lake lying to the north of the town of Zeman, which must be, according to Monsieur de Romassat, the Lake Valkash. There lived Ordu, the eldest of the Tartar captains, and here Carpini and Stephen took a day's rest before encountering the cold and mountainous country of the Maimans, a nomadic people living in tents. After some days the travelers reached the country of the Mongols, and on the 22nd of July arrived at the place where the emperor was, or rather he who was to be emperor, the election having not yet taken place. This future emperor was named Cunius. He received the envoys in a most friendly manner, a letter from Prince Bathy having explained to him the object of their visit. Not being yet emperor, he could not entertain them, nor take any part in public affairs, but from the time of Ohadai's death, his widow, the mother of Prince Cunius, had been regent. She received the travelers in a purple and white tent, capable of holding two thousand persons. Carpini gives the following account of the interview. When we arrived, we saw a large assembly of dukes and princes, who had come from all parts with their attendants, who were on horseback in the neighboring fields and on the hills. The first day, they were all dressed in white and purple. On the second, when Cuneus appeared in the tent, in red. On the third day, they wore violet, and on the fourth, scarlet or crimson. Outside the tent, in the surrounding palisade, were two great gates, by one of which the emperor alone might enter. It was unguarded, but none dared to enter or leave by it while the other, which was the general entrance, was guarded by soldiers with swords and bows and arrows. If any one approached within the prescribed limits, he was beaten, or else shot to death with arrows. We noticed several horsemen there, on whose harness cannot have been less than twenty marks worth of silver. A whole month passed away before Cuneus was proclaimed emperor, and the envoys were obligated to wait patiently for this before they could be received by him. Carpini turned this leisure time to account by studying the habits of the people. He has given much interesting information on the subject in his account of his travels. The country seemed to him to be principally very hilly and the soil sandy, but with little vegetation. There is scarce any wood, but all classes are content with dung for fuel. Though the country is so bare, sheep seem to do well. The climate is very changeable. In summer, storms are very frequent. Many fall victims to the vivid lightning, and the wind is often so strong as even to blow over men on horseback. During the winter there is no rain, which all falls in the summer, and then scarcely enough to lay the dust, while the storms of hail are terrible. During Carpini's residence in the country they were so severe that once 140 persons were drowned by the melting of the enormous mass of hailstones that had fallen. It is a very extensive country, but miserable beyond expression. Carpini, who seems to have been a man of great discernment, took a very just idea of the Tartars themselves. He says, Their eyes are set very far apart. They have very high cheekbones. Their noses are small and flat. Their eyes small, and their eyelashes and eyebrows seem to meet. They are of middle height with slender waists. They have small beards. Some wear mustaches. And what are now called imperials. On the top of the head the hair is shaved off like monks. And to the width of three fingers between their ears they also shave off the hair, letting what is between the tonsure and the back of the head grow to some length. In fact, it is as long as a woman's in many cases, and plaited and tied into two tails behind the ear. They have small feet. He says there is but little difference perceptible in the dress of the men and women, all alike wearing long robes trimmed with fur, and high buckram caps enlarged towards the upper part. Their houses are built like tents of rods and stakes, so that they can be easily taken down and packed on the beasts of burden. Other large dwellings are sometimes carried whole as they stand on carts, and thus follow their owner about the country. The Tatars believe in God as a creator of the universe, and as a rewarder and avenger of all. But they also worship the sun, moon, fire, earth, and water, and idols made in felt like human beings. They have little toleration, and put Michael of Trinigo and Feodor to death for not worshipping the sun at midday at the command of Prince Bathy. They are a superstitious people, believing in enchantment and sorcery, and looking upon fire as the purifier of all things. When one of their chiefs dies, he is buried with a horse, saddled and bridled, a table, a dish of meat, a cup of mare's milk, and a mare and foal. The Tartars are most obedient to their chiefs, and are truthful and not quarrelsome. Murders and deeds of violence are rare. There is very little robbery, and articles of value are never guarded. They bear great fatigue and hunger without complaint, as well as heat and cold, singing and dancing under the most adverse circumstances. They are much prone to drink to excess. They are very proud and disdainful to strangers, and have no respect for the life of human beings. Carpini completes his sketch of the Tartar character by adding that they eat all kinds of animals, dogs, wolves, foxes, horses, and even sometimes their fellow creatures. 
Their principal beverage is the milk of the mare, sheep, goat, cow, and camel. They have neither wine, cervicia, a beverage composed of grain and herbs, nor mead, but only intoxicating liquors. They are very dirty in their habits, scarcely ever washing their porringers, or only doing so in their broth. They hardly ever wash their clothes, more especially when there is thunder about, and they eat rats, mice, etc., if they are badly off for other food. The men are not brought up to any manual labor, their whole occupation consisting in hunting, shooting with bows and arrows, watching the flocks, and riding. The women and girls are very athletic and very brave. They prepare furs and make clothes, drive carts and camels, and as polygamy is practiced among them, and a man buys as many wives as he can keep, there are enough women for all these employments. Such is the resume of Carpini's observations made during his residence at Siri Ordor while he was awaiting the emperor's election. Soon he found that the election was about to take place. He noticed that the courtiers always sang before Cuneus when he came out of his tent, and bowed down before him with beautiful little wands in their hands, having small pieces of scarlet wool attached to them. On a plain about four leagues from Siri Ordor, beside a stream, a tent was prepared for the coronation, carpeted with scarlet, and supported on columns covered with gold. On St. Bartholomew's Day, a large concourse of people assembled. Each one fell on his knees as he arrived and remained praying towards the sun. But Carpini and his companion refused to join in this idolatrous worship of the sun. Then Cuneus was placed on the imperial throne, and the dukes and all assembled multitudes, having done homage to him, he was consecrated. As soon as this ceremony was over, Carpini and Stephen were commanded to appear before the emperor. They were first searched, and then entered the imperial presence at the same time as other ambassadors, the bearers of rich presents. The four papal envoys had nothing to present. Whether this had anything to do with the length of time they had to wait before his imperial majesty could attend to their affairs, we do not know. But days passed slowly by, and they were nearly dying of hunger and thirst, before they received a summons to appear before the secretary of the emperor. And letters to the pope were given to them, ending with these words. We worship God, and by his help we shall destroy the whole earth from east to west. The envoys had now nothing to wait for, and during the whole of the winter they traveled across icy deserts. About May they again arrived at the court of Prince Bathe, who gave them free passes, and they reached Kiev about the middle of June, 1247. On the ninth of October of the same year, the Pope made Carpini Bishop of Antavara in Dalmatia, and this celebrated traveler died at Rome about the year 1251. Carpini's mission was not of much use, and the Tartars remained much as they were before, a savage and ferocious tribe. But six years after his return, another monk of the minor order of Franciscans, named William Rubicus, of Belgian origin, was sent to the barbarians who lived in the country between the Volga and the Don. The object of this journey was as follows. St. Louis was waging war against the Saracens of Syria at this time, and while he was engaging the infidels, Urkalti, a Mongol prince, attacked them on the side nearest to Persia, and thus caused a diversion that was in favor of the king of France. The report arose that Prince Urkalti had become a Christian, and St. Louis, anxious to prove the truth of it, charged Rubicus to go to the prince's own country and there to make what observations he could upon the subject. In the month of June, 1253, Rubicus and his companions embarked for Constantinople. From thence they reached the mouth of the River Don on the Sea of Azov, where they found a great number of Goths. On their arrival among the Tatars, their reception was at first very inhospitable, but after presenting the letters with which they were furnished, Zagothal, the governor of that province, gave them wagons, horses, and oxen for their journey. Thus equipped they set out, and were much surprised next day by meeting a moving village. That is to say, all the huts were placed on wagons and were being moved away. During the ten days that Rubiquis and his companions were passing through this part of the country, they were very badly treated, and had it not been for their own store of biscuits, they must have died of starvation. After passing by the end of the Sea of Azov, they went in an easterly direction and crossed a sandy desert on which neither tree nor stone was visible. This was the country of the Comans that Capini had traversed, but in a more northerly part. Rubuscus left the mountains inhabited by the Circassians to the south, and after a wearisome journey of two months arrived at the camp of Prince Sartak on the banks of the Volga. This was the court of the prince, the son of Batu Khan. He had six wives, each of whom possessed a palace of her own, some houses, and a great number of chariots, some of them very large, being drawn by a team of twenty-two oxen harnessed in pairs. Sartak received the envoys of the king of France very graciously, and seeing their poverty, he supplied them with all that they required. They were to be presented to the prince in their sacerdotal dress, when, bearing on a cushion a splendid Bible, the gift of the king of France, a psalter given by the queen, a missal, a crucifix, and a censer, they entered the royal presence, taking good care not to touch the threshold of the door, 
which would have been considered profanation. Once in the royal presence, they sang the Salve Regina. After the prince and those of the princesses who were present at the ceremony had examined the books, etc., that the monks had brought with them, the envoys were allowed to retire, it being impossible for Rubiquist to form any opinion as to the Sartaks being a Christian or not. But his work was not yet finished, the prince having pressed the envoys to go to his father's court. Rubiquist complied with the request, and crossing the country lying between the Volga and the Don, they arrived at their destination. Here, the same ceremonies had to be gone through as at the court of Prince Sartak. The monks had to prepare their books, etc., and be presented to the Khan, who was seated on a large gilded throne, but not wishing to treat with the envoys himself, he sent them to Karakorum, to the court of Magdu Khan. They crossed the country of the Bashkirs, and visited Kenchat, Talak, passed the Exartes, and reached Equius, a town of which the position cannot be accurately ascertained in the present day. Then, by the land of Volganum, by the lake of Balash, and the territory of the Ugirs, they arrived at Karakorum, the capital of the Mongol Empire, where Carpini had stopped without entering the town. This town, says Rubuquis, was surrounded with walls of earth, and had four gates in the walls. The principal buildings it contained were two mosques, and a Christian church. While in this city, the monk made many interesting observations on the surrounding people, especially among the Tukurs, whose oxen, of a remarkable race, are none other than the Yaks, so celebrated in Tibet. On speaking of the Tibetans, he notices their most extraordinary custom of eating the bodies of their fathers and mothers in order to secure their having an honorable sepulchre. When Rubuquis and his companions reached Kakorum, they found that the great Khan was not in his capital, but in one of his palaces which was situated on the farther side of the mountains which rise in the northern part of the country. They followed him there, and the next day after their arrival presented themselves before him with bare feet, according to the Franciscan custom, so securing for themselves frozen toes. Rubuquis thus describes the interview. Magnu Khan is a man of middle height with a flat nose. He was lying on a couch clad in a robe of bright fur which was speckled like the skin of a sea calf. He was surrounded with falcons and other birds. Several kinds of beverages, arak punch, fermented mare's milk, and ball, a kind of mead, were offered to the envoys, but they refused them all. The Khan, less prudent than they, soon became intoxicated on these drinks, and the audience had to be ended without any result being arrived at. Rabuquis remained several days at Magnu Khan's court. He found there a great number of German and French prisoners, mostly employed in making different kinds of arms, or in working the mines of Bokol. The prisoners were well treated by the Tartars, and did not complain of their lot. After several interviews with the great Khan, Rubuquis gained permission to leave, and he returned to Karakorum. Near this town stood a magnificent palace belonging to the Khan. It was like a large church with nave and double aisles. Here the sovereign sits at the northern end on a raised platform, the gentleman being seated on his right, and the ladies on his left hand. It is at this palace that twice every year splendid fates are given, when all the nobles of the country are assembled round their sovereign. While at Kokorum, Rubuquis collected many interesting documents relating to the Chinese, their customs, literature, etc. Then leaving the capital of the Mongols, he returned by the same route as he had come, as far as Astrakhan. But there he branched to the south and went to Syria with a Turkish escort, which was rendered necessary by the presence of tribes bent on pillage. He visited Durband, and went thence by Nakshivian, Exorum, Sivas, Caesarea, and Iconium, to the port of Kerch, where he embarked for his own country. His route was much the same as that of Carpini, but his narrative is less interesting, and the Belgian does not seem to have been gifted with the spirit of observations which characterized the Italian monk. With Carpini and Rubuquis closes the list of celebrated travelers of the 13th century, but we have the brilliant career of Marco Polo now before us, whose travels extended over part of the 13th and 14th centuries. End of First Part, Chapter 3, Part 2 Recording by Todd Section 6 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1 This is LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Paul Gonzalez Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1 Exploration of the World by Jules Verne First Part Chapter 4 Part 1 Marco Polo, 1253-1324 The Genoese and Venetian merchants could not fail to be much interested in the explorations of the rape travellers in Central Asia, 
India, and China, for they saw that these countries would give them new openings for disposing of their merchandise, and also great benefit to be derived by the West from being supplied with the production of the East. The interest of commerce stimulated fresh explorations, and it was this motive that actuated two noble Venetians to leave their homes, and brave all the fatigue and danger for perilous journey. These two Venetians belonged to the family of Polo, which had come originally from Dalmatia, and, owing to successful trading, had become opulent as to be reckoned among the patrician families of Venice. These two Venetians belonged to the family of Polo, which had come originally from Dalmatia, and, owing to successful trading, had become so opulent as to be reckoned among the patrician families of Venice. In 1260, the two brothers, Nicholas and Matteo, who had lived for some years in Constantinople, where they had established a branch house, went to Crimea, with a considerable stock of precious stones, where the eldest brother, Andrea Polo, had his place of business. Thence, taking a northeasterly direction, and crossing the country of the Cromans, they reached the camp of Barkai Khan on the Volga. This Mongol prince received the two merchants very kindly, and bought all the jewels they offered him, at double their value. Niccolo and Matteo remained a year in the Mongolian camp, but a war breaking out this time between Barkai and Holagu, the conqueror of Persia, and two brothers, not wishing to be in the midst of a country where war was being waged, went to Bokhara, and where they remained three years. But when Barkai was vanquished and his capital taken, the partisans of Holagu induced the two Venetians to follow them to the residence of the Grand Khan of Tartary, who was sure to give them a hearty welcome. This Kublai Khan, the fourth son of Genghis Khan, was Emperor of China, and Lushin had his summer palace in Mongolia, on the frontier of the Chinese Empire. The Venetian merchants set out, and were wholly crossing the immense extent of country lying within Bakura, at the northern limits of China. Kublai Khan was much pleased to receive the strangers from the distant west. He fetched them, and asked, with much eagerness, for any information that they could give him of what was happening in Europe requiring details of the government of the various kings and emperors, and their methods of making war. And he then conversed at some length about the Pope and the state of Latin Church. Matteo and Nicola fortunately spoke a Tartar language fluently, so they could freely answer all the emperor's questions. It had occurred to Kublai Khan to send messengers to the Pope, and he seized the opportunity to beg the two brothers to act as his ambassadors to his holiness. The merchants thankfully accepted this proposal, for they foresaw that this new character would be very advantageous to them. The emperor had some charters drawn up in the Turkish language, asking the pope to send a hundred learned men to convert his people to Christianity, and then he appointed one of his barons named Kogatal to accompany them, and then he charged them to bring him some oil from the sacred lamp, which he perpetually burning before the tomb of Christ at Jerusalem. The two brothers took leave at a Khan, having been furnished with passports by him, which put both man and horse at their disposal throughout the empire, and in 1266 they set out on their journey. Soon the Baron Kogotel fell ill, and the Venetians were obliged to leave him and continue their journey. But in spite of all the aid that he had given to them, they were three years in reaching the port of Laias, in Armenia, now known by the name of Isis. Leaving this port, they arrived in Acre in twelve sixty nine, where they heard the death of Pope Clement the Fourth. To him they were sent, but the legate Theobald lived in Acre and received the Venetians, learning what the object of their mission he begged them to wait for the election of the new Pope. The brothers had been absent from the country for fifteen years, so they resolved to return to Venice. At Negroport they embarked on board a vessel that was going direct to the native town. On landing there, Nicola was met by news of the death of his wife, and the birth of his son, who had been born shortly after his departure in 1254, the son who was celebrated Marco Polo. The two brothers waited at Venice for the election of the Pope, but at the end of two years, as it had not taken place, they thought they could no longer defer the return to the Emperor of Mongols, accordingly started for Acre, taking Marco Polo with them, who could not have been more than seventeen. At Acre they had an interview with the legate Theobald, who authorized them to go to Jerusalem, and there to procure some of the sacred oil. This mission accomplished, the Venetians returned to Acre, 
and asked the legate to give him letters to Kublai Khan, mentioning the death of Pope Clement V. He complied with their request, and they returned to Laias or Isis. There, to their great joy, they learned that the delegate Theobald had been made Pope with the title of Gregory X on the 1st of September, 1271. The newly elected Pope sent at once for the Venetian envoys, and the King of Armenia placed a galley at the disposal to expedite the return to Acre. The Pope received them with much affection, and gave them letters to the Emperor of China. He added two preaching friars, Nicholas of Vicenza and Willow of Tripoli, to their party, and gave them his blessing on their departure. They went back to Laias, but had scarcely arrived before they were made prisoners by the soldiers of the Mameluk Sultan Bibars, who was their departure, who was then ravaging Armenia. The two preaching friars were so discouraged at this upset of the expedition that they gave up all idea of going to China, and left the two Venetians and Marco Polo to prosecute the journey together as best they could. Here begins what may properly be called Marco Polo's travels. It is a question if he really visited all the places that he describes, and it seems probable that he did not, in fact. In the narrative written at his dictation by a restriction of Pisa, it is stated, Marco Polo, a wise and noble citizen of Venice, so nearly all here and described with his own eyes, and what he did not see he learned from the lips of truthful and credible witnesses. But we must add that the greater part of kingdoms and towns spoken of by Marco Polo his attended visit. We will follow the route he describes, simply pointing out what the traveller learned by hearsay. During the important missions with which he was charged by Kublai Khan, during his second journey the travellers did not follow the same exact route as on the first occasion of their first visit to the Emperor of China. They lengthened their route by passing to the north of the celestial mountains, but now they turned to the south of them, and through this route was shorter than the other, they were three years and a half in accomplishing the journey being much impeded by the rains and the difficulty of crossing the great rivers. The course may be easily followed with the help of a map of Asia. As you have substituted, the modern names in place of an ancient ones used by Marco Polo in his narrative. End of first part, chapter 4, part 1. Recording by Paul Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines. Section 7 of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosehip. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First part, chapter four, part two. Marco Polo. Marco Polo left the town of Issus. He describes Armenia Minor as a very unhealthy place, the inhabitants of which, though once valiant, are now cowardly and wretched, their only talent seeming to lie in their capacity for drinking to excess. From Armenia Minor he went to Turcomania, whose inhabitants, though somewhat of savages, are clever in cultivating pastures and breeding horses and mules, and the townspeople excel in the manufacture of carpets and silk. Armenia proper, that Marco Polo next visited, affords a good camping ground to the Tartar armies during the summer. There the traveller saw Mount Ararat, where Noah's Ark rested after the deluge. He noticed that the lands bordering on the Caspian Sea afford large supplies of naphtha, which forms an important item in the trade of that neighbourhood. When he left Armenia, he took a north-easterly course towards Georgia, a kingdom lying on the south side of the Caucasus whose ancient kings, says the legend, were born with an eagle traced on their right shoulders. The Georgians he describes as good archers and men of war, and also as clever in working in gold and manufacturing silk. 
here is a celebrated defile four leagues in length which lies between the caucasus and the caspian sea that the turks call the iron door and europeans the pass of durbend and here too is the miraculous lake where fish are said to exist only during lent hence the travellers descended towards the kingdom of mosul and arrived at the town of the same name on the right bank of the tigris thence going to baghdad the residence of the caliph of all the saracens marco polo gives an account of the taking of baghdad by the tartars in twelve fifty five mentioning a wonderful story in support of the christian idea of faith that can remove mountains he points out the route from this town to the persian gulf which may be reached in eighteen days by the river passing bussora the country of dates from this point to tauris a persian town in the province of azerbaijan marco polo's route seems to be doubtful he takes up his narrative at tauris which he describes as a large flourishing town built in the midst of beautiful gardens and carrying on a great traffic in precious stones and other valuable merchandise but its saracen inhabitants are disloyal and treacherous here he seems to divide persia geographically into eight provinces the natives of persia according to him are formidable enemies to the merchants who are obliged to travel armed with bows and arrows the principal trade of the country seems to be in horses and asses which are sent to kis or ormuz and thence to india the natural productions of the country are wheat barley millet and grapes which grow in abundance marco polo went next to yezd the most easterly town of persia proper on leaving it after a ride of seven days through magnificent forests abounding in game he came to the province of kirman here the mines yield large quantities of turquoise as well as iron and antimony the manufacture of arms and harness as well as embroidery and the training of falcons for hunting occupy a great number of the inhabitants on leaving kerman marco polo and his two companions set out on a nine days journey across a rich and populous country to the town of Kermadi, which is supposed to be the Meman of the present day, and was even then sinking into decay. The country was superb. On all sides were to be seen fine fat sheep, great oxen, white as snow, with short strong horns, and thousands of domestic fowls and other birds. Also, there were magnificent date, orange, and pistachio trees. After travelling for five days, they entered the beautiful and well-watered plain of Kormos, or Ormuz, and after two days' further march, they reached the shores of the Persian Gulf and the town of Ormuz which forms the seaport of the kingdom of Kirman. This country they found very warm and unhealthy, but rich in date and spice trees, in grain, precious stones, silk and golden stuffs, and elephants' tusks, wine made from the date, and other merchandise being brought into the town ready for shipment on board ships with but one mast, which came in numbers to the port but many were lost on the voyage to india as they were only built with wooden pegs not iron nails to fasten them together from ormuz marco polo going up again towards the northeast visited kirman then he ventured by dangerous roads across a sandy desert where there was only brackish water to be found. 
the desert across which, 1,500 years before, Alexander had led his army to meet Nearchus. Seven days afterwards he entered the town of Cabis. On leaving this town he crossed for eight days the great plains to Tonacan, the capital of the province of Cumis, probably Damagan. At this point of his narrative, Marco Polo gives an account of the old man of the mountain, the chief of the Mahometan sect, called the Hashishans, who were noted for their religious fanaticism and terrible cruelty. He next visited the Khorasan town of Chibergan, a city celebrated for its sweet melons, and then the noble city of Balk, situated near the source of the Oxus. Next he crossed a country infested by lions to Taycan, a great salt market frequented by a large number of merchants, and to Skasem. This town seems to be the Kashmi spoken of by Marsden, the Kishin or Krishin of Hyun Sang, which Sir Henry Rawlinson has identified with the hill of Karezm of Zendavesta, that some commentators think must be the modern Kunduz. In this part of the country, he says porcupines abound, and when they are hunted, they curl themselves up, darting out the prickles on their sides and backs at the dogs that are hunting them. We now know how much faith to put in this pretended power of defence said to be possessed by the porcupine. Marco Polo now entered the rocky mountainous kingdom of the Balks, whose kings claim descent from Alexander the Great. A cold country, producing good, fast horses, excellent falcons, and all kinds of game. Here, too, are prolific ruby mines, worked by the king and which yield large quantities, but they are so strictly enclosed that no one on pain of death may set foot on the Siginan mountain containing the mines. In other places, silver is found, and many precious stones, of which he says, they make the finest azure in the world, meaning lapis lazuli. His stay in this part of the country must have been a long one to have enabled him to observe so many of its characteristics. Ten days' journey from hence, he entered a province which must be the Peshawar of the present day, whose dark-skinned inhabitants were idolaters. Then, after seven days' further march, about midday, he came to the kingdom of Kashmir, where the temperature is cool, and towns and villages are very numerous. Had Marco Polo continued his route in the same direction, he would soon have reached the territory of India, but instead of that, he took a northerly course, and in twelve days was in Vakan, a land watered by the upper Oxus, which runs through splendid pastures, where feed immense flocks of wild sheep called mouflons. Thence he went through a mountainous country, lying between the Altai and Himalayan ranges to Kashgar. Here Marco Polo's route is the same as that of his uncle and his father during their first voyage, when from Bukhara they were taken to the residence of the great Khan. From Kashgar, Marco Polo diverged a little to the west, to Samarkand, a large town inhabited by Saracens and Christians, then to Yarkand, a city frequented by caravans trading between India and northern Asia, passing by Khotan, the capital of the province of that name, and by Pein, a town whose situation is uncertain, but in a part of the country where Chalcedony and Jasper abound. He came to the kingdom of Karachar, which extends along the borders of the desert of Yobi. 
then after five days further travelling over sandy plains where there was no water fit to drink he rested for eight days in the city of lob a place now in ruins while he prepared to cross the desert lying to the east so great a desert he says that it would require a year to traverse its whole length a haunted wilderness where drums and other instruments are heard though invisible after spending a year crossing this desert marco polo reached cha chiao in the province of tangaut a town built on the western limits of the chinese empire there are but few merchants here the greater part of the population being agricultural the custom that seems to have struck him the most in the province of Tangaut was that of burning their dead only on a day fixed by the astrologers. All the time that the dead remain in their houses, the relations stay there with them, preparing a place at each meal, as well as providing both food and drink for the corpse, as though it were still alive. Marco Polo and his companions made an excursion to the northeast, to the city of Amil, going on as far as Ginchintalas, a town inhabited by idolaters, Mahometans, and Nestorian Christians, whose situation is disputed. From this town, Marco Polo returned to Chatiao, and went eastward across Tangaut by the town of Sosu, over a tract of country particularly favourable to the cultivation of rhubarb, and by Kanpikyon, the Kanchiao of the Chinese, then the capital of the province of Tangaut, an important town whose numerous chiefs are idolaters and polygamists. The three Venetians remained a year in this large city, it is easy to understand from their long halts and deviations why they required three years for their journey across Central Asia. They left Kanchiao, and after riding for twelve days they reached the borders of a sandy desert and entered the city of Etzina. This was another detour, as it lay directly north of their route but they wished to visit Karakorum, the celebrated capital of Tartary, where Rubruquis had been in 1254. Marco Polo was certainly an explorer by nature. Fatigue was nothing to him if he had any geographical studies to complete, which is proved by his spending 40 days crossing an uninhabited desert without vegetation in order to reach the Tartar town. When he arrived there, he found a city measuring three miles in circumference, which had been for a long time the capital of the empire, before it was conquered by Genghis Khan, the grandfather of the reigning emperor. Here Marco Polo makes an historical digression, in which he gives an account of the wars of the Tartar chiefs against the famous Prester John, who held all this part of the country under his dominion. Marco Polo, after returning to Kanchiao, left it again, marching five days towards the east, and arriving at the town of Erginul. Thence he went a little to the south, to visit Siningfu, across a tract of country where grazed great wild oxen, and the valuable species of goat which is called the musk-bearer. Returning to Ergenul, they went eastward to Cialis, where there is the best manufactory of cloth made from camel's hair in the world. To Tenduk, a town in the province of the same name, where a descendant of Prester John reigned, but who had given in his submission to the great Khan. This was a busy, flourishing town. From hence the travellers went to Sindachu, and on beyond the great wall of China, as far as Siaganor, 
which must be Tsin Balgasa, a pretty town where the emperor lives when he wishes to hawk, for cranes, storks, pheasants, and partridges abound in this neighborhood. At last, Marco Polo, his father, and his uncle reached Siandu, or Chanchu of the present day, called elsewhere in this narrative Clemenfu. Here Kublai Khan received the papal envoys, for he was occupying his summer palace beyond the Great Wall, north of Pekin, which was then the capital of the empire. The traveller does not tell us what reception he met with, but he describes most carefully the palace, the grandeur of the building of stone and marble, standing in the middle of a park surrounded by walls, enclosing menageries and fountains, also a building made of reeds so closely interlaced as to be impenetrable to water. It was a sort of movable kiosk that the great Khan inhabited during the fine months of June, July and August. The weather during the Emperor's sojourn in this summer palace could not but be beautiful, for, according to Marco Polo, the astrologers who were attached to the Khan's court were charged to scatter all rain and fog by their sorcery, and the travellers seemed to believe in the power of these magicians. These astrologers, he says, belong to two races, both idolaters. They are learned in all magic and enchantments, above any other men, and what they do is done by the aid of the devil, but they make others believe that they owe their power to the help of God and their own holiness. These people have the following strange custom. When a man has been condemned and put to death, they take the body, cook and eat it. But in the case of a natural death, they do not eat the body. And you must know that these people of whom I am speaking, who know so many kinds of enchantments, work the wonder I am about to relate. When the great Khan is seated at dinner in the principal dining hall, the table of which is eight cubits in length, and the cups are on the floor ten paces from the table, filled with wine, milk, and other good beverages, these clever magicians, by their arts, make these cups rise by themselves, and without anyone touching them, they are placed before the great Khan. This has been done before an immense number of people, and is the exact truth. And those skilled in necromancy will tell you that it is quite possible to do this. Marco Polo next gives a history of Kublai, whom he considers to possess more lands and treasures than any man since our first father, Adam. He tells how the great Khan ascended the throne in the year 1256, being then 85. He was a man of middle height, rather stout, but of a fine figure, with a good complexion and black eyes. He was a good commander in war, and his talents were put to the proof when his uncle Nayan, having rebelled against him, wished to dispute his power at the head of 400,000 cavalry. Kublai Khan collected in secret a force of 300,000 horsemen and 100,000 foot soldiers, and marched against his uncle. The battle was a most terrible one, so many men being killed, but the Khan was victorious, and Nayan, as a prince of the blood royal, was condemned to be sewn up tightly in a carpet, and died in great suffering. After his victory, the Khan made a triumphal entry into Cathay, capital of Kambaluk, or as it is now called, Pekin. When Marco Polo arrived at this city, he made a long stay there, 
remaining until the emperor needed his services to undertake various missions into the interior of China. The emperor had a splendid palace at Kambaluk, and the traveller gives so graphic an account of the riches and magnificence of the Mongol sovereigns that we give it word for word. The palace is surrounded by a great wall, a mile long each way, four miles in length altogether, very thick, ten feet in height, all white and battlemented. At each corner of this wall is a palace beautiful and rich, in which all the trappings of war belonging to the great Khan are kept, his bows, quivers, the saddles and bridles of the horses, the bowstrings, in fact everything that would be wanted in time of war. In the midst of each square is another building, like those at the corner, so that there are eight in all, and each building contains one particular kind of harness or trapping. In the wall on the south side are five doors, the middle or large door only being opened when the emperor wishes to go in or out. Near this great gate on either side is a smaller one through which other people may pass and two others for the same purpose. Inside this wall is another having also eight buildings to be used in the same manner. Thus we see that all these buildings constituted the emperor's armory and harness store. We shall not be surprised that there was so much harness to be kept when we know that the emperor possessed a race of horses white as snow and among them 10,000 mares whose milk was reserved for the sole use of princes of the blood royal. Marco Polo continues his narrative thus. The inner wall has five gates on the south side, answering to those in the outer wall, but on the other sides the walls have only one gate each. In the centre of the enclosure made by these walls stands the palace, the largest in the world. It has no second story, but the ground floor is raised about eight feet above the ground. The roof is very high. The walls of the rooms are covered with gold and silver, and on this gold and silver are paintings of dragons, birds, horses, and other animals so that nothing can be seen but gilding and pictures. The dining hall is large enough to hold 6,000 men, and the number of other rooms is marvellous, and all is so well arranged that it could not be improved. The ceilings are painted vermilion, green, blue, yellow, and all kinds of colours, varnished so as to shine like crystal, and the roof is so well built that it will last for many years. Between the two walls the land is laid out in fields with fine trees in them, containing different species of animals, the musk ox, white deer, roebuck, fallow deer, and other animals who fill the space between the walls, except the roads reserved for human beings. On the northwestern side is a great lake, full of fishes of divers kinds, for the great Khan has had several species placed there, and each time that he desires it to be done he has his will in it. A river rises in this lake and flows out from the grounds of the palace, but no fish escape in it, there being iron and brass nets to prevent their doing so. On the northern side, near an arched doorway, the emperor has had a mound made, a hundred feet in height, and more than a mile in circumference. It is covered with evergreen trees, and the emperor, being very fond of horticulture, whenever he hears of a fine tree, sends for it 
and has it brought by his elephants, with the roots and surrounding soil, the size of the tree being no impediment, and thus he has the finest collection of trees in the world. The hill is called Green Hill, from its being covered with evergreen trees and green turf, and on the top of the hill is a house. This hill is altogether so beautiful that it is the admiration of everyone. After Marco Polo has concluded his description of this palace, he gives one of that of the emperor's son and heir. Then he speaks of the town of Kambaluk, the old town which is separated from the modern town of Taidu by a canal, the same which divides the Chinese and Tartar quarters of Pekin. The traveller gives many particulars of the emperor's habits and among other things he says that Kublai Khan has a bodyguard of two thousand horse soldiers. But he adds, it is not fear that causes him to keep this guard. His meals are real ceremonies, and etiquette is most rigidly enforced. His table is raised above the others, and he always sits on the north side with his principal wife on his right, and lower down his sons, nephews, and relations. He is waited upon by noble barons, who are careful to envelop their mouths and noses in fine cloth of gold, so that their breath and their odour may not contaminate the food or drink of their lord. When the emperor is about to drink, a band of music plays, and when he takes the cup in his hand, all the barons and everyone present fall on their knees. The principal fates given by the Grand Khan were on the anniversary of his birth and on the first day of the year. At the first, 12,000 barons were accustomed to assemble round the throne and to them were presented annually 150,000 garments made of gold and silk and ornamented with pearls, whilst the subjects, idolaters as well as Christians, offered up public prayers. At the second of these fates, on the first day of the year, the whole population, men and women alike, appeared dressed in white following the tradition that white brings good fortune, and everyone brought gifts to the king of great value, one hundred thousand richly caparisoned horses, five thousand elephants covered with handsome cloths and carrying the imperial plate, as well as a large number of camels passed in procession before the emperor. During the three winter months of December, January and February, when the Khan is living in his winter palace, all the nobles within a radius of 60 days march are obliged to supply him with boars, stags, fallow deer, roes and bears. Besides, Kublai is a great huntsman himself and his hunting train is superbly mounted and kept up. He has leopards, lynxes and fine lions trained to hunt for wild animals, eagles strong enough to chase wolves, foxes, fallow and roe deer, and as Marco Polo says, often to take them too, and his dogs may be counted by thousands. It is about March when the emperor begins his principal hunting in the direction of the sea, and he is accompanied by no less than 10,000 falconers, 500 gerfalcons, and many goshawks, peregrine and sacred falcons. During the hunting excursion, a portable palace covered outside with lion skins and inside with cloth of gold and carried on four elephants harnessed together, accompanies the emperor everywhere, who seems to enjoy all this oriental pomp and display. 
he goes as far as the camp of Chachirimongu, which is situated on a stream, a tributary of the river Amur, and the tent is set up, which is large enough to hold ten thousand nobles. This is his reception saloon, where he gives audiences, and when he wishes to sleep, he goes into a tent which is hung all round with ermine and sable furs of almost priceless value. The emperor lives thus till about Easter, hunting cranes, swans, hares, stags, roebucks, etc., and then returns to his capital, Cambaluc. Marco Polo now completes his description of this fine city and enumerates the twelve quarters it contains, in many of which the rich merchants have their palatial houses, for commerce flourishes in this town, and more valuable merchandise is brought to it than to any other in the world. It is the depot and market for the richest productions of India such as pearls and precious stones, and merchants come from long distances round to purchase them. The Khan has established a mint here for the benefit of trade, and it is an inexhaustible source of revenue to him. The banknotes, sealed with the Emperor's seal, are made of a kind of cardboard manufactured from the bark of the mulberry tree. The cardboard thus prepared is cut into various thicknesses according to the value of the money it is supposed to represent. The currency of this money is enforced, none daring to refuse it on pain of death. The emperor using it in all his payments and enforcing its circulation throughout his dominions. Besides this, several times in the year, the possessors of precious stones, pearls, gold or silver are obliged to bring their treasures to the mint and receive in exchange for them these pieces of cardboard, so that, in fact, the emperor becomes the possessor of all the riches in his empire. According to Marco Polo, the system of the imperial government was wonderfully centralized. The kingdom is divided into thirty-four provinces and is governed by twelve of the greatest barons living in Cambaluc. In the same palace also reside the intendants and secretaries who conduct the business of each province. From this central city a great number of roads diverge to the various parts of the kingdom and on these roads are now post houses stationed at intervals of twenty-two miles, where well-mounted messengers are always ready to carry the emperor's messages. Besides this, at every three miles on the road, there is a little hamlet of about fourteen houses where the couriers live, who carry messages on foot. These men wear a belt round their waists, and have a girdle with bells attached to it, that are heard at a long distance. They start at a gallop, quickly accomplishing the three miles, and giving the message to the courier who is waiting for it at the next hamlet. Thus the emperor receives news from places at long distances from the capital in a comparatively short time. This mode of communication also involved but small expense to Kublai Khan, as the only remuneration he gave these couriers was their exemption from taxation and as to the horses, they were furnished gratuitously by the provinces. But if the emperor used his power in this manner to lay heavy burdens upon his subjects, he exerted himself actively for their good, and was always ready to help them. For instance, when their crops were damaged by hailstorms, he not only remitted all taxes, but gave them corn from his own stores, and when there was any great mortality among the flocks and herds in any particular province, he always replaced them at his own expense. He was careful to have a large quantity of wheat, barley, millet, and rice 
stored up in years of abundant harvest, so as to keep the price of grain at a uniform rate when the harvest failed. He was particularly careful of the poor who live in Cambaluc. He had a list made of all the poorest houses in the town, where they were usually short of food, and supplied them liberally with wheat and other grain, according to the size of their families, and bread was never refused to any applying at the palace for it. It is computed that at least 30,000 persons avail themselves of this daily throughout the year. His kindness to his poor subjects makes them almost worship him. The whole affairs of the empire are administered with great care, the roads well kept up and planted with fine trees, so that from a distance their direction can easily be traced. There is no want of wood, and in Cathay they work a number of coal pits which supply abundance of coal. Marco Polo remained a long time at Cambaluc, and his intelligence, spirit, and readiness in adapting himself made him a great favorite with the emperor. He was entrusted with various missions, not only in China, but also to places on the coast of India, Ceylon, the Coromandel and Malabar coasts, and a part of Cochin, China, near Cambodia. And between the years 1277 and 1280, he was made governor of Yangchou, and of twenty-seven other towns which were joined with it under the same government. Thanks to the missions on which he was sent, he travelled over an immense extent of country and gained a great amount of ethnological and geographical knowledge. We can now follow him map in hand through some of these journeys, which were of the greatest service to science. End of First Part, Chapter 4, Part 2section 8 of celebrated travels and travelers volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org celebrated travels and travelers volume 1 exploration of the world by jules verne first part chapter 4 part 3 Marco Polo. When Marco Polo had been at Cambaluc some time, he was sent on a mission that kept him absent from the capital for four months. Ten miles southwards from Cambaluc, he crossed the fine river Pehonor, which he calls the Pulisangi, by a stone bridge of twenty-four arches and three hundred feet in length, which was then without parallel in the world. Thirty miles further on he came to the town of Tsochu, where a large trade in sandalwood is carried on. At ten days' journey from hence he came to the modern town of Taiyenfu, which was once the seat of an independent government. All the province of Shanxi seemed rich in vines and mulberry trees. The principal industry in the towns was the making of armour for the emperor's use. Seven days' journey further on, they came to the beautiful commercial city of Pianfu, now called Pinyangfu, where the manufacture of silk was carried on. He soon afterwards came to the banks of the Yellow River, which he calls Karamuran, or Black River, probably on account of its waters being darkened by the aquatic plants growing in them. At two days' journey from hence he came to the town of Kakianfu, whose position is not now clearly defined. He found nothing remarkable in this town, and leaving it he rode across a beautiful country covered with towns, country houses and gardens, and abounding in game. 
In eight days he reached the fine city of Kwangianfu, the ancient capital of the Tang dynasty, now called Signanfu, and the capital of Shenzi. Here reigned Prince Mangale, the emperor's son, an upright and amiable prince, much loved by his people. He lived in a magnificent palace outside the town, built in the midst of a park, of which the battlemented wall cannot have been less than five miles in circumference. From Signanfu, the traveller went towards Tibet, across the modern province of Su Chuan, a mountainous country intersected by deep valleys where lions, bears, lynxes, etc. abounded and after twenty-eight days' march he found himself on the borders of the great plain of Akmelik Mangi. This is a fertile country and produces all kinds of vegetation. Ginger is especially cultivated. There is sufficient to supply all the province of Cathay, and so fertile is the soil that according to a French traveller, M. E. Simon, an acre is now worth 15,000 francs, or three francs the metre. In the 13th century, this plain was covered with towns and country houses, and the inhabitants lived upon the fruits of the ground and the produce of their flocks and herds, while the large quantity of game furnished hunters with abundant occupation. Marco Polo next visited the town of Sindafu, now Tu Fu, the capital of the province of Sichuan, whose population at the present day exceeds 1,500,000 souls. Sindafu, measuring at that time 20 miles round, was divided into three parts, each surrounded with its own wall, and each part had a king of its own before Kublai Khan took possession of the town. The great river Kiang ran through the town. It contained large quantities of fish, and from its size resembled a sea more than a river. Its waters were covered by a vast number of vessels. Five days after leaving this busy, thriving town, Marco Polo reached the province of Tibet, which he says is very desolate, for it has been destroyed by the war. Tibet abounds in lions, bears, and other savage animals, from which the travellers would have much difficulty in defending themselves had it not been for the quantity of large, thick canes that grow there, which are probably bamboos. He says, The merchants and travellers passing through these countries at night collect a quantity of these canes and make a large fire of them for when they are burning they make such a noise and crackle so much that the lions, bears and other wild beasts take flight to a distance and would not approach these fires on any account. Thus both men, horses and camels are safe. In another way, too, protection is afforded by throwing a number of these canes on a wood fire, and when they become heated and split and the sap hisses, the sound is heard at least ten miles off. When anyone is not accustomed to this noise, it is so terrifying that even the horses will break away from their cords and tethers, so their owners often bandage their eyes and tie their feet together to prevent their running away. This method of burning canes is still used in countries where the bamboo grows, and indeed the noise may be compared to the loudest explosion of fireworks. According to Marco Polo, Tibet is a very large province, having its own language, and its inhabitants, who are idolaters, are a race of bold thieves. A large river, the Qin Cha Kiang, flows over auriferous sands through the province. A quantity of coral is found in it, which is much used for idols and for the adornment of the women. Tibet was at this time under the dominion of the great Khan. The traveller took a westerly direction when he left Sindafu, and crossing the kingdom of Gaindu, he must have come to Li Kiangfu, 
the capital of the country that is now called Tsi Mong. In this province he visited a beautiful lake which produces pearl oysters. The fishing is the emperor's property. He also found great quantities of cinnamon, ginger, cloves, and other spices under cultivation. After leaving the province of Gaindu and crossing a large river, probably the Irrawaddy, Marco Polo took a southeasterly course to the province of Karayan, which probably forms the northwestern part of Yunnan. According to his account, all the inhabitants of this province, who are mostly great riders, live on the raw flesh of fowls, sheep, buffaloes, and oxen, the rich seasoning their raw meat with garlic sauce and good spices. This country is infested with great adders and serpents hideous to look upon. These reptiles, probably alligators, were ten feet long, had two legs armed with claws, and with their large heads and great jaws could at one gulp swallow a man. Five days' journey west of Carrion, Marco Polo took a new route to the south, and entered the province of Zardandan, whose capital, Nocian, is the modern town of Yungchang. All the inhabitants of the city had teeth of gold, that is to say, they covered their teeth with little plates of gold which they removed before eating. The men of this province employed themselves only in hunting, catching birds, and making war, the hard work all devolving upon the women and slaves. These Zardanians have neither idols nor churches, but they each worship their ancestor, the patriarch of the family. Their tradesmen carry their goods about on barrows, like the bakers in France. They have no doctors, but only enchanters, who jump, dance, and play musical instruments around the invalid's bed, till he either dies or recovers. Leaving these people with gilded teeth, Marco Polo took the great road which conveys all the traffic between India and Indochina and passed by Bamo, where a market is held three times a week, which attracts merchants from the most distant countries. After riding for fifteen days through forests filled with elephants, unicorns and other wild animals, he came to the great city of Mien, that is to say, to that part of Upper Burma of which the present capital of recent erection is called Amarapura. This city of Mien, which may be perhaps the old town of Ava, now in ruins, or the old town of Pagan, situated on the Irrawaddy, possessed a veritable architectural marvel in two towers, one built of fine stone and entirely covered with a coating of gold about an inch in thickness, and the other, also of stone, coated with silver, both intended to serve as a tomb for the king of Mien before his kingdom fell under the dominion of the Khan. After visiting this province, the traveller went to Bangala, the Bengal of the present day, which at this time, 1290, did not belong to Kublai Khan. The emperor's forces were then engaged in trying to conquer this fertile country, rich in cotton plants, in sugar canes, etc., and whose magnificent oxen were like elephants in height. From thence, the traveller ventured as far as the city of Kankigu, in the province of the same name, probably the modern town of Kasaya. The natives here tattooed their bodies, and with needles drew pictures of lions, dragons, and birds on their faces, necks, bellies, hands, legs and bodies, and he who had the greatest number of these pictures they considered the most beautiful of human beings. Kankigu was the most southerly point visited by Marco Polo during this journey. Leaving this city, 
he went towards the northeast, and by the country of Amu, Anam, and Tonkin, he reached Tolaman, now called Taiping, after fifteen days' march. There he found that fine race of men, of dark colour, who have crowned their mountains with strong castles, and whose ordinary food is the flesh of animals, milk, rice, and spices. On leaving Toloman, he followed the course of a river for twelve days, and found numerous towns on its banks. Here, as M. Choton truly observes, the traveller is leaving the country known as India beyond the Ganges, and returning towards China. In fact, Marco Polo, after leaving Toloman, visited the province of Gui Gui, with its capital of the same name and what struck him most in this country, and we cannot but think that the bold explorer was also a keen hunter, was the great number of lions that were to be seen about its mountains and plains. Only, commentators are of opinion that the lions he speaks of must have been tigers, for no lions are found in China, but we will give his own words, he says. There are so many lions in this country that it is not safe to sleep out of doors for fear of being devoured, and when you are on the river and stop for the night, you must be careful to anchor far from land, for otherwise the lions come to the vessel, seize upon a man, and devour him. The inhabitants of this part of the country are well aware of this, and so take measures to guard against it. These lions are very large and very dangerous but there are dogs in this country brave enough to attack these lions. It requires two dogs and a man to overcome each lion. From this province, Marco Polo returned to Sindifu, the capital of the province of Sichuan, whence he had started on his excursion into Tibet. And retracing the route by which he had set out, he returned to Kublai Khan, after having brought his mission to Indochina to a satisfactory termination. It was probably at this time that the traveller was first entrusted by the emperor with another mission to the southeast of China. Monsieur Pautier, in his fine work upon the Venetian traveller, speaks of this southeasterly part of China as the richest and most flourishing quarter of this vast empire and that also about which, since the 16th century, Europeans have had the most information. As we return to the route that M. Pautier has traced on his map, we found that Marco Polo went southwards to Kiangli, probably the town of Tichu, and at six days' journey from thence he came to Kondinfu, the present city of Tsinan, the capital of the province of Shantung the birthplace of Confucius. It was at that time a fine town, and much frequented by silk merchants, and its beautiful gardens produced abundance of excellent fruit. Three days' march from hence, the traveller came to the town of Lin Tsing, standing at the mouth of the yu Ho Canal, the principal rendezvous for the innumerable boats that carry so much merchandise to the provinces of Mangi and Cathay. Eight days afterwards he passed by Ligui, which seems to correspond to the modern town of Linsin, and the town of Piso, the first city in the province of Tiangsu. Then by the town of Kingui he arrived at Karamoran, the Yellow River, which he had crossed higher up when he was on his way to Indochina. Here Marco Polo was not more than a league from the mouth of this great river. After crossing it, he was in the province of Mangi, a territory included in the empire of the Sungs. Before this province of Mangi belonged to Kublai Khan, it was governed by a very pacific king who shunned war and was very merciful to all his subjects. Marco Polo describes him so well that we will quote his own words. This last emperor of the Sung dynasty was most generous, and I will cite but two noble traits to show this. 
every year he had nearly twenty thousand infants brought up at the royal charge for it was the custom in these provinces when a poor woman could not bring up a child herself to cast it away as soon as it was born to die the king had all these children taken care of and a record kept of the sign and the planet under which each was born and then they were sent to different places to be brought up for there are a quantity of nurses when a rich man had no sons he came to the king and asked of him some of his wards, who were immediately given to him. As the children grew up, they intermarried, and the king gave them sufficient incomes to live upon. When he went through his dominions and saw a small house among several much larger ones, he inquired why this house was smaller than those near it, and if he found it was on account of the poverty of the owner, he immediately had it made as large as the others at his own expense. He was always waited upon by a thousand pages and a thousand girls. He kept up such rigorous discipline throughout his kingdom that there was never any crime. At night, houses and shops remained open, and nothing was taken from them, and travelling was as safe by night as by day. Marco Polo came first to the town of Koi Gangui, now called Huang Fu, on the banks of the Yellow River, where the principal industry is the preparation of the salt found in the salt marshes. One day's journey from this town he came to Pao In Chen, famous for its cloth of gold, and the town of Kaiyu, now Kaoyu, whose inhabitants are clever fishermen and hunters then to the city of Tao Chu, where numerous vessels are generally to be found, and at last to the city of Yangui. This town of Yangui, of which Marco Polo was the governor for three years, is the modern Yangchu. It is a very populous and busy town, and cannot be less than two leagues in circumference. It was from Yangui that the traveller set out on the various expeditions which enabled him to see so much of the inland and sea coast towns. First, the traveller went westward to Nangin, which must not be confounded with Nankin of the present day. Its modern name is Nanking, and it stands in the midst of a remarkably fertile province. Further on, in the same direction, he came to Fu which is now called Xiangyang, and is built in the northern part of the province of Hupei. This was the last town in the province of Mangi that resisted the dominion of Kublai Khan. He besieged it for three years, and he owed his taking it at last to the help of the three polos, who constructed some powerful ballistas and crushed the besieged under a perfect hailstorm of stones, some of which weighed as much as three hundred pounds. From Sianfu, Marco Polo retraced his steps, that he might visit some of the towns on the sea coast. He visited Kui Kiang, on the river Kiang, which is very broad here, and upon which five thousand ships can sail at the same moment. Kane Gui, which supplies the emperor's palace with corn, Ching Kiang, where are two Nestorian Christian churches, Gin Gui Gui, now Chiang Chou, a busy thriving city, and Sin Gui, now called Su Chu, a large town which according to the very exaggerated account of the Venetian traveller has no less than six thousand bridges. After spending some time at Vugui, probably Hu Chu, and at Kiangan, now Kiahing, Marco Polo reached the fine city of Quinsei after three days' march. This name means the city of heaven but it is now called Hang Chao Fu. It is six leagues round. The river Tian Tang Kiang flows through it, and by its constant windings makes Quinsei almost a second Venice. This ancient capital of the Sungs is almost as populous as Pekin. Its streets are paved with stones and bricks, 
and if we may credit Marco Polo's statement, it contained 600,000 houses, 4,000 bathing establishments, and 12,000 stone bridges. In this city dwell the richest merchants in the world, with their wives, who are beautiful and angelic creatures. It is the residence of a viceroy, who has besides 140 other cities under his dominion. Here was to be seen also the palace of the Mangi sovereigns surrounded by beautiful gardens, lakes and fountains, the palace itself containing more than a thousand rooms. Kublai Khan draws immense revenues from this town and province, and it is by tens of thousands of pounds we must reckon the income derived from the sugar, salt, spices and silk which form the principal productions of this country. At one day's journey south from Quinzay, Marco Polo visited Chaohing, Vugui or Huchou, Gengui or Kuichou, Qianxian or Youqiufu, according to Monsieur Chateau, and Soni Tiangfu, according to Monsieur Pautier, and Kugui or Kyuchu, the last town in the kingdom of Quinsei. Thence he entered the kingdom of Fugui, whose chief town of the same name is now called Fu Fu, the capital of the province of Fo Qian. According to Marco Polo, the inhabitants of this province are a cruel, warlike race, never sparing their enemies, of whom, after they've killed them, they drink the blood and eat the flesh. After passing by Quenlifu, now Qianningfu, and Anguen, the traveller entered Fugui, probably the modern town of Kuanchu, called Canton amongst us and the chief town of the province, where a large trade in pearls and precious stones was carried on. And in five days he reached the port of Zai Tem, probably the Chinese town of Tsuenchu, which was the extreme point reached by him in this exploration of southeastern China. End of First Part, Chapter 4, Part 3「Marco Polo Marco Polo returned to the court of Kublai Khan when he had finished the expedition of which we spoke in the last chapter. He was then entrusted with several other missions in which he found his knowledge of the Turkish, Chinese, Mongolian and Manchurian languages of the greatest use. He seems to have taken part in an expedition to the islands in the Indian Ocean and he brought back a detailed account of this hitherto little-known sea. There is a want of clearness as to dates at this part of his life, which makes it difficult to give a correct narrative of these voyages in their right order. He gives a circumstantial account of the island of Kipango, a name applying to the group of islands which make up Japan, but it does not appear that he actually entered that kingdom. This country was famous for its wealth, and about 1264, some years before Marco Polo arrived at the Tartar court, Kublai Khan had tried to conquer it, and sent his fleet there with that purpose. They had taken possession of a citadel, and put all its valiant defenders to the edge of the sword. But just at the moment of apparent victory, a storm arose and dispersed all the enemy's fleet and thus the expedition was useless. Marco Polo gives a long account of this attempt, and adds many curious particulars as to Japanese customs. Marco Polo, with his father and uncle, had now been seventeen years in the service of Kublai Khan, 
and even longer absent from their own country. They had a great wish to revisit it, but the emperor had become so attached to them and valued their services so highly that he could not make up his mind to part with them. He tried in every way to shake their resolution, offering them riches and honour if only they would remain with him, but they still held to their plan of returning to Europe. The emperor then absolutely refused to allow them to go, and Marco Polo could find no means of eluding the surveillance of which he was the object, until circumstances arose which quite changed Kublai Khan's resolution. A Mongol prince named Argun, whose dominions were in Persia, had sent an ambassador to the emperor to ask one of the princesses of the blood royal in marriage. Kublai Khan acceded to his request and sent off his daughter Kogatra to Prince Argun, attended by a numerous suite, but the countries by which they endeavoured to travel were not safe. The caravan was soon stopped by disturbances and rebellions, and after some months was obliged to return to the Emperor's palace. The Persian ambassadors had heard Marco Polo spoken of as a clever navigator who had had some experience of the Indian Ocean, and they begged the Emperor to confide the Princess Kogatra to his care, that he might conduct her to her future husband thinking that the voyage by sea would probably be attended by less danger than a land journey. After some demur, Kublai Khan acceded to their request and equipped a fleet of forty four-masted vessels, provisioning them for two years. Some of these were very large, having a crew of 250 men, for this was an important expedition worthy of the opulent emperor of China. Matteo, Niccolo, and Marco Polo set out with the Chinese princess and the Persian ambassadors, and it was during this voyage, which lasted eighteen months, that it seems most probable that Marco Polo visited the islands of Sunda and other islands in the Indian Ocean, as well as Ceylon and the towns on the coast of India. We will follow him in his voyage and give his description of the places that he visited in this hitherto little-known portion of the globe. It must have been about 1291 or 1292 that the fleet left the port of Zaitem under the command of Marco Polo. He steered first for Champa, a great country situated at the south of Cochin, China, and which contains the present province of Saigon, belonging to France. This was not a new country to Marco Polo, as he had visited it about 1280, when he was on a mission for the Emperor. At this time, Champa was under the dominion of the Grand Khan, and paid him an annual tribute in elephants. When Marco Polo visited this country before its conquest by Kublai Khan, he found the reigning king had no less than 326 children of whom a hundred and fifty were old enough to carry arms. Leaving the peninsula of Cambodia, the fleet went in the direction of Java, the rich island that Kublai Khan had never been able to subjugate, where abundance of pepper, cloves, nutmegs, etc. grew. After putting into port at Condor and Sandur, at the extremity of the peninsula of Cochin, China, they reached the island of Pentam, Bintang, situated near the eastern entrance of the Straits of Malacca, and the island of Sumatra, called Little Java. This island is so much in the south, he says, that they never see there the polar star, which is true as far as the inhabitants of the southern part are concerned. It is very fertile, aloes growing most luxuriantly, and here wild elephants and rhinoceroses, called by Marco Polo unicorns, are found, and apes, too, in large numbers. The fleet was detained five months on these shores by contrary winds, and the traveller made the most of his time in visiting the principal provinces of the island, such as Samara, 
Dagrayan, and Labrin, which boasts a great number of men with tails, evidently apes, and the island of Fandur, or Panchor, where the sago tree grows, from which a kind of flour is obtained that makes very good bread. At last the wind changed, and enabled the vessels to leave little Java, and after touching at Nekaran, which must be one of the Nicobar Islands, and at the Andaman group, whose inhabitants are still cannibals, as they were in the time of Marco Polo, the fleet took a southwesterly course and arrived on the coast of Ceylon. This island, says the traveller in his narrative, was once much larger, for according to the map of the world that the pilots of these seas carry, it was once 3,600 miles in circumference, but the north wind blows with such force in these parts that it caused a part of the island to be submerged. This tradition is still held by the inhabitants of Ceylon. Here are collected in abundance rubies, sapphires, topaz, amethysts, and other precious stones, such as garnets, opals, agates, and sardonyx. The king of the country was the possessor at this time of a most splendid ruby, as long as the palm of the hand, as thick as a man's arm and red as fire, which excited the envy of the Grand Khan, who vainly tried to induce its possessor to part with it, offering a whole city in exchange but that could not tempt the king to let him have the jewel. Sixty miles west of Ceylon, the travellers came to Mabar, a great province on the coast of India. This must not be mistaken for Malabar, which is situated on the west coast of the Indian peninsula. This Mabar forms the southern part of the Coromandel coast, and is celebrated for its pearl fisheries. Here the magicians are at work, and are said to render the monsters of the deep harmless to the fishermen. They are astrologers whose race is perpetuated even to modern times. Marco Polo gives some interesting details of the customs of the natives. One is that when a king dies, the nobles throw themselves into the fire in his honour. Another strange custom is that of the religious purifications twice every day, and their blind faith in astrologers and diviners. He also speaks of the frequency of religious suicides, and the sacrifice of widows whom the funeral pile awaits on the death of their husbands. He also notices the skill in physiognomy evinced by the natives. The next resting place of the fleet was Muftili, of which the capital is now called Masulipatam, the chief city of the kingdom of Golconda. This country was well governed by a queen, a widow for forty years, who desired to remain faithful to the memory of her husband. The country contained many valuable diamond mines but these were unfortunately among mountains where serpents abounded. The miners had recourse to a strange device when collecting the precious stones, to protect themselves from these reptiles, which we may believe or not as we choose. Marco Polo says, They take several pieces of meat, and throw them among the pointed rocks, where no man can go, and the meat falling upon the diamonds, they become attached to it. Now among these mountains live a number of white eagles who hunt the serpents, and when they see the meat at the foot of the precipices, they swoop down and carry it away. At the moment the men who have been following the eagles' movements see them alight to eat the meat, they raise fearful cries. The meat is dropped, and the eagles take to flight, and thus the men have no difficulty in taking the diamonds that are attached to the meat. Diamonds are often found on the mountains mingled with the excrement of the eagles. After visiting the small town of St. Thomas, situated some miles to the south of Madras, 
where St. Thomas the Apostle is said to be buried, the travellers explored the kingdom of Mabar, and especially the province of Lar, from whence spring all the Abrahamites of the world, probably the Brahmins. These men, he says, live to a great age, owing to their abstinence and sobriety. Some have been known to attain a hundred and fifty and even two hundred years of age. Their diet is principally rice and milk, and they drink a mixture of sulphur and quicksilver. These Abrahamites are clever merchants, superstitious, however, but remarkably sincere, and never guilty of theft of any kind. They never kill any living thing, and they worship the ox, which is a sacred animal among them. The fleet now returned to Ceylon, where in 1284 Kublai Khan had sent an ambassador who had brought him back some pretended relics of Adam, and among other things, two of his molar teeth. For, if we can believe the Saracen traditions, the tomb of our first father must have been on the summit of one of the precipitous mountains which forms the highest ground in the island. After losing sight of Ceylon, Marco Polo went to Kyle, a port that we do not find marked on any of the modern maps, but a place where all the vessels touched coming from Ormuz, Kis, Aden, and the coasts of Arabia. Thence doubling Cape Cormoran, they came to Coilum, now Quilon, which was a very thriving city in the 13th century. It is there that a great quantity of sandalwood and indigo is found, and merchants come in large numbers from the Levant and from the West to trade in both. The country of Malabar produces a great quantity of rice, and wild animals are found there, such as leopards, which Marco Polo calls black lions, also peacocks of much greater beauty than those of Europe, as well as different kinds of parakeets. The fleet, leaving Coilum and advancing northwards along the Malabar coast, arrived at the shores of the kingdom of Mondelay, which derives its name from a mountain situated on the borders of Canara and Malabar. Here pepper, ginger, saffron and other spices abound. To the north of this kingdom extended that country which the Venetian traveller calls Melabar, and which is situated to the north of Malabar proper. The vessels of the Mangalore merchants came here to trade with the natives of this part of India for cargoes of spices, a fine kind of cloth called buckram, and other valuable wares. But their vessels were frequently attacked, and too often pillaged by the pirates who infested these seas, and who were justly regarded as formidable enemies. These pirates principally inhabit the peninsula of Gohurat, now called Gujarat, where the fleet was on its way after calling at Tana, a country where is collected the frankincense, and Kanboat, now Kambe, a town where there is a great trade in leather. Visiting Sumanath, a city of the peninsula, whose inhabitants are cruel, ferocious, and idolaters, and Kesmakoran, the modern city of Kedja, the capital of Makran, situated on the Indus near the sea, and the last town in India on the northwest. Marco Polo went westward, across the Sea of Oman, instead of going to Persia, which was the destination of the princess. His insatiable love of exploration led him five hundred miles away to the shores of Arabia, where he stopped at the male and female islands, so called from the men usually living on one island and their wives on the other. Thence they sailed to the south, towards the island of Socotra, at the entrance of the Gulf of Aden, which Marco Polo partially explored. He speaks of the inhabitants of Socotra as clever magicians, who by their enchantments obtain the fulfilment of all their wishes as well as the power of stilling storms and tempests. Then, taking a southerly course of one thousand miles, he arrived at the shores of Madagascar. 
this island appeared to him to be one of the grandest in the world. Its inhabitants are very much occupied with commerce, especially in elephants' tusks. They live principally upon camel's flesh, which is better and more wholesome food than any other. The merchants, on their way from the coast of India, are usually only twenty days crossing the Sea of Oman, but when they return they are often three months on the voyage, on account of the opposing currents which take them always southwards. Nevertheless, they visit Madagascar very constantly, for there are whole forests of sandalwood, and amber is also found there, from which they can obtain great profit by bartering it for gold and silk stuffs. Wild animals and game are plentiful. According to Marco Polo, leopards, bears, lions, wild boars, giraffes, wild asses, roebucks, deer, stags, and cattle were to be found in great numbers. But what seemed most marvellous of all to him was the fabulous griffin, the rock, of which we hear so much in the Thousand and One Nights, which is not, he says, an animal half lion and half bird, able to raise and carry away an elephant in its claws. It was probably the Epiornis Maximus, for some eggs of this bird are still to be found in Madagascar. From this island, Marco Polo went in a northwesterly direction to Zanzibar and the coast of Africa. The inhabitants seemed to him remarkably stout, but strong and able to carry the burdens of four ordinary men, which is not strange, he says, for they each eat as much as five other men. These natives are black and wore no clothing. They had large mouths and turned up noses, thick lips and large eyes, a description that agrees exactly with that of the natives of that part of Africa now. They live upon rice, meat, milk and dates, and make a kind of wine of rice, sugar and spices. They are brave warriors and fearless of death. They are usually in war mounted on camels and elephants, and armed with a leathern shield, a sword and a lance. They give their animals an intoxicating drink to excite them on going into action. In Marco Polo's time, says Monsieur Charton, the countries comprised under the title of India were divided into three parts. Greater India, or Hindustan, that is the country lying between the Indus and the Ganges. Lesser India, that is, all the country lying beyond the Ganges, between the western coast of the peninsula and the coast of Cochin, China. Lastly, Middle India, that is, Abyssinia and the Arabian coast to the Persian Gulf. After leaving Zanzibar, it was Middle India whose coast Marco Polo explored, sailing towards the north and first Abyssi or Abyssinia a fertile country where the manufacture of fine cotton cloths and buckram is largely carried on. Then the fleet went to Zaila, almost at the entrance of the Straits of Mabel Mandeb, and at last by the coast of Yemen and Hadramaut they came to Aden, the port frequented by all the ships trading with India and China. Then to Eskia, whence a great quantity of fine horses are exported, Dafar, which produces incense of the finest quality, and Galatu, now Kalayati, on the coast of Oman. Then to Ormuz, that Marco Polo had visited once before when he was on his way from Venice to the court of Kublai Khan. This was the furthest point that the fleet had to reach, as the princess was now on the borders of Persia after a voyage of eighteen months. But on their arrival they were met by the sad news of the death of Prince Argon, the fiancé of the princess, and they found the country involved in civil war. The poor princess was put under the care of Prince Gazan, the son of Prince Argon, who did not ascend the throne until 1295, when his uncle, the usurper, was strangled. 
What became of the princess we do not hear, but on parting with Niccolò, Matteo, and Marco Polo, she bestowed on them great marks of favour. It was probably during Marco Polo's residence in Persia that he collected some curious documents upon Turkey in Asia. They are disconnected pieces which he gives at the close of his narrative, and they form a genuine history of the Mongol Khans of Persia. His travels for exploration were at an end, and after taking leave of the Tartar princess, the three Venetians, well escorted, and with all expenses paid, set out on their way home. They went to Trebizond, then to Constantinople, and thence to Necropont, where they embarked for Venice. It was in the year 1295, twenty-four years after leaving it, that Marco Polo and his companions returned to their native town. They were bronzed by exposure to the air and sun, coarsely clad in Tartar costume, and both in manners and language were so much more Mongolian than Venetian that even their nearest relatives failed to recognize them. Beyond this, a report had been widely spread that they were dead and it had gained so much credence that their friends never expected to see them again. They went to their own house in the part of Venice called St. John Chrysostom, and found it occupied by different members of the Polo family, who received the travellers with every mark of distrust, which their pitiable appearance did not tend to lessen, and placed no faith in the somewhat marvellous stories related to them by Marco Polo. After some persuasion, however, they gained admittance into their own house. When they had been a few days in Venice, the three travellers gave a magnificent banquet, followed by a splendid fete, to do away with any remaining doubts as to their identity. They invited the nobility of Venice and all the members of their own family, and when all the guests were assembled, the three hosts appeared dressed in crimson satin robes. The guests then entered the dining room and the feast began. After the first course was over, the three travellers retired for a few moments and then reappeared clad in robes of splendid silk damask which they proceeded to tear and to present each of their guests with a piece. After the second course, they dressed themselves in even more splendid robes of crimson velvet, which they wore until the feast was over, when they appeared in simple Venetian costume. The astonished guests marvelled at the magnificence of these garments, and wondered what their hosts would next show them. Then the coarse rough clothes that they had worn on the voyage were brought in, and when the linings and seams were undone, rubies, sapphires, emeralds, diamonds, and carbuncles of great value were poured forth from them. Great riches had been hidden in these rags. This unexpected sight cleared away all doubt. The three travellers were recognised at once as Marco, Niccolò, and Matteo Polo, and congratulations upon their return were showered upon them. So celebrated a man as Marco Polo could not escape civic honours. He was made first magistrate in Venice, and as he was continually speaking of the millions of the Grand Khan, who commanded millions of subjects, he gained the sobriquet of Signor Million. It was about 1296 that a war broke out between Venice and Genoa, a Genoese fleet under the command of Lambadoria crossed the Adriatic and threatened the sea coast. The Venetian admiral Andreo Dandolo immediately manned a larger fleet and entrusted the command of a galley to Marco Polo, who was justly considered an able commander. The Venetians were beaten in a naval battle on the 8th of September 1296, and Marco Polo, badly wounded, fell into the hands of the Genoese, who, knowing and appreciating the value of their prisoner, treated him with great kindness. He was taken to Genoa, and there met with a hearty welcome from the most distinguished people, who were anxious to hear the account of his travels. 
It was during his captivity, in 1298, that he made acquaintance with Pisano Rusticien, and, tired of repeating his story again and again, dictated his narrative to him. About 1299, Marco Polo was set at liberty. He returned to Venice and there married. From this time we hear no more of the incidents of his life, and only know from his will that he left three daughters. He is thought to have died about the 9th of January, 1323, at the age of 70. Such is the life of this celebrated traveller, whose narrative had a marked influence on the progress of geographical science. He was gifted with great power of observation, and could see and describe equally well, and all later explorers have confirmed the truth of his statements. Until the middle of the 18th century, the documents founded on this narrative formed the basis of geographical books, and were used as a guide in commercial expeditions to China, India and Central Asia. Posterity will concur in the suitability of the title that the first copyists gave to Marco Polo's work, that of The Book of the Wonders of the World. End of First Part Chapter 4 Part 4《セクション10》of《Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko.《Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1 》Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 5 Ibn Battuta, 1328-1353 to 1353. Marco Polo had returned to his native land now nearly 25 years, when a Franciscan monk traversed the whole of Asia from the Black Sea to the extreme limits of China, passing by Trebizond, Mount Ararat, Babel, and the island of Java, but he was so credulous of all that was told him, and his narrative is so confused, that but little reliance can be placed upon it. It is the same with the fabulous travels of Jean de Mandeville. Cooley says of them, they are so utterly untrue that they have not their parallel in any language. But we find a worthy successor to the Venetian traveler in an Arabian theologian named Abdullah el Lawati better known by the name of Ibn Battuta. He did for Egypt, Arabia, Anatolia, Tartary, India, China, Bengal, and Sudan, what Marco Polo had done for Central Asia. And he is worthy to be placed in the foremost rank as a brave traveler and bold explorer. In the year 1324, the 725th year of the Hegira, he resolved to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, and starting from tangier his native town he went first to alexandria and thence to cairo during his stay in egypt he turned his attention to the nile and especially to the delta then he tried to sail up the river but being stopped by disturbances on the nubian frontier he was obliged to return to the mouth of the river and then set sail for asia minor after visiting Gaza, the tombs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Tyre, then strongly fortified and unassailable on three sides, and Tiberius, which was in ruins, and whose celebrated baths were completely destroyed. Ibn Battuta was attracted by the wonders of Lebanon, the center for all the hermits of that day, who had judiciously chosen one of the most lovely spots in the whole world wherein to end their days. Then, passing Baalbek, and going on to Damascus, he found the city, in the year 1345, decimated by the plague. This fearful scourge devoured 24,000 persons daily, if we may believe his report, and Damascus would have been depopulated had not the prayers of all the people offered up in the mosque, containing the stone with the print of Moses' foot upon it, been heard and answered. 
On leaving Damascus, Ibn Battuta went to Mesjid, where he visited the tomb of Ali, which attracts a large number of paralytic pilgrims who need only to spend one night in prayer beside it to be completely cured. Batuta does not seem to doubt the authenticity of this miracle, well known in the East under the title of the Night of Cure. From Mesjid, the traveler went to Busora and entered the kingdom of Ispahan and then the province of Shiraz, where he wished to converse with the celebrated worker of miracles, Magd Aden. From Shiraz, he went to Baghdad to Tabriz, then to Medina, where he prayed beside the tomb of the prophet, and finally to Mecca, where he remained three years. It is well known that from Mecca caravans are continually starting for the surrounding country, and it was in company with some of these bold merchants that Ibn Battuta was able to visit the towns of Yemen. He went as far as Aden, at the mouth of the Red Sea, and embarked for Zaila, one of the Abyssinian ports. He was now once more on African ground, and advanced into the country of the Berbers, that he might study the manners and customs of those dirty and repulsive tribes. He found their diet consisted wholly of fish and camel's flesh, but in the town of Magdasbu there was an attempt at comfort and civilization, presenting a most agreeable contrast with the surrounding squalor. The inhabitants were very fat, each of them, to use Ibn's own expression, eating enough to feed a convent. They were very fond of delicacies, such as plantains boiled in milk, preserved citrons, pods of fresh pepper, and green ginger. After seeing all he wished of the country of the Berbers, chiefly on the coast, he resolved to go to Zanguibar, and then, crossing the Red Sea and following the coast of Arabia, he came to Zafar, a town situated upon the Indian Ocean. The vegetation of this country is most luxuriant, the beetle, coconut, and incense trees forming their great forests, still the traveller pushed on, and came to Ormuz on the Persian Gulf, and passed through several provinces of Persia. We find him a second time at Mecca in the year 1332, three years after he had left it. But this was only to be a short rest for the traveller, for now, leaving Asia for Africa, he went to Upper Egypt, a region but little known and thence to Cairo. He next visited Syria, making a short way at Jerusalem and Tripoli, and thence he visited the Turkomans of Anatolia, where the confraternity of young men gave him a most hearty welcome. After Anatolia, the Arabian narrative speaks of Asia Minor. Ibn Battuta advanced as far as Erzurum, where he was shown an aerolite weighing 620 pounds. Then, crossing the Black Sea, he visited the Crimea, Kaffa, and Bulgar, a town of sufficiently high latitude for the unequal length of day and night to be very marked. And at last he reached Astrakhan, at the mouth of the Volga, where the Khan of Tartary lived during the winter months. The Princess Bailun, the wife of the Khan, and daughter of the Emperor of Constantinople, was wishing to visit her father, and it was an opportunity not to be lost by Ibn Battuta for exploring Turkey in Europe. He gained permission to accompany the princess, who set out attended by five thousand men, and followed by a portable mosque, which was set up at every place where they stayed. The princess's reception at Constantinople was very magnificent, the bells being rung with such spirit that he says even the horizon seemed full of the vibration. The welcome given to the theologian by the princes of the country was worthy of his fame. He remained in the city thirty-six days, so that he was able to study it in all its details. This was a time when communication between the different countries was both dangerous and difficult, and Ibn Battuta was considered a very bold traveler. Egypt, Arabia, Turkey in Asia, the Caucasian provinces had all in turn been explored by him. After such hard work, he might well have taken rest and been satisfied with the laurels that he had gained, for he was without doubt the most celebrated traveler of the 14th century. But his insatiable passion for traveling remained, and the circle of his explorations was still to widen considerably. On leaving Constantinople, Ibn Battuta went again to 
Astrakhan, thence crossing the sandy wastes of the present Turkestan, he arrived at Kovarezen, a large populous town, then at Bokhara, half destroyed by the armies of Genghis Khan. Some time after, we hear of him at Samarkand, a religious town which greatly pleased the learned traveler, and then at Balk, which he could not reach without crossing the desert of Khorasan. This town was all in ruins, and desolate, for the armies of the barbarians had been there, and Ibn Battuta could not remain in it, but wished to go westward to the frontier of Afghanistan. The mountainous country, near the Hindu Kush range, confronted him, but this was no barrier to him, and after great fatigue, which he bore with equal patience and good humor, he reached the important town of Herat. This was the most westerly point reached by the traveler. He now resolved to change his course for an easterly one, and in going to the extreme limits of Asia, to reach the shores of the Pacific. If he could succeed in this, he would pass the bounds of the exploration of the celebrated Marco Polo. He set out, and following the course of the river Kabul and the frontiers of Afghanistan, he came to the Sindhu, the modern Indus, and descended it to its mouth. From the town of Lahore he went to Delhi, which great and beautiful city had been deserted by its inhabitants who had fled from the emperor Mohammed. This tyrant, who was occasionally both generous and magnificent, received the Arabian traveler very well, made him a judge in Delhi, and gave him a grant of land with some pecuniary advantages that were attached to the post. But these honors were not to be of any long duration, for Ibn Battuta, being implicated in a pretended conspiracy, thought it best to give up his place and make himself a fakir to escape the emperor's displeasure. Mohammed, however, pardoned him, and made him his ambassador to China. Fortune again smiled upon the courageous traveler, and he had now the prospect of seeing these distant lands under exceptionally good and safe circumstances. He was charged with presents for the emperor of China, and two thousand horse soldiers were given him as an escort. But Ibn Battuta had not thought of the insurgents who occupied the surrounding countries. A skirmish took place between the escort and the Hindus, and the traveler, being separated from his companions, was taken prisoner, robbed, garroted, and carried off he knew not whither. But his courage and hopefulness did not forsake him, and he contrived to escape from the hands of these robbers. After wandering about for seven days, he was received into his house by a negro, who at length led him back to the emperor's palace at Delhi. Mohammed fitted out another expedition, and again appointed the Arabian traveler as his ambassador. This time they passed through the enemy's country without molestation, and by way of Kanoje, Mersa, Gwalior, and Barun, they reached Malabar, some time after, they arrived at the great port of Calicut, an important place which became afterwards the chief town of Malabar. Here they were detained by contrary winds for three months, and made use of this time to study the Chinese mercantile marine which frequented this port. Ibn speaks with great admiration of these junks, which are like floating gardens, where ginger and herbs are grown on deck. They are each like a separate village, and some merchants were the possessors of a great number of these junks. At last the wind changed. Ibn Battuta chose a small junk well fitted up to take him to China, and had all his property put on board. Thirteen other junks were to receive the presents sent by the King of Delhi to the Emperor of China, but during the night a violent storm arose, and all the vessels sank. Fortunately for Ibn, he had remained on shore to attend the service at the mosque, and thus his piety saved his life, but he had lost everything except the carpet which he used at his devotions. After the second misfortune, he could not make up his mind to appear before the king of Delhi. This catastrophe was enough to weary the patience of a more long-suffering emperor than Mohammed. Ibn soon made up his mind what to do. Leaving the service of the emperor, and the advantages attaching to the post of ambassador, he embarked for the Maldive Islands, which were governed by a woman, and where a large trade in cocoa was carried on. Here he was again made a judge, but this was only of short duration, 
for the vizier became jealous of his success, and, after marrying three wives, Ibn was obliged to take refuge in flight. He hoped to reach the Coromandel coast, but contrary winds drove his vessel towards Ceylon, where he was very well received, and gained the king's permission to climb the sacred mountain of Serendid, or Adam's Peak. His object was to see the wonderful impression of a foot at the summit, where the Hindus called Buddhas, and the Mahatmatans Adam's foot. He pretends, in his narrative, that this impression measures eleven hands in length, a very different account from that of an historian of the ninth century, who declared it to be seventy-nine cubits long. This historian also adds that while one of the feet of our forefather rested on the mountain, the other was in the Indian Ocean. Ibn Battuta speaks also of large bearded apes, forming a considerable item in the population of the island, and said to be under a king of their own, crowned with leaves. We can give what credit we like to such fables as these, which were propagated by the credulity of the Hindus. From Ceylon, the traveler made his way to the Karamandel coast, but not without experiencing some severe storms. He crossed to the other side of the Indian peninsula, and again embarked. But his vessel was seized by pirates, and Ibn Battuta arrived at Calicut almost without clothes, robbed and worn out with fatigue. No misfortune could damp his ardor. His was one of those great spirits which seem only invigorated by trouble and disasters. As soon as he was enabled by the kindness of some Delhi merchants to resume his travels, he embarked for the Maldive Islands, went on to Bengal, there set sail for Sumatra, and disembarked at one of the Nicobar Islands, after a very bad passage which had lasted fifty days. Fifteen days afterwards he arrived at Sumatra, where the king gave him a hearty welcome, and furnished him with means to continue his journey to China. A junk took him in seventy-one days to the port Kailuka, capital of a country somewhat problematical, of which the brave and handsome inhabitants excelled in making arms. From Kailuka, Ibn passed into the Chinese provinces, and went first to the splendid town of Zaitem, probably the present Tsun Chiu of the Chinese, a little to the north of Nankin. He passed through various cities of this great empire, studying the customs of the people, and admiring everywhere the riches, industry, and civilization that he found. But he did not get as far as the Great Wall, which he calls the Obstacle of Gog and Magog. It was while he was exploring this immense tract of country that he made a short stay in the city of Chensi, which is composed of six fortified towns standing together. It happened that during his wanderings he was able to be present at the funeral of a Khan, who was buried with four slaves, six of his favorites, and four horses. In the meanwhile, disturbances had occurred at Zaitem, which obliged Ibn to leave this town, so he set sail for Sumatra, and then, after touching at Calicut and Ormuz, he returned to Mecca in 1348, having made the tour of Persia and Syria. But the time of rest had not yet come for this indefatigable explorer. The following year he revisited his native place of Tangier, and then, after traveling in the southern countries of Europe, he returned to Morocco, went to Sudan, and the countries watered by the Niger, crossed the Great Desert, and entered Timbuktu, thus making a journey which would have rendered illustrious a less ambitious traveler. This was to be his last expedition. In 1353, twenty-nine years after leaving Tangier for the first time, he returned to Morocco and settled at Fez. He has earned the reputation of being the most intrepid explorer of the fourteenth century, and well merits to be ranked next after Marco Polo, the illustrious Venetian. End of First Part, Chapter 5 Recording by William Tomko Section 11 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. 
Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 6, Part 1. Jean de Bethencourt, 1339 to 1425. Jean de Bethencourt was born about the year 1339 at O in Normandy. He was of good family, and baron of St. Martin le Gaillard, and had distinguished himself both as a navigator and warrior, he was made chamberlain to Charles the Sixth. But his tastes were more for traveling than a life at court. He resolved to make himself a still more illustrious name by further conquests, and soon an opportunity offered for him to carry out his plans. On the coast of Africa there is a group of islands called the Canaries, which were once known as the Fortunate Islands. Juba, a son of one of the Numidian kings, is said to have been their first explorer, about the year of Rome, 776. In the Middle Ages, according to some accounts, Arabs, Genoese, Portuguese, Spaniards, and Biscayans had partially visited this interesting group of islands. In 1393, a Spanish gentleman named Almonaster, who was commanding an expedition, succeeded in landing on Lancerota, one of these islands, and brought back, with several prisoners, some produce which was a sufficient guarantee of the fertility of this archipelago. The Norman cavalier now found the opening that he sought, and he determined to conquer the Canary Islands and try to convert the inhabitants to the Catholic faith. He was as intelligent, brave, and full of resources as he was energetic, and, leaving his house of grainville la tienturiere at Cau, he went to La Rochelle, where he met the Chevalier Gadefer de la Salle, and having explained his project to him, they decided to go to the Canary Islands together. Jean de Bathencourt, having collected an army and made his preparations, and had vessels fitted out and manned, Godifer and he set sail, after experiencing adverse winds on the way to the Ile de Rey, and being much harassed by the constant dissensions on board, they arrived at Vivero, and then at Coruna. Here they remained eight days, then set sail again, and doubling Cape Finisterre, followed the Portuguese coast to Cape St. Vincent, and arrived at Cadiz, where they made a longer stay. Here, Bethencourt had a dispute with some Genoese merchants, who accused him of having taken their vessel, and he had to go to Seville, where King Henry III heard his complaint and acquitted him from all blame. On his return to Cadiz, he found part of his crew in open mutiny, and some of his sailors so frightened that they refused to continue the voyage. So the Chevalier sent back the cowardly sailors and set sail with those who were more courageous. The vessel in which Jean de Bethencourt sailed was becalmed for three days. Then, the weather improving, he reached the island of Graciosa, one of the smaller of the Canary group, in five days, and then the larger island of Lanquerota, which is nearly the same size as the island of Rhodes. Lanzarota has an excellent pasturage and arable land, which is particularly good for the cultivation of barley. Its numerous fountains and cisterns are well supplied with excellent water. The Orchilla, which is so much used in dyeing, grows abundantly here. The inhabitants of this island, who as a rule wear scarce any clothing, are tall and well made, and the women, who wear leathern greatcoats reaching to the ground, are very good-looking and honest. The traveller, prior to disclosing his plans of conquest, wished to possess himself of some of the natives, but his ignorance of the country made this a difficult matter. So, anchoring under the shelter of a small island in the archipelago, he called a meeting of his companions to decide upon a plan of action. They all agreed that the only thing to be done was to take some of the natives by fair means or foul. Gardafia, the king of the island, treated Bethencourt more as a friend than a subject. A castle, or rather fort, was built at the southwestern extremity of the island, and some men left there under the command of Berthen de Berneval, while Bethencourt set out with the rest of his followers for the island of Urbania, or Fortaventura. Gadifer, counseled by debarkation by night, which was done, and then he took the command of a small body of men and scoured the island with them for eight days without meeting one native, they having all fled to the mountains. 
provisions failing, Gadifer was forced to return, and he went to the island of Lobos between La Cerota and Fortaventura. But there his chief sailor mutinied, and it was not without difficulty that Gadifer and Bethencourt reached the fort on Lancerota. Bethencourt resolved to return to Spain to get provisions and a new contingent of soldiers. For his crew he could not depend upon. So he left Gadifer in command and set sail for Spain in one of Gadifer's ships. It will be remembered that Berthen de Berneval had been left in command of the fort on Lancerota Island. Unfortunately, he was Gadifer's bitter enemy, and no sooner had Bethencourt set out than he tried to poison the minds of Gadifer's men against him. He succeeded in inducing some, especially the Gascons, to revolt against the governor, who, quite innocent of Berneval's base designs, was spending his time hunting sea wolves on the island of Lobos with Ramonet de Leveden and several others. Ramonet, having been sent to Lancerota for provisions, found no Berneval there, he having deserted the island with his accomplices for a port on Graciosa where a coxswain, deceived by his promises, had placed his vessel at his disposal. From Graziosa, the traitor Berneval returned to Lancerota, and put the finishing stroke to his villainy by pretending to make an alliance with the king of the island. The king, thinking that no officer of Bethencourt's, in whom he had implicit confidence, could deceive him, came with twenty-four of his subjects to see Berneval, who seized them when asleep, had them bound, and then carried them off to Graziosa. The king managed to break his bonds, set three of his men free, and succeeded in escaping, but the remainder of his unfortunate companions were still prisoners, and Berneval gave them up to some Spanish thieves who took them away to sell in a foreign land. Berneval's evil deeds did not stop here. By his order, the vessel that Godifer had sent to the fort at Lancerota was seized. Ramonet tried resistance, but his numbers were too small, and his supplications were useless to prevent Berneval's men, and even Berneval himself, from destroying all the arms, furniture, and goods which Bethencourt had placed in the fort at Lancerota. Insults were showered upon the governor, and Berneval cried, I should like Gadifer de la Salle to know that if he were as young as I, I would kill him, but as he is not, I will spare him. If he is put above me, I shall have him drowned, and then he can fish for sea wolves. Meanwhile, Gadifer and his ten companions were in danger of perishing on the island of Lobos for want of food and fresh water. But happily, the two chaplains of the fort of Lancerota had gone to Graziosa and met with Coxon, who had been the victim of Berneval's treason, and he sent one of his men named Jimenez with them back to Lancerota. There they found a small boat which they filled with provisions, and, embarking with four men who were faithful to Gadifer, they succeeded in reaching Lobos, four leagues off, after a most dangerous passage. Gadifer and his companions were suffering fearfully from hunger and thirst, when Jimenez arrived, just in time to save them from perishing, and the governor, learning Berneval's treachery, embarked in the boat for Lancerata, as soon as he was a little restored to health. He was grieved at Berneval's conduct towards the poor islanders whom Bethencourt and he had sworn to protect. No, he never could have expected such wickedness in one who was looked upon as the most able of the whole band. But what was Berneval doing meanwhile? After having betrayed his master, he did the same to the companions who had aided him in his evil deeds. He had twelve of them killed and then he set out for Spain to rejoin Bethencourt and make his own case good by representing all that had happened in his own way. It was to his interest to get rid of inconvenient witnesses, and therefore he abandoned his companions. These unfortunate men at first meditated imploring the pardon of the governor. They confessed all to the chaplains, but then, fearing the consequences of their deeds, they seized a boat and fled toward Morocco. The boat reached the coast of Barbary, where ten of the crew were drowned and the two others taken for slaves. While all this was happening at Lancerata, Bethencourt arrived at Cadiz, where he took strong measures against his mutinous crew, and had the ringleaders imprisoned. Then he sent his vessel to Seville, where King Henry the Third was at that time. But the ship sank in the Gadalquiver, a great loss to Gadifer, her owner. 
Bethencourt, having arrived at Seville, met a certain Francisque Calve, who had lately come from the Canaries, and who offered to return thither with all the things needed by the governor. But Bethencourt could not agree to this proposal before he had seen the king. Just at this time, Berneval arrived with some of his accomplices and some islanders whom he intended to sell as slaves. He hoped to be able to deceive Bethencourt, but he had not reckoned upon a certain Cortille, who was with him, who lost no time in denouncing the villainy of Berneval, and on whose word the traitors were all imprisoned at Cadiz. Cortille also told of the treatment that the poor islanders had received. As Bethencourt could not leave Seville till he had an audience with the king, he gave orders that they should receive every kindness. But while these preliminaries were being concluded, the vessel that contained them was taken to Aragon, and they were sold for slaves. Bethencourt obtained the audience that he sought with the king of Castile, and after telling him the result of his expedition, he said, Sire, I come to ask your assistance and your leave to conquer the Canary Islands for the Catholic faith, and as you are king and lord of all the surrounding country and the nearest Christian king to these islands, I beg you to receive the homage of your humble servant. The king was very gracious to him, and gave him dominion over these islands, and, beyond this, a fifth of all the merchandise that should be brought from them to Spain. He gave him twenty thousand maravedis, about six hundred pounds, to buy all that he needed, and also the right to coin money in the Canary Islands. Most unfortunately, these twenty thousand maravedis were confided to the care of a dishonest man, who fled to France, carrying the money with him. However, Henry the Third gave Bethencourt a well-rigged vessel manned by eighty men and stocked with provisions, arms, etc. He was most grateful for this fresh bounty, and sent Gadifer an account of all that had happened, and his extreme disappointment and disgust at Berneval's conduct, in whom he had so much confidence, announcing at the same time the speedy departure of the vessel given by the King of Castile. But meanwhile, very serious troubles had arisen on Lancerata. King Guardafia was so hurt at Berneval's conduct that he had revolted, and some of Gadifer's companions had been killed by the islanders. Gadifer insisted upon these subjects being punished, when one of the king's relations, named Ache, came to him, proposing to dethrone the king and put himself in his place. This Ache was a villain, who after having betrayed his king, proposed to betray the Normans, and to chase them from the country. Gadifer had no suspicion of his motives. Wishing to avenge the death of his men, he accepted Ache's proposal, and a short time afterwards, on the vigil of St. Catherine's Day, the king was seized and conveyed to the fort in chains. Some days afterwards, Ache, the new king of the island, attacked Gadifer's companions, mortally wounding several of them. But the following night, Gardafia, having made his escape from the fort, seized Ache, had him stoned to death, and his body burnt. The governor, Gadifer, was so grieved by these scenes of violence, which were renewed daily, that he resolved to kill all the men on the island, and save only the women and children, whom he hoped to have baptized. But just at this time, the vessel that Bethencourt had freighted for the governor arrived and brought besides the eighty men provisions, etc., a letter which told him, among other things, that Bethencourt had done homage to the king of Castile for the Canary Islands. The governor was not well pleased at this news, for he thought that he ought to have had his share in the islands, but he concealed his displeasure, and gave the newcomers a hearty welcome. The arms were at once disembarked, and then Godifer went on board the vessel to explore the neighboring islands. Remonet and several others joined him in this expedition, and they took two of the islanders with them to serve as guides. They arrived safely at Fortaventura Island. A few days after landing on the island, Gadifer set out with thirty-five men to explore the country, but soon the greater part of his followers deserted him, only thirteen men, including two archers, remaining with him. But he did not give up his project. After wading through a large stream, he found himself in a lovely valley shaded by numberless palm trees. Here, having rested and refreshed himself, he set out again and climbed a hill. At the summit he found about fifty natives, who surrounded the small party and threatened to murder them. 
Gadifer and his companions showed no signs of fear, and succeeded in putting their enemies to flight. By the evening they were able to regain their vessel, carrying away four of the native women as prisoners. The next day Gadifer left the island and went to the Gran Canaria island anchoring in a large harbor, lying between Telde and Argoni. Five hundred of the natives confronted them, but apparently with no hostile intentions, they gave them some fish hooks and old iron in exchange for some of the natural productions of the island, such as figs and dragon's blood, a resinous substance taken from the dragon tree which has a very pleasant balsamic odor. The natives were very much on their guard with the strangers, for twenty years before this some of Captain Lopez's men had invaded the island, so they would not allow Gadifer to land. The governor was obliged to weigh anchor without exploring the island. He went to Faro Island, and, coasting along it, arrived next at Gomera. It was night, and the sailors were attracted by the fires that the natives had lighted on the shore. When day broke, Gadifer and his companions wished to land, but the islanders would not allow them to proceed when they reached the shore, and drove them back to their vessel. Much disappointed by his reception, Gadifer determined to make another attempt at Faroe Island, where he found that he could land without opposition, and he remained on the island twenty-two days. The interior of the island was very beautiful. Pine trees grew in abundance, and clear streams of water added to its fertility. Quails were found as large numbers, as well as pigs, goats, and sheep. From this fertile island, the party of explorers went to Palma, and anchored in a harbor situated to the right of a large river. This is the furthest island of the Canary group. It is covered with pine and dragon trees. From the abundance of fresh water, the pasturage is excellent, and the land might be cultivated with much profit. Its inhabitants are a tall, robust race, well made, with good features and very white skin. Gadifer remained a short time on this island. On leaving it, he spent two days and two nights sailing round the other islands, and then returned to the fort on Lancerata. They had been absent three months. In the meantime, those of the party who had been left in the fort had waged a petty war with the natives, and had made a great number of prisoners. The Canarians, demoralized, now came daily to cast themselves on their mercy, and to pray for the consecration of baptism. Gadifer was so pleased to hear of this that he sent one of his companions to Spain to inform Bethencourt of the state of the colony. End of First Part Chapter 6 Part 1 Recording by William Tomko Section 12 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 6. Part 2. The envoy had not reached Cadiz when Bethencourt landed at the fort on Lancerata. Gadifer gave him a hearty welcome, and so did the Canary Islanders who had been baptized. A few days afterwards, King Gordafia came and threw himself on their mercy. He was baptized on the 20th of February, 1404, with all his followers. Bethencourt's chaplains drew up a very simple form of instruction for their use, embracing the principal elements of Christianity, the creation, Adam and Eve's fall, the history of Noah, the lives of the patriarchs, the life of our Savior and his crucifixion by the Jews, finishing with an exhortation to believe the Ten Commandments, the Holy Sacrament of the Altar, Easter, Confession, and some other points. Bethencourt was an ambitious man not content with having explored and so to speak gained possession of the canary islands he desired to conquer the african countries bordering on the ocean this was his secret wish in returning to lancerata and meanwhile he had full occupation in establishing his authority in these islands of which he was only the nominal sovereign he gave himself wholly to the task and first visited the islands which gadifer had explored 
But before he set out, a conversation took place between Gadifer and himself, which we must not omit to notice. Gadifer began boasting of all he had done, and asked for the gift of Fortaventura, Tenerife, and Gomera Islands as a recompense. "'My friend,' replied Bethencourt, "'the islands that you ask me to give you are not yet conquered. But I do not intend you to be at any loss for your trouble, nor that you should be unrequited. But let us accomplish our project, and meanwhile remain the friends we have always been.' "'That is all very well.' replied Gadifer, but there is one point on which I do not feel at all satisfied, and that is that you have done homage to the king of Castile for these islands, and so you call yourself absolute master over them. With regard to that, said Bethencourt, I certainly have done homage for them, and so I am their rightful master. But if you will only patiently wait the end of our affair, I will give you what I feel sure will quite content you. I shall not remain here, replied Gadifer. I am going back to France, and have no wish to be here any longer. Upon this they separated, but Gadifer gradually cooled down and agreed to accompany Bethencourt in his exploration of the islands. They set out for Fortaventura, well armed and with plenty of provisions. They remained there three months, and began by seizing a number of the natives and sending them to Lancerata. This was such a usual mode of proceeding at that time that we are less surprised at it than we should be at the present day. The whole island was explored, and a fort named Rasheroke built on the slope of a high mountain. Traces of it may still be found in a hamlet there. Just at this time, and when he had scarcely had time to forget his grievances and ill humor, Gadifer accepted the command of a small band of men who were to conquer Gran Canaria. He set out on the 25th July, 1404, but this expedition was not fated to meet with any good results. Winds and waves were against it. At last they reached the port of Teldi, but it was nearly dark, and a strong wind blowing they dared not land, and they went on to the little town of Aginmez, where they remained eleven days at anchor. The natives, encouraged by their king, laid an ambush for Gadifer and his followers. There was a skirmish, blood was shed, and the Castilians, feeling themselves outnumbered, went to Teldi for two days, and thence to Lancerata. Gadifer was much disappointed at his want of success, and began to be discontented with everything around him. Above all, his jealousy of Bethencourt increased daily, and he gave way to violent recriminations, saying openly that the chief had not done everything himself, and that things would not have been in so advanced a stage as they were if others had not aided him. This reached Bethencourt's ears. He was much incensed, and reproached Gadifer. High words followed. Gadifer insisted upon leaving the country, and as Bethencourt had just made arrangements for returning to Spain, he proposed to Gadifer to accompany him, that their cause of disagreement might be inquired into. This proposal being accepted, they set sail, but each in his own ship. When they reached Seville, Gadifer laid his complaints before the king, but as the king gave judgment against him, fully approving of Bethencourt's conduct, he left Spain, and, returning to France, never revisited the Canary Islands, which he had so fondly hoped to conquer for himself. Bethencourt took leave of the king almost at the same time, for the new colony demanded his immediate presence there, but before he left, the inhabitants of Seville, with whom he was a great favorite, showed him much kindness. What he valued more highly than anything else was a supply of arms, gold, silver, and provisions that they gave him. He went to Fortaventura, where his companions were delighted to see him. Gadifer had left his son Hannibal in his place, but Bethencourt treated him with much cordiality. The first days of the installation of Bethencourt were far from peaceful. Skirmishes were of constant occurrence, the natives even destroying the fortress of Richeroque after burning and pillaging a chapel. Bethencourt was determined to overcome them, and in the end succeeded. He sent for several of his men from Lancerata and gave orders that the fortress should be rebuilt. In spite of all this, the combats began again, and many of the islanders fell, among others a giant of nine feet high, whom Bethencourt would have liked to have made prisoner. The governor could not trust Gadifer's son, nor the men who followed him. 
for Hannibal seemed to have inherited his father's jealousy, but as Bethencourt needed his help, he concealed his distrust. Happily, Bethencourt's men outnumbered those who were faithful to Gadifer, but Hannibal's taunts became so unbearable that Jean de Courtois was sent to remind him of his oath of obedience and to advise him to keep it. Courtois was very badly received, he having a crow to pick with Hannibal with regard to some native prisoners whom Gadifer's followers had kept and would not give up. Hannibal was obliged to obey the orders, but Courtois represented his conduct to Bethencourt on his return in the very worst light, and tried to excite his master's anger against him. "'No, sir,' answered the upright Bethencourt, "'I do not wish him to be wronged. We must never carry our power to its utmost limits. We should always endeavor to control ourselves and preserve our honor rather than seek for profit.' In spite of these intestine discords, the war continued between the natives and the conquerors, but the latter, being well armed, always came off victorious. The kings of Fortaventura sent a native to Bethencourt, saying that they wished to make peace with him and to become Christians. This news delighted the conqueror, and he sent word that they would be well received if they would come to him. Almost immediately on receiving this reply, King Maxorata, who governed the northwesterly part of the island, set out, and with his suite of twenty-two persons, was baptized on the 18th of January, 1405. Three days afterwards, twenty-two other natives received the sacrament of baptism. On the 25th of January, the king, who governed the peninsula of Handia, the southeastern part of the island, came with twenty-six of his subjects and was baptized. In a short time, all the inhabitants of Fortaventura had embraced the Christian religion. Bethencourt was so elated with these happy results that he arranged to revisit his own country, leaving Courtois as governor during his absence. He set out on the last day of January amid the prayers and blessings of his people taking with him three native men and one woman to whom he wished to show something of france he reached harfleur in twenty-one days and two days later was at his own house where he only intended making a short stay and then returning to the canary islands he met with a very warm reception from everybody one of his chief motives in returning to france was the hope of finding people of all classes ready to return with him on the promise of grants of land in the island he succeeded in finding a certain number of emigrants, amongst whom were twenty-eight soldiers, of whom twenty-three took their wives. Two vessels were prepared to transport the party, and the 6th of May was the day named for them to set out. On the 9th of May they set sail, and landed on Lancerata just four months and a half after Bethencourt had quitted it. He was received with trumpets, clarionets, tambourines, harps, and other musical instruments. Thunder could scarcely have been heard above the sound of this music. The natives celebrated his return by dancing and singing and crying out, Here comes our king! Jean de Courtois hastened to welcome his master, who asked him how everything was going on. He replied, Sir, all is going on as well as possible. Bethencourt's companions stayed with him at the fort of Lancerata. They appeared much pleased with the country enjoying the dates and other fruits on the island, and nothing seemed to harm them. After they had been a short time at Lancerata, Bethencourt went with them to see Fortaventura, and here his reception was as warm as it had been at Lancerata, especially from the islanders and their two kings. The kings supped with them at the fortress of Richeroque, which Courtois had rebuilt. Bethencourt announced his intention of conquering Gran Canaria Island, as he had done Lancerata and Fortaventura. His hope was that his nephew, Masiat, whom he had brought with him from France, would succeed him in the government of these islands, so that the name of Bethencourt might be perpetuated there. He imparted his project to Courtois, who highly approved of it, and added, Sir, when you return to France, I will go with you. I am a bad husband. It is five years since I saw my wife, and, by my troth, she did not much care about it. The 6th of October, 1405, was the day fixed for starting for Gran Canaria, but contrary winds carried the ships towards the African coast, and they passed by Cape Bojador, where Bethencourt landed. He made an expedition 24 miles inland 
and seized some natives and a great number of camels that he took to his vessels. They put as many of the camels as possible on board, wishing to acclimatize them in the Canary Islands, and the baron set sail again, leaving Cape Bojador, which he had the honor of seeing thirty years before the Portuguese navigators. During this voyage from the coast of Africa to Gran Canaria, the three vessels were separated in stormy weather, one going to Palma and another to Fortaventura, but finally they all reached Gran Canaria. This island is sixty miles long and thirty-six miles broad. At the northern end it is flat, but very hilly towards the south. Firs, dragon trees, olive, fig, and date trees form large forests, and sheep, goats, and wild dogs are found here in large numbers. The soil is very fertile, and produces two crops of corn every year, and that without any means of improving it. Its inhabitants form a large body of people, and consider themselves all on an equality. When Bethencourt had landed, he set to work at once to conquer the island. Unfortunately, his Norman soldiers were so proud of their success on the coast of Africa that they thought they could conquer this island with its ten thousand natives with a mere handful of men. Bethencourt, seeing that they were so confident of success, recommended them to be prudent, but they took no heed of this, and bitterly they rued their confidence. After a skirmish in which they seemed to have got the better of the islanders, they had left their ranks. When the natives surprised them, massacring twenty-two of them, including Jean de Courtois and Hannibal, Gadifer's son. After this sad affair, Bethencourt left Grand Canaria and went to try to subdue Palma. The natives of this island were very clever in slinging stones, rarely missing their aim, and in the encounters with these islanders many fell on both sides, but more natives than Normans, whose loss, however, amounted to one hundred. After six weeks of skirmishing, Bethencourt left Palma and went to Faro for three months, a large island twenty-one miles long and fifteen broad. It is a flat tableland, and large woods of pine and laurel trees shaded in many places. The mists, which are frequent, moisten the soil and make it especially favorable for the cultivation of corn and the vine. Game is abundant. Pigs, goats, and sheep run wild about the country. There are also great lizards in shape like the iguana of America. The inhabitants, both men and women, are a very fine race, healthy, lively, agile, and particularly well-made. In fact, Faro is one of the pleasantest islands of the group. Bethencourt returned to Fortaventura with his ships after conquering Faro and Palma. This island is 51 miles in length by 24 in breadth, and has high mountains as well as large plains, but its surface is less undulating than that of the other islands. Large streams of fresh water run through the island. The euphorbia, a deadly poison, grows largely here, and date and olive trees are abundant, as well as a plant that is invaluable for dyeing, and whose cultivation would be most remunerative. The coast of Fortaventura has no good harbors for large vessels, but small ones can anchor there quite safely. It was in this island that Bethencourt began to make a portion of land to the colonists, and he succeeded in doing it so evenly that every one was satisfied with his portion. Those colonists whom he had brought with him were to be exempted from taxes for nine years. The question of religion and religious administration could not fail to be of the deepest interest to so pious a man as Bethencourt. So he resolved to go to Rome and try to obtain a bishop for this country, who would order and adorn the Roman Catholic faith. Before setting out, he appointed his nephew, Massiot, as lieutenant and governor of the islands. Under his orders, two sergeants were to act and enforce justice. He desired that twice a year news of the colony should be sent to him in Normandy, and the revenue from Lancerata and Fortaventura was to be devoted to building two churches. He said to his nephew Massiot, I give you full authority in everything to do whatever you think best, and I believe you will do all for my honor and to my advantage. Follow as nearly as possible Norman and French customs, especially in the administration of justice. Above all things, try and keep peace and unity among yourselves, and care for each other as brothers, and especially try that there shall be no rivalry among the gentlemen. I have given to each one his share, and the country is quite large enough for each to have his own sphere. 
I can tell you nothing further beyond again impressing the importance of your all living as good friends together, and then all will be well. Bethencourt remained three months in Fortaventura and the other islands. He rode about among the people on his mule, and found many of the natives beginning to speak Norman French. Massiot and the other gentlemen accompanied him. He pointed out what was best to be done and the most honest way of doing it. Then he gave notice that he would set out for Rome on the ensuing 15th of December. Returning to Lancerata, he remained there till his departure, and ordered all the gentlemen he had brought with him, the workmen, and the three kings to appear before him two days before his departure, to tell them what he wished done, and to commend himself and them to God's protection. None failed to appear at this meeting. They were all received at the fort on Lancerata and sumptuously entertained. When the repast was over, he spoke to them, especially impressing the duty of obedience to his nephew Massiot upon them, the retention of the fifth of everything for himself, and also the exercise of all Christian virtues and of fervent love to God. This done, he chose those who were to accompany him to Rome and prepared to set out. His vessel had scarcely set sail when cries and groans were heard on all sides, both Europeans and natives alike regretting this just master, who they feared would never return to them. A great number waded into the water and tried to stop the vessel that carried him away from them, but the sails were set, and Bethencourt was really gone. May God keep him safe from all harm, was the utterance of many that day. In a week he was at Seville. From thence he went to Valladolid, where the king received him very graciously. He related the narrative of his conquests to the king, and requested from him letters recommending him to the pope, that he might have a bishop appointed for the islands. The king gave him the letters, and loaded him with gifts, and then Bethencourt set out for Rome with a numerous retinue. He remained three weeks in the Eternal City and was admitted to kiss Pope Innocent the Seventh's foot, who complimented him on his having made so many proselytes to the Christian faith, and on his bravery in having ventured so far from his native country. When the bulls were prepared as Bethencourt had requested, and Albert de Maison was appointed bishop of the Canary Islands, the Norman took leave of the Pope after receiving his blessing. The new prelate took leave of Bethencourt, and set out at once for his diocese. He went by way of Spain, taking with him some letters from Bethencourt to the king. Then he set sail for Fortaventura, and arrived there without any obstacle. Massiot gave him a cordial reception, and the bishop at once began to organize his diocese, governing with gentleness and courtesy, preaching now in one island, now in another, and offering up public prayers for Bethencourt's safety. Massiot was universally beloved, but especially by the natives. This happy, peaceful time only lasted for five years, for later on Massiot began to abuse his unlimited power and levied such heavy exactions that he was obliged to fly the country to save his life. Bethencourt, after leaving Rome, went to Florence and to Paris, and then to his own chateau, where a great number of people came to pay their respects to the king of the Canary Islands, and if on his return the first time he was much thought of, his reception the second time far exceeded it. Bethencourt established himself at Grainville, although he was an old man. His wife was still young. He had frequent accounts from the Massiot of his beloved islands, and he hoped one day to return to his kingdom, but God willed otherwise. One day, in the year 1425, he was seized with what proved to be fatal illness. He was aware that the end was near, and after making his will and receiving the last sacraments of the church, he passed away. May God keep him and pardon his sins, says the narrative of his life. He is buried in the church of Grainville, La Tenturiere, in front of the high altar. End of First Part, Chapter 6, Part 2「Section 13 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. 
Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1, Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 7, Part 1. Christopher Columbus, 1436 to 1506. The year 1492 is an era in geographical annals. It is the date of the discovery of America. The genius of one man was fated to complete the terrestrial globe and to show the truth of Gagliuffi's saying, Unus erat mundus, duo sint ait iste fuere. The old world was to be entrusted with the moral and political education of the new. Was it equal to the task? with its ideas still limited, its tendencies still semi-barbarous, and its bitter religious animosities? We must leave the answers to these questions to the facts that follow. Between the year 1405, when Bethencourt had just accomplished the colonization of the Canary Islands, and the year 1492, what had taken place? We will give a short sketch of the geographical enterprise of the intervening years. A considerable impetus had been given to science by the Arabs, who were soon to be expelled from Spain, and had spread throughout the peninsula. In all the ports, but more especially in those of Portugal, there was such talk of the continent of Africa and the rich and wonderful countries beyond the sea. A thousand anecdotes, says Michelet, stimulated curiosity, valor, and avarice everyone wishing to see these mysterious countries, where monsters abounded and gold was scattered over the surface of the land. A young prince, Don Henry, Duke of Viseu, third son of John I, who was very fond of the study of astronomy and geography, exercised a considerable influence over his contemporaries. It is to him that Portugal owes her colonial power and wealth, and the expeditions so repeatedly made, which were vividly described, and the results spoken of as so wonderful, that they may have aided in awakening Columbus's love of adventure. Don Henry had an observatory built in the southern part of the province of Algarve at Sagres, commanding a most splendid view over the sea, and seeming as though it must have been placed there to seek for some unknown land he also established a naval college where learned geographers traced correct maps and taught the use of the mariner's compass the young prince surrounded himself with learned men and especially gathered all the information he could as to the possibility of circumnavigating africa and thus reaching india Though he had never taken part in any maritime expedition, his encouragement and care for seamen gave him the sobriquet of the Navigator, by which name he is known in history. Two gentlemen belonging to Don Henry's court, Juan González Zarco and Tristram Vaz Tiexiera, had passed Cape Nun, the terror of ancient navigators, when they were carried out to sea and passed near an island to which they gave the name of Porto Santo. Some time afterwards, as they were sailing towards a black point that remained on the horizon, they came to a large island covered with splendid forests. This was Madeira. In 1433, Cape Bojador, which had for long been such a difficulty to navigators, was first doubled by the two Portuguese sailors, Guilhanes and Gonzalez Baldaya, who passed more than forty leagues beyond it. Encouraged by their example, Antonio Gonzalez and Nuno Tristram, in 1441, sailed as far as Cape Blanco, a feat, says Faria y Souza, that is generally looked upon as being little short of the labors of Hercules, and they brought back with them to Lisbon some gold dust taken from the Rio del Oro. In a second voyage, Tristram noticed some of the Cape de Verde Islands, and went as far south as Sierra Leone. In the course of this expedition, he bought from some moors off the coast of Guinea ten negroes, whom he took back with him to Lisbon and parted with for a very high price, they having excited great curiosity. This was the origin of the slave trade in Europe, which for the next four hundred years robbed Africa of so many of her people and was a disgrace to humanity. In 1441, Cana Mosto doubled Cape Verde and explored a part of the coast below it. About 1446, the Portuguese, advancing further into the open sea than their predecessors, came upon the group of the Azores. 
From this time all fear vanished, for the formidable line had been passed, beyond which the air was said to scorch like fire. Expeditions succeeded each other without intermission, and each brought home accounts of newly discovered regions. It seemed as if the African continent was really endless, for the further they advanced towards the south, the further the cape they sought appeared to recede. Some little time before this, King John the Second had added the title of Seigneur of Guinea to his other titles, and to the discovery of Congo had been added that of some stars in the southern hemisphere hitherto unknown, when Diogo Cam, in three successive voyages, went further south than any preceding navigator and bore away from diaz the honor of being the discoverer of the southern point of the african continent this cape is called cape cross and here he raised a monument called a padrao or padron in memory of his discovery which is still standing on his way back he visited the king of congo in his capital and took back with him an ambassador and numerous suite of natives who were all baptized and taught the elements of the christian religion which they were to propagate on their return to congo a short time after diogo Cam's return in the month of august fourteen eighty seven three caravels left the tagus under the command of bartholomew diaz a gentleman attached to the king's household and an old sailor on the guinea seas he had an experienced mariner under him and the smallest of the three vessels freighted with provisions was commanded by his brother pedro diaz we have no record of the earlier part of this expedition we only know from joao de barros to whom we owe nearly all we learn of portuguese navigation that beyond congo he followed the coast for some distance and came to an anchorage that he named das voltas on account of the manner in which he had to tack to reach it and there he left the smallest of the caravels under the care of nine sailors after having been detained here five days by stress of weather diaz stood out to sea and took a southerly course but for thirteen days his vessels were tossed hither and thither by the tempest as he went further south the temperature fell and the air became very cold at last the fury of the elements abated and diaz took an easterly course hoping to sight the land but after several days had passed and being in about forty two degrees south latitude he anchored in the bay dos vaqueros so named from the numbers of horned animals and shepherds who fled inland at the sight of the two vessels at this time diaz was about one hundred twenty miles east of the cape of good hope which he had doubled without seeing it they then went to Sam Braz, now Mosul Bay, and coasted as far as Algoa Bay and to an island called Da Cruz, where they set up a padrao. But here the crews being much discouraged by the dangers they had passed through, and feeling much the scarcity and bad quality of the provisions, refused to go any farther. Besides, they said, as the land is now on our left, let us go back and see the Cape, which we have doubled without knowing it. Diaz called a council, and decided that they should go forwards in a north-easterly direction for two or three days longer. We owe it to his firmness of purpose that he was able to reach a river seventy-five miles from Da Cruz that he called Rio Infante. But then the crew refusing to go farther, Diaz was obliged to return to Europe. Barros says, when Diaz left the pillar that he had erected, it was with such sorrow and so much bitterness that it seemed almost as though he were leaving an exiled son, and especially when he thought of all the dangers that he and his companions had passed through, and the long distance which they had come with only this memorial as a remembrance, it was indeed painful to break off when the task was but half completed. At last they saw the Cape of Good Hope, or as Diaz and his followers called it then, the Cape of Torments, in remembrance of all the storms and tempests they had passed through before they could double it. With the foresight which so often accompanies genius, John the Second substituted for the Cape of Torments the name of the Cape of Good Hope for he saw that now the route to india was open at last and his vast plans for the extension of the commerce and influence of his country were about to be realized on the twenty fourth of august fourteen eighty eight diaz returned to angra das voltas where he had left his smallest caravel 
he found six of his nine men dead and the seventh was so overcome with joy at seeing his companions again that he died also no particular incident marked the voyage home they reached lisbon in december fourteen eighty eight after staying in benin where they traded and at la mina to receive the money gained by the commerce of the colony it is strange but true that diaz not only received no reward of any kind for this voyage which had been so successful but he seemed to be treated rather as though he had disgraced himself for he was not employed again for ten years more than this the command of the expedition that was sent to double the cape which diaz had discovered was given to vasco da gama and diaz was only to accompany it to la mina holding a subordinate position he was to hear of the marvelous campaign of his successful rival in india and to see what an effect such an event would have upon the destiny of his country he took part in cabral's expedition which discovered brazil but he had not the pleasure of seeing the shores to which he had been the pioneer for the fleet had only just left the american shore when a fearful storm arose four vessels sank and among them the one that diaz commanded it is in allusion to his sad fate that camines put the following prediction into the mouth of adamastor the spirit of the cape of tempests I will make a terrible example of the first fleet that shall pass near these rocks, and I will wreak my vengeance on him who first comes to brave me in my dwelling. In fact, it was only in 1497, maybe five years after the discovery of America, that the southern point of Africa was passed by Vasco da Gama, and it may be affirmed that if this latter had preceded Columbus, the discovery of the new continent might have been delayed for several centuries. The navigators of this period were very timorous, and did not dare to sail out into mid-ocean. Not liking to venture upon seas that were but little known, they always followed the coastline of Africa rather than go further from land. If the Cape of Tempests had been doubled, the sailors would have gone by this route to India, and none would have thought of going to the land of spices, that is to say Asia, by venturing across the Atlantic who in fact would have thought of seeking for the east by the route to the west but in truth this was the great idea of that day for cooley says the principal object of portuguese maritime enterprise in the fifteenth century was to search for a passage to india by the ocean the most learned men had not gone so far as to imagine the existence of another continent to complete the equilibrium and balance of the terrestrial globe some parts of the american continent had been already discovered for an italian navigator sebastian cabot had landed on labrador in fourteen eighty seven and the scandinavians had certainly disembarked on this unknown land the colonists of greenland too had explored winland but so little disposition was there at this time to believe in the existence of a new world that greenland winland and labrador were all thought to be a continuation of the european continent the main question before the navigators of the fifteenth century was the opening up of an easier communication with the shores of asia the route to india china and japan countries already known through the wonderful narrative of marco polo via asia minor persia and tartary was long and dangerous the transport of goods was too difficult and costly for these ways terrestrial ever to become roads for commerce a more practicable means of communication must be found. Thus, all the dwellers on the coasts, from England to Spain, as well as the people living on the shores of the Mediterranean, seeing the great Atlantic Ocean open to their vessels, began to inquire whether indeed this new route might not conduct them to the shores of Asia. The sphericity of the globe being established, this reasoning was correct, for going always westward the traveller must necessarily at last reach the east and as to the route across the ocean it would certainly be open who could indeed have suspected the existence of an obstacle nine thousand seven hundred fifty miles in length lying between europe and asia and called america we must observe also that the scientific men of the middle ages believed that the shores of asia were not more than six thousand miles distant from those of europe Aristotle supposed the terrestrial globe to be smaller than it really is. Seneca said, How far is it from the shores of Spain to India? A very few days' sail, should the wind be favorable. This was also the point of Strabo, 
So it seemed that the route between Europe and Asia must be short, and there being such places for ships to touch at as the Azores and Antilles, of which the existence was known in the 15th century. The transoceanic communication promised not to be difficult. This popular error as to distance had the happy effect of inducing navigators to try to cross the Atlantic, a feat which, had they been aware of the 15,000 miles of ocean separating Europe from Asia, they would scarcely have dared to attempt. We must, in justice, allow that certain facts gave, or seemed to give, reason to the partisans of Aristotle and Strabo, for their belief in the proximity of the eastern shores. Thus, a pilot in the service of the King of Portugal, while sailing at 1,350 miles distance from Cape St. Vincent, the southwestern point of the Portuguese province of Algarve, met with a piece of wood ornamented with ancient sculptures, which he considered must have come from a continent not far off. Again, some fishermen had found near the island of Madeira a sculptured post and some bamboos, which in shape resemble those found in India. The inhabitants of the Azores also often picked up gigantic pine trees of an unknown species, and one day two human bodies were cast upon their shores. Corpses with broad faces, says the chronicler Herrera, and not resembling Christians. These various facts tended to inflame imagination. As in the 15th century, men had no knowledge of that great Gulf Stream, which, in nearing the European coasts, brings with it waifs and strays from America, so they could only imagine that these various debris must come from Asia. Therefore, they argued, Asia could not be far off, and the communication between these two extremes of the old continent must be easy. One point must be clearly borne in mind. No geographer of this period had any notion of the existence of a new world. It was not even a desire of adding a geographical knowledge which led to the exploration of the western route. It was the men of commerce who were the leaders in this movement, and who first undertook to cross the Atlantic. Their only thought was of traffic, and of carrying it on by the shortest road. The Mariner's Compass, invented, according to the generally received opinion, about 1302, by one of Flavio Gioja of Amalfi, enabled vessels to sail at a distance from the coasts, and to guide themselves when out of sight of land. Martin Beheim, with two physicians in the service of Prince Henry of Portugal, had also added to nautical science by discovering the way of directing the voyager's course according to the position of the sun in the heavens and by applying the astrolabe to the purposes of navigation. These improvements being adopted, the commercial question of the western route increased daily in importance in Spain, Portugal, and Italy, countries in which three-quarters of the science is made up of imagination. There was discussion, there were writings, the excited world of commerce disputed with the world of science. Facts, systems, doctrines were grouped together. The time was come when there was needed one single intelligence to collect together and assimilate the various floating ideas. This intelligence was found. At length all the scattered notions were gathered together in the mind of one man who possessed in a remarkable degree genius, perseverance, and boldness. This man was no other than Christopher Columbus, born probably near Genoa about the year 1436. We say probably, for the towns of Cogoreo and Nervi dispute with Savona and Genoa the honor of having given him birth. The date of his birth varies, with different biographers, from 1430 to 1445. But the year 1436 would appear to be the correct one, according to the most reliable documents. The family of Columbus was of humble origin. His father, Dominic Columbus, a manufacturer of woolen stuffs, seems, however, to have been in sufficiently easy circumstances to enable him to give his children a more than ordinary good education. The young Christopher, the eldest of the family, was sent to the University of Pavia, there to study grammar, Latin, geography, astronomy, and navigation. At fourteen years of age, Christopher left school and went to sea. From this time until 1487, very little is known of his career. It is interesting to give the remark of Humboldt on this subject, as reported by M. Charton. He said, 
that he regretted the more this uncertainty about the early life of Columbus when he remembered all that the chroniclers have so minutely preserved for us upon the life of the dog Becerillo, or the elephant Abulababat, which Harun al-Rashid sent to Charlemagne. The most probable account to be gathered from contemporary documents and from the writings of Columbus himself is that the young sailor visited the Levant, the West, the North, England, several times, Portugal, the coast of Guinea, and the islands of Africa, perhaps even Greenland, for, by the age of forty, he had sailed to every part that had ever been sailed to before. He was looked upon as a thoroughly competent mariner, and his reputation led to his being chosen for the command of the Genoese galleys, in the war which that republic was waging against Venice. He afterwards made an expedition, in the service of René, king of Anjou, to the coasts of Barbary, and in 1477 he went to explore the countries beyond Iceland. This voyage, being successfully terminated, Christopher Columbus returned to his home at Lisbon. He there married the daughter of an Italian gentleman, Bartolomeo Muñez Perestrello, a sailor like himself and deeply interested in the geographical ideas of the day. The wife of Columbus, Dona Felipa, was without fortune, and Columbus, having none himself, felt he must work for the support of himself and his family. The future discoverer, therefore, set to work to make picture books, terrestrial globes, maps, and nautical charts, and continued in this employment until 1481, but without at the same time abandoning his scientific and literary pursuits. It seems probable, even, that during this period he studied deeply and attained to knowledge far beyond that possessed by most of the sailors of his time. Can it have been that, at this time, the great idea first arose in his mind? It may well have been so. He was following assiduously the discussions relative to the western routes and the facility of communication by the West between Europe and Asia. His correspondence proves that he shared the opinion of Aristotle as to the relatively short distance separating the extreme shores of the old continent. He wrote frequently to the most distinguished savants of his time. Martin Beheim, of whom we have already spoken, was amongst his correspondents, and also the celebrated Florentine astronomer Toscanelli, whose opinions in some degree influence those of Columbus. At this time, Columbus, according to the portrait of him given by his biographer, Washington Irving, was a tall man of robust and noble presence. His face was long. He had an aquiline nose, high cheekbones, eyes clear and full of fire. He had a bright complexion, and his face was much covered with freckles. He was a truly Christian man, and it was with the liveliest faith that he fulfilled all the duties of the Catholic religion. At the time when Christopher Columbus was in correspondence with the astronomer Toscanelli, he learnt that the latter, at the request of Alfonso V, King of Portugal, had sent to the king a learned memoir upon the possibility of reaching the Indies by the western route. Columbus was consulted and supported the ideas of Toscanelli with all his influence, but without result, for the king of Portugal, who was engaged at the time in war with Spain, died, without having been able to give any attention to maritime discoveries. His successor, John II, adopted the plans of Columbus and Toscanelli with enthusiasm. At the same time, with most reprehensible cunning, he tried to deprive these two savants of the benefit of their proposition. Without telling them, he sent out a caravel to attempt this great enterprise, and to reach China by crossing the Atlantic. But he had not reckoned upon the inexperience of his pilots, nor upon the violence of the storms which they might encounter. The result was that some days after their departure, a hurricane brought back to Lisbon the sailors of the Portuguese king. Columbus was justly wounded by this unworthy action, and felt that he could not reckon upon a king who had so deceived him. His wife being dead, he left Spain with his son Diego towards the end of the year 1484. It is thought that he went to Genoa and to Venice, where his projects of transoceanic navigation were but badly received. However, it may have been in 1485 we find him again in Spain. This great man was poor without resources. He traveled on foot, carrying Diego, his little son of ten years old, in his arms 
From this period of his life, history follows him step by step. She no more loses sight of him, and she preserved to posterity the smallest incidents of this grand existence. We find Columbus arrived in Andalusia, only half a league from the port of Palos. Destitute and dying of hunger, he knocked at the door of a Franciscan convent, dedicated to Santa Maria del Rabida, and asked for a little bread and water for his poor child and for himself. The superior of the convent, Juan Perez de Marchena, gave hospitality to the unfortunate traveler. He questioned him and was surprised by the nobleness of his language, but still more astonished was he by the boldness of the ideas of Columbus, who made the good father the confidant of his aspirations. For several months the wandering sailor remained in this hospitable convent. Some of the monks were learned men, and interested themselves about him and his projects. They studied his plans, they mentioned him to some of the well-known navigators of the time, and we must give them the credit of having been the first to believe in the genius of Christopher Columbus. Juan Perez showed still greater kindness. He offered to take upon himself the charge of the education of Diego, and he gave to Columbus a letter of recommendation addressed to the confessor of the Queen of Castile. This confessor, prior of the monastery of Prado, was deep in the confidence of Ferdinand and Isabella, but he did not approve of the projects of the genoese navigator and he rendered him no service whatever with his royal penitent columbus must still resign himself to wait he went to live at cordova where the court was soon to come and for livelihood he resumed his trade of picture seller is it possible to quote from the lives of illustrious men an instance of a more trying existence than this of the great navigator could ill fortune have assailed any man with more cruel blows but this indomitable indefatigable man of genius rising up again after each trial did not despair he felt within him the sacred fire of genius he worked on unceasingly he visited influential persons spreading his ideas and defending them and combating all objections with the most heroic energy at length he obtained the protection of the great cardinal archbishop of toledo pedro gonzalez de mendoza and thanks to him was admitted to the presence of the king and queen of spain christopher columbus must have imagined himself now at the end of all his troubles ferdinand and isabella received his project favorably and caused it to be submitted for examination to a council of learned men consisting of bishops and monks who were gathered together ad hoc in a dominican convent at salamanca but the unfortunate pleader was not yet at the end of his vicissitudes in this meeting at salamanca all his judges were against him the truth was that his ideas interfered with the intolerant religious notions of the fifteenth century. The fathers of the church had denied the sphericity of the earth, and, since the earth was not round, they declared that a voyage of circumnavigation was absolutely contrary to the Bible, and could not, therefore, on any logical theory, be undertaken. Besides, said these theologians, if any one should ever succeed in descending into the other hemisphere, how could he ever mount up again into this one? This manner of arguing was a very formidable one at this period, for Christopher Columbus saw himself, in consequence, almost accused of heresy, the most unpardonable crime which could be committed in these intolerant countries. He escaped any evil consequences from the hostile disposition of the consul, but the execution of his project was again adjourned. Long years passed away. The unfortunate man of genius, despairing of success in Spain, sent his brother to England to make an offer of his service to the king, Henry the Seventh. But it is probable that the king gave no answer. Then Christopher Columbus turned again with unabated perseverance to Ferdinand, but Ferdinand was at this time engaged in a war of extermination against the Moors, and it was not until 1492, when he had chased the Moors from Spain, that he was able again to listen to the solicitations of the Genoese sailor. This time the affair was thoroughly considered, and the king consented to the enterprise, but Columbus, as is the manner of proud natures, wished to impose his own conditions. They bargained over that which should enrich Spain. Columbus, in disgust, was without doubt ready to quit, and forever this ungrateful country, 
but isabella touched by the thought of the unbelievers of asia whom she hoped to convert to the catholic faith ordered columbus to be recalled and then acceded to all his demands columbus was in the fifty-sixth year of his age when he signed a treaty with the king of spain at santa feta on the seventeenth of april fourteen ninety two being eighteen years after he had first conceived his project and seven years from the time of his quitting the monastery of palos by this solemn convention the dignity of high admiral was to belong to columbus in all the lands which he might discover and this dignity was to descend in perpetuity to his heirs and successors he was named viceroy and governor of the new possessions which he hoped to conquer in the rich countries of asia and one-tenth part of the pearls precious stones gold silver spices provisions and merchandise of whatever kind which might be acquired in any manner whatsoever within the limits of his jurisdiction was of right to belong to him all was arranged and at length columbus was to put his cherished projects in execution but let us repeat he had no thought of meeting with the new world of the existence of which he had not the faintest suspicion his aim was to explore the east by the west and to pass by the way of the west to the land whence come the spices one may even aver that columbus died in the belief that he had arrived at the shores of asia and never knew himself that he had made the discovery of america but this in no way lessens his glory the meeting with the new continent was but an accident. The real cause of the immortal renown of Columbus was that audacity of genius which induced him to brave the dangers of an unknown ocean, to separate himself afar from those familiar shores which, until now, navigators had never ventured to quit, to adventure himself upon the waves of the Atlantic Ocean in the frail ships of the period which the first tempest might engulf to launch himself in a word, upon the deep darkness of an unknown sea. The preparations began. Columbus, entering into an arrangement with some rich navigators of Palos, the three brothers Pinzon, who made the necessary advances for defraying the expenses of fitting out the ships, three caravels named the Galega, the Nina, and the Pinta, were equipped in the port of Palos. The Galega was destined to carry the admiral, who changed her name to the Santa Maria, the Pinta was commanded by Martin Alonso Pinzon, and the Nina by his two brothers, Francis Martin and Vincent Yanez Pinzon. It was difficult to man the ships, sailors generally being frightened at the enterprise, but at last the captains succeeded in getting together 120 men, and on Friday, August the 3rd, 1492, the Admiral, crossing at 8 o'clock in the morning the Bar of Saltez, off the town of Huelva in Andalusia, adventured himself with his three half-deck caravels upon the Atlantic waves. End of First Part, Chapter 7, Part 1 Recording by William Tomko Section 14 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part. Chapter 7, Part 2a, Christopher Columbus. During the first day's voyage, the Admiral, the title by which he is usually known in the various accounts of his exploits, bearing directly southwards, sailed 45 miles before sunset. Turning then to the southeast, he steered for the Canaries, in order to repair the Pinta, which had unshipped her rudder, an accident caused perhaps by the ill will of the steersman, who dreaded the voyage. Ten days later, Columbus cast anchor before the great Canary Island, where the rudder of the caravel was repaired. Nineteen days afterwards, he arrived before Gomera, where the inhabitants assured him of the existence of an unknown land in the west of the archipelago. He did not leave Gomera until the 6th of September. He had received warning that three Portuguese ships awaited him in the open sea, 
with the intention of barring his passage. However, without taking any heed of this news, he put to sea, cleverly avoided meeting his enemies, and, steering directly westward, he lost all sight of land. During the voyage, the admiral took care to conceal from his companions the true distance traversed each day. He made it appear less than it really was in the daily abstracts of his observations, that he might not add to the fear already felt by the sailors by letting them know the real distance which separated them from Europe. Each day he watched the compasses with attention, and it is to him we owe the discovery of the magnetic variation, of which he took account in his calculations. The pilots, however, were much disturbed on seeing the compasses all northwesters, as they expressed it. On the 14th of September, the sailors saw a swallow and some tropic birds. The sight of these birds was an evidence of land being near, for they do not usually fly more than about 70 miles out to sea. The temperature was very mild, the weather magnificent, the wind blew from the east and wafted through caravels in the desired direction. But it was exactly this continuance of east winds which frightened the greater part of the sailors, who saw in this persistence, so favorable for the outward voyage, the promise of a formidable obstacle to their return home. On the 16th of September, some tufts of seaweed, still fresh, were seen floating on the waves, but no land was to be seen, and this seaweed might possibly indicate the presence of submarine rocks, and not of the shores of a continent. On the 17th, thirty-five days after the departure of the expedition, floating weeds were frequently seen, and upon one mass of weed was found a live crayfish, a sure sign this of the proximity of land. During the following days, a large number of birds, such as gannets, sea swallows and tropic birds flew around the caravels. Columbus turned their presence to account as a means of reassuring his companions, who were beginning to be terribly frightened at not meeting with land after six weeks of sailing. His own confidence never abated, but putting firm trust in God, he often addressed energetic words of comfort to those around him, and made them each evening chant the Salve Regina, or some other hymn to the Virgin. At the words of this heroic man, so noble, so sure of himself, so superior to all human weaknesses, the courage of the sailors revived, and they again went onwards. We can well imagine how anxiously both officers and men scanned the western horizon towards which they were steering. Each one had a pecuniary motive for wishing to be the first to descry the new continent, King Ferdinand having promised a reward of ten thousand maravedis or four hundred pounds sterling, to the first discoverer. The later days of the month of September were enlivened by the presence of numerous large birds, petrels, man-of-war birds, and damiers, flying in couples, a sign that they were not far away from home. So Columbus retained his unshaken conviction that land could not be far off. On the 1st of October, the admiral announced to his companions that they had made 1,272 miles to the west since leaving Faro. In reality, the distance traversed exceeded 2,100 miles, and of this Columbus was quite aware, but persisted in his policy of disguising the truth in this particular. On the 7th of October, the crews were excited by hearing discharges of musketry from the Nina, the commanders of which, the two brothers Pinzon, thought they had descried the land. They soon found, however, that they had been mistaken. Still, on their representing that they had seen some perroquets flying in a southwesterly direction, the admiral consented to change his route so far as to steer some points to the south a change which had happy consequences in the future, for had they continued to run directly westward, the caravels would have been aground upon the great Bahama bank, and would probably have been altogether destroyed. Still, the ardently desired land did not appear. Each evening the sun, as it went down, dipped behind an interminable horizon of water. The crews, who had several times been the victims of an optical illusion, now began to murmur against Columbus. The Genoese, the foreigner, who had enticed them so far away from their country. Some symptoms of mutiny had already shown themselves on board the vessels, when, on the 10th of October, the sailors openly declared that they would go no further. In treating of this part of the voyage, the historians would seem to have drawn somewhat upon their imagination.
They narrate scenes of serious import which took place upon the admiral's caravel, the sailors going so far as even to threaten his life. They say also that the recriminations ended by a kind of arrangement, granting a respite of three days to Columbus, at the end of which time, should land not have been then discovered, the fleet was to set out on its return to Europe. All these statements we may look upon as pure fiction. There is nothing in the accounts given by Columbus himself which lends them the smallest credibility. But it has been needful to touch upon them, for nothing must be omitted relating to the great Genoese navigator, and some amount of legend mixed up with history does not ill beseem the grand figure of Christopher Columbus. Still, it is an undoubted fact that there was much murmuring on board the caravels, but it would seem that the crews, cheered by the words of the admiral and by his brave attitude in the midst of uncertainty, did not refuse to do their duty in working the ships. On the 11th of October, the admiral noticed alongside of his vessel a reed still green, floating upon the top of a large wave. At the same time, the crew of the Pinta hoisted on board another reed, a small board, and a little stick, which appeared to have been cut with an instrument of iron. It was evident that human hands had been employed upon these things. Almost at the same moment, the men of the Nina perceived a branch of some thorny tree covered with blossoms. At all this, everyone rejoiced exceedingly. There could be no doubt now of the proximity of the coast. Night fell over the sea. The Pinta, the best sailor of the three vessels, was leading. Already, Columbus himself, and one Rodrigo Sanchez, comptroller of the expedition, had thought they had seen a light moving amidst the shadows of the horizon. When a sailor named Rodrigo, on board the Pinta, cried out, Land! Land! What must have been the feelings of the breast of Columbus at that moment? Never had any man, since the first creation of the human race, experienced a similar emotion to that now felt by the great navigator. Perhaps, even if it is allowable to think that the eye which first saw this new continent was indeed that of the admiral himself. But what matters it? The glory of Columbus consisted not in the having arrived, his glory was in the having set out. It was at two o'clock in the morning that the land was first seen, when the caravels were not two hours' sail away from it. At once, all the crews, deeply moved, joined in singing together the Salve Regina. With the first rays of the sun, they saw a little island six miles to windward of them. It was one of the Bahama group. Columbus named it San Salvador, and immediately falling on his knees, he began to repeat the hymn of St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, Te Deum Laudamus, Te Deum Confitemur. At this moment, some naked savages appeared upon the newly discovered coast. Columbus had his long boat lowered and got into it with Alonso and Yanez Pinzon, the comptroller Rodrigo, the secretary Descovedo, and some others. He landed upon the shore, carrying in his hand the royal banner, whilst the two captains bore between them the green banner of the cross, upon which were interlaced the initials of Ferdinand and Isabella. Then the admiral solemnly took possession of the island in the name of the king and queen of Spain, and caused a record of the act to be drawn up. During the ceremony, the natives came round Columbus and his companions. Monsieur Charton gives the account of the scene in the very words of Columbus. Desiring to inspire them, the natives, with friendship for us, and being persuaded on seeing them that they would confide the more readily in us, and be the better disposed towards embracing our holy faith, if we used mildness in persuading them, rather than if we had recourse to force, I caused to be given to several amongst them colored caps, and also glass beads which they put around their necks. I added various other articles of small value. They testified great joy, and showed so much gratitude that we marveled greatly at it. When we were re-embarking, they swam towards us to offer us perroquets, balls of cotton thread, zagayas, or long darts, and many other things. In exchange, we gave them some small glass beads, little bells, and other objects. They gave us all they had, but they appeared to me to be very poor. The men and women both were as naked as when they were born. Amongst those whom we saw, one woman was rather young, and none of the men appeared to be more than thirty years of age. They were well made, their figures handsome, and their faces agreeable. 
Their hair, coarse as that of a horse's tail, hung down in front as low as their eyebrows. Behind it formed a long mass, which they never cut. There are some who paint themselves with a blackish pigment, their natural color being neither black nor white, but similar to that of the inhabitants of the Canary Islands. Some paint themselves with white, some with red, or any other color, either covering the whole body with it, or the whole face, or perhaps only the eyes, or the nose. They do not carry arms like our people, and do not even know what they are. When I showed them some swords, they laid hold of them by the blades and cut their fingers. They have no iron. Their zagayas are sticks. The tip is not of iron, but sometimes made of a fish tooth or of some other hard substance. They have much grace in their movements. I remarked that several had scars upon their bodies, and I asked them by means of signs how they had been wounded. They answered in the same manner, that the inhabitants of the neighboring islands had come to attack them and make them prisoners, and that they had defended themselves. I thought then, and I still think, that they must have come from the mainland to make them prisoners for slaves. They would be faithful and gentle servants. They seem to have the power of repeating quickly what they hear. I am persuaded that they might be converted to Christianity without difficulty, for I believe that they belong to no sect. When Columbus returned on board, several of the savages swam after his boat. The next day, the 13th, they came in crowds around the ships, on board of enormous canoes shaped out of the trunks of trees. They were guided by means of a kind of baker's shovel, and some of the canoes were capable of holding forty men. Several natives wore little plates of gold hanging from their nostrils. They appeared much surprised at the arrival of the strangers, and quite believed that these white men must have fallen from the skies. It was with a mixture of respect and curiosity that they touched the garments of the Spaniards, considering them, doubtless, a kind of natural plumage. The scarlet coat of the admiral excited their admiration above everything, and it was evident they looked upon Columbus as a parroquet of a superior species. At once they seemed to recognize him as a chief amongst the strangers. So Columbus and his followers visited this new island of San Salvador. They were never tired of admiring the beauty of its situation, its magnificent groves, its running streams, and verdant meadows. The fauna of the island offered little variety. Parroquets of radiant plumage abounded amongst the trees, but they appeared to be the only species of birds upon the island. San Salvador presented an almost flat plateau of which no mountain broke the uniformity. A small lake occupied the center of the island. The explorers imagined that San Salvador must contain great mineral riches, since the inhabitants were adorned with ornaments of gold. But was this precious metal derived from the island itself? Upon this point, the admiral questioned one of the natives, and succeeded in learning from him by means of signs that in turning the island and sailing towards the south, the admiral would find a country of which the king possessed great vessels of gold and immense riches. The next morning, at daybreak, Columbus gave orders to have the ships prepared for sea. He set sail and steered towards the continent of which the natives had spoken, which, as he imagined, could be none other than Tsipango. Here, an important observation must be made, showing the state of geographical knowledge at this period, viz. that Columbus now believed himself to have arrived at Asia, Sipango being the name given by Marco Polo to Japan. This error of the admiral, shared in by all his companions, was not rectified for many years afterwards, and thus, as we have already remarked, the great navigator, after four successive voyages to the islands, died without knowing that he had discovered a new world. It is beyond doubt that the sailors of Columbus, and Columbus himself, imagined that they had arrived, during that night of the 12th October, 1492, either at Japan, or China, or the Indies. This is the reason why America so long bore the name of the Western Indies, and why the aborigines of this continent, in Brazil and in Mexico, as well as in the United States, are still classed under the general appellation of Indians. So Columbus dreamt only of reaching the shores of Japan. He coasted along San Salvador, exploring its western side. The natives, running down to the shore, offered him water and cassava bread, made from the root of a plant called the yucca. 
Several times the admiral landed upon the coast at different points, and with a sad want of humanity he carried away some of the natives that he might take them with him to Spain. Poor men! Already the strangers began to tear them from their country. It would not be long before they began to sell them. At last the caravels lost sight of San Salvador and were again upon the wide ocean. Fortune had favored Columbus in thus guiding him into the center of one of the most beautiful archipelagos which the world contains. These new lands which he discovered were as a casket of precious stones, which needed only to be opened, and the hands of the discoverer were full of treasures. On the 15th October, at sunset, the flotilla came to anchor near the western point of a second island, at a distance of only 15 miles from San Salvador. This island was named Concepcion. On the morrow, the admiral landed upon the shore, having his men well armed for fear of surprise. The natives, however, proved to be of the same race as those of San Salvador, and gave a kind welcome to the Spaniards. A southeasterly wind having arisen, Columbus soon put to sea again, and twenty-seven miles further westward he discovered a third island, which he called Fernandina but which now goes by the name of the Great Exuma. All night they lay too, and next day, the 17th October, large native canoes came off to the vessels. The relations with the natives were excellent, the savages peacefully exchanging fruit and small balls of cotton for glass beads, tambourines, needles, which took their fancy greatly, and some molasses, of which they appeared very fond. These natives of Fernandina wore some clothing, and appeared altogether more civilized than those of San Salvador. They inhabited houses made in the shape of tents, and having high chimneys. The interiors of these dwellings were remarkably clean and well kept. The western side of the island, with its deeply indented shore, formed a grand natural harbor, capable of containing a hundred vessels. But Fernandina did not afford the riches so much coveted by the Spaniards as spoils to take back to Europe. There were no gold mines here. The natives who were on board the flotilla always spoke, however, of a larger island situated to the south and called Salmeto, in which the precious metal was found. Columbus steered in the direction indicated, and during the night of Friday, the 19th of October, he cast anchor near this Salmeto calling it Isabella. In modern maps, it goes by the name of Long Island. According to the natives of San Salvador, there was a powerful king in this island, but the admiral for several days awaited in vain the advent of this great personage. He did not show himself. The island of Isabella was beautiful of aspect, with its clear lakes and thick forests. The Spaniards were never tired of admiring the new type of nature presented to their view, and of which the intense verdure was wonderful to European eyes. Parroquets in innumerable flocks were flying amongst the thick trees, and great lizards, doubtless iguanas, glided with rapid movements in the high grass. The inhabitants of the island fled at first at the sight of the foreigners, but soon became bolder. They trafficked with the Spaniards in the productions of their country. Still, Columbus held firmly to the notion of reaching the shores of Japan. The natives had mentioned to him a large island a little to the west, which they called Cuba, and this the admiral supposed must form part of the kingdom of Tsipango. He felt little doubt, but that he would soon arrive at the town of Kinse, or Hang Chu Fu, formerly the capital of China. With this object, as soon as the winds permitted, the fleet weighed anchor. On Thursday, the 25th of October, seven or eight islands lying in a straight line were sighted. These were probably the Mukaras. Columbus did not stop to visit them, and on the Sunday he came in sight of Cuba. The caravels were moored in a river, to which the Spaniards gave the name of San Salvador. After a short stay, they sailed again towards the west, and entered a harbor situated at the mouth of a large river, which was afterwards called the harbor of Las Nuevitas de Principe. Numerous palm trees were growing upon the shores of the island, having leaves so broad that only one was required for roofing a native hut. The natives had fled at the approach of the Spaniards, who found upon the shore idols of female form, tame birds, bones of animals, also dumb dogs, and some fishing instruments. 
The Cuban savages, however, were ready to be enticed like the others, and they consented to barter their goods with the Spaniards. Columbus believed himself to be now on the mainland, and only a few leagues from Hang Chufu. This idea being so rooted in his mind that he even busied himself in dispatching some presents to the great Khan of China. On the 2nd of November, he desired one of the officers of his ship, and a Jew who could speak Hebrew, Chaldi, and Arabic, to set out to seek this native monarch. The ambassadors, carrying with them strings of beads, and having six days given to them for the fulfillment of their mission, started taking a route leading towards the interior of this so-called continent. In the meantime, Columbus explored for nearly six miles a splendid river which flowed beneath the shade of woods of odoriferous trees. The inhabitants freely bartered their goods with the Spaniards and frequently mentioned to them a place named Bohio, where gold and pearls might be obtained in abundance. They added that men lived there who had dogs' heads and who fed upon human flesh. The admiral's envoys returned to the port on the 6th of November, after a four days' absence. Two days had sufficed to bring them to a village composed of about fifty huts, where they were received with every mark of respect, the natives kissing their feet and hands, and taking them for deities descended from the skies. Among other details of native customs, they reported that both men and women smoked tobacco by means of a forked pipe, drawing up the smoke through their nostrils. These savages were acquainted with the secret of obtaining fire by rubbing briskly two pieces of wood against each other. Cotton was found in large quantities in the houses, made up into the form of tents, one of these containing as much as 11,000 pounds of the material. As to the Grand Khan, they saw no vestige of him. End of First Part, Chapter 7, Part 2a Recording by William Tomko Section 15 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 7. Part 2b. Another consequence of the error of Columbus must be noticed here, one which, according to Irving, changed the whole series of his discoveries. He believed himself to be on the coast of Asia, and therefore looked upon Cuba as a portion of that continent. In consequence, he never thought of making the tour of Cuba, but decided on returning towards the east. Now, had he not been deceived on this occasion, and had he continued to follow the same direction as at first, the results of his enterprise would have been greatly modified. He might then have drifted towards Florida at the southeastern point of North America, or he might have run direct to Mexico. In this latter case, instead of ignorant and savage natives, what would he have found? The inhabitants of the great Aztec Empire, of the half-civilized kingdom of Montezuma. There he would have seen towns, armies, enormous wealth, and his role would no doubt have been the same as that afterwards played by Fernando Cortez. But it was not to be thus, and the admiral, persevering in his mistake, directed his flotilla towards the east, weighing anchor on the 12th of November, 1492. Columbus tacked in and out along the Cuban coast. He saw the two mountains, Cristal and Moa, he explored a harbor to which he gave the name of puerto del principe and an archipelago which he called the sea of nuestra senora each night the fishermen's fires were seen upon the numerous islands the inhabitants of which lived upon spiders and huge worms several times the spaniards landed upon different points of the coast and there planted the cross as a sign of taking possession of the country the natives often spoke to the admiral about a certain island of barbecue where gold abounded and thither columbus resolved to go but martin alonzo pinzon the captain of the pinta the best sailor of the three ships was beforehand with him and at daybreak on the twenty first of november he had completely disappeared from sight 
The admiral was very angry at the separation, his feelings on the subject appearing plainly in his narrative, where he says, Pinzon has said and done to me many like things. Continuing his exploration of the coast of Cuba, Columbus discovered the Bay of Moa, the Point of Mangal, Point Vallez, and the harbor of Baracoa. But nowhere did he meet with cannibals, although the huts of the natives were often to be seen adorned with human skulls, a sight which appeared to give great satisfaction to the islanders on board the fleet. On the following days they saw the Boma River, and the caravels, doubling the point of Los Azules, found themselves upon the eastern part of the island, whose coast they had now reconnoitred for a distance of 375 miles. But Columbus, instead of continuing his route to the south, turned off to the east, and on the 5th of December perceived a large island called by the natives Bohio. This was Haiti, or San Domingo. In the evening, the Nina, by the admiral's orders, entered a harbor which was named Port Mary. It is situated at the northwestern extremity of the island, and, with the cape near which it lies, is now called St. Nicholas. The next day, the Spaniards discovered a number of headlands and an islet called Tortuga Island. Everywhere on the appearance of the ships, the Indian canoes took to flight. The island, along which they were now coasting, appeared very large and very high, from which latter peculiarity it gained, later on, its name of Haiti, which signifies high land. The coast was explored by the Spaniards as far as Mosquito Bay. Its natural features, its plains and hills, its plants and the birds which fluttered amongst the beautiful trees of the island, all recalled to the memory the landscapes of Castile and for this reason columbus named it hispaniola or spanish island the inhabitants were extremely timid and distrustful they fled away into the interior and no communication could be held with them some sailors however succeeded in capturing a young woman whom they carried on board with them she was young and rather pretty the admiral gave her besides rings and beads some clothing of which she had great need and after most generous treatment, he sent her back to shore. The good conduct had the result of taming the natives, and the next day, when nine of the sailors, well armed, ventured as far as sixteen miles inland, they were received with respect, the savages running to them in crowds, and offering them everything which their country produced. The sailors returned to the ships, enchanted with their excursion. The interior of the island they had found rich in cotton plants, mastic trees, and aloes, while a fine river, named afterwards the Three Rivers, flowed gently upon its limpid course. On December 15th, Columbus again set sail, and was carried by the wind towards Tortuga Island, upon which he saw a navigable stream of water, and a valley so beautiful that he called it the Vale of Paradise. The day following, having tacked into a deep gulf, an Indian was seen, who, notwithstanding the violence of the wind, was skillfully maneuvering a light canoe. This Indian was invited to come on board, was loaded with presents by the admiral, and then put on shore again at one of the harbors of Hispaniola, now called the Puerto de Paz. This kindness tended to attach the natives to the admiral, and from that day they came in numbers round the caravels. Their king came with them, a strong, vigorous, and somewhat stout young man of twenty years of age. He was naked, like his subjects of both sexes, who showed him much respect, but with no appearance of servility. Columbus ordered royal honors to be rendered to him, and in return the king, or rather cacique, informed the admiral that the provinces to the east abounded in gold. Next day another cacique arrived offering to place all the treasures of his country at the service of the Spaniards. He was present at a fete in honor of the Virgin Mary, that Columbus caused to be celebrated with great pomp on board his vessel, which was gaily dressed with flags on the occasion. The cacique dined at the admiral's table. Apparently, enjoying the repast, after he had himself tasted of the different viands and beverages, he sent the dishes and goblets to the members of his suite, he had good manners, spoke little, but showed great politeness. After the feast, he gave the admiral some thin leaves of gold, 
while Columbus, on his side, presented him with some coins, upon which were engraved the portraits of Ferdinand and Isabella. And, after explaining to him, by signs, that these were the representations of the most powerful sovereigns in the world, he caused the royal banners of Castile to be displayed before the savage prince. When night fell, the cacique retired, highly delighted with his visit, and on his departure he was saluted with a salvo of artillery. On the day following, the crews before quitting this hospitable coast set up a large cross in the middle of the little town. In issuing from the gulf formed by Tortuga Island and Hispaniola, they discovered several harbors, capes, bays, and rivers. At the point of Limbe, a small island which Columbus called St. Thomas, and finally an enormous harbor, safe and sheltered, hidden between the island and the Bay of Acul, and to which access was given by a canal surrounded by high mountains covered with trees. The admiral often disembarked upon this coast, the natives receiving him as an ambassador from heaven, and imploring him to remain among them. Columbus gave them quantities of little bells, brass rings, glass beads, and other toys, which they eagerly accepted. A cacique named Guacanagari, reigning over the province of Marion, sent to the admiral a belt adorned with the figure of an animal with large ears, of which the nose and tongue were made of beaten gold. Gold appeared to be abundant in the island, and the natives soon brought a considerable quantity of it to the strangers. The inhabitants of this part of Hispaniola seemed to be superior in intelligence and appearance to those of that portion of the island which had been first visited, in the opinion of Columbus. The paint, red, black, or white, with which the natives covered their bodies, served to protect them from sunstroke. The huts of these savages were pretty and well built. Upon Columbus questioning them as to the country which produced gold, they always indicated one towards the east a country which they called Tsibao, and which the admiral continued to identify with Tsipango, or Japan. On Christmas Day, a serious accident occurred to the admiral's caravel, the first damage sustained in this hitherto prosperous voyage. An inexperienced steersman was at the helm of the Santa Maria during an excursion outside the Gulf of St. Thomas. Night came on, and he allowed the vessel to be caught in some currents which threw her upon the rocks. The caravel grounded, and her rudder stuck fast. The admiral, awakened by the shock, ran upon deck. He ordered an anchor to be fastened forward, by which the ship might warp herself off and so float again. The master and some of the sailors charged with the execution of this order jumped into the longboat, but seized with a sudden panic, they rowed away in haste to the Nina. Meantime, the tide fell, and the Santa Maria ran further aground. It became necessary to cut away the masts to lighten her, and soon it was evident that everything on board must be removed to the other ship. The cacique Guacanagari, quite understanding the dangerous situation of the caravel, came with his brothers and other relations, accompanied by a great number of the Indians, and helped in unlading the ship. Thanks to this prince, not a single article of the cargo was stolen, and during the whole night armed natives kept watch around the stores of provisions. The next day, Guacanagari went on board the Nina to console the admiral, and to place all his own possessions at his disposal at the same time offering him a repast of bread, doe's flesh, fish, roots, and fruit. Columbus, much moved by these tokens of friendship, formed the design of founding an establishment on this island. With this purpose in view, he addressed himself to gain the hearts of the Indians by presence and kindness, and wishing also to give them an adequate notion of his power, he ordered the discharge of an arquebus and a small cannon, of which the reports frightened the poor savages terribly. On December 26th, the Spaniards commenced the construction of a fort upon this part of the coast, the intention of the admiral being to leave there a certain number of men with a year's provision of bread, wine, and seed, and to give them the longboat belonging to the Santa Maria. The works at the fort were pushed forward with rapidity. It was also on the 26th that they received news of the Pinta, which had been separated from the flotilla since November 21st. The natives announced that she was at anchor in a river at the extreme point of the island. 
but a canoe dispatched by Guacanagari returned without having found her. Then Columbus, not wishing to continue his explorations under the present conditions, since the loss of the Santa Maria, which could not be floated again, left him but one caravel, decided to return to Spain, and preparations for the departure began. On the 2nd of January, Columbus caused his soldiers to act a mimic battle, greatly to the admiration of the cacique and his objects. Afterwards, the admiral chose out thirty-nine men to form the garrison of the fortress during his absence, named Rodrigo de Escovedo as their commander. The greater part of the cargo of the Santa Maria was to be left behind with them for their year's provision. Amongst these first colonists of the New World were included a writer, an alguazil, a cooper, a doctor, and a tailor. These Spaniards were charged with the mission of seeking for gold mines, and of choosing a suitable site for the building of a town. On the 3rd of January, after solemn leave-takings of the cacique and the new colonists, the Nina weighed anchor and sailed out of the harbor. An island was soon discovered, having upon it a very high mountain. To this was given the name of Monte Cristi. Columbus had already sailed for two days along the coast when he was aware of the approach of the Pinta, and very soon her captain, Martin Alonso Pinzon, came on board the Nina, endeavoring to excuse his conduct. The real truth was that Pinzon had taken the lead with the view of being the first to reach the pretended island of Barbecue, of which the riches had been described in glowing colors by the natives. The admiral was very ready to accept the bad reasons given him by Captain Pinzon, and learnt from him that the Pinta had done nothing but coast along the shores of Hispaniola without discovering any new island. On the 7th of January, the ships lay to to stop a leak which had sprung in the hold of the Nina. Columbus profited by this delay to explore a wide river, situated about three miles from Monte Cristi, and which carried so much gold dust along with it that he gave it the name of the Golden River. The admiral would have desired to visit this part of Hispaniola with greater care, but the crews were in haste to return home, and under the influence of the brothers Pinzon began to murmur against his authority. On the 9th of January, the caravels set sail and steered towards the east-southeast, skirting the coast, and distinguishing by names even its smallest sinuosities, of which were Point Isabella, the Cape of La Roca, French Cape, Cape Cabran, and the Bay of Samana, situated at the eastern extremity of the island, where was a port in which the fleet, being becalmed, came to anchor. At first, the relations between the foreigners and the natives were excellent, but a change was suddenly perceived, the savages ceasing to barter and making some hostile demonstrations, which left no doubt of the bad intentions entertained by them. On the 13th of January, the savages made a sudden and unexpected attack upon the Spaniards, who, however, put a bold face on the matter, and by the aid of their weapons, put their enemies to flight after a few minutes' combat. Thus, for the first time, the blood of the Indian flowed beneath the hand of the European. On the morrow, Columbus again set sail, having on board four young natives, whom, notwithstanding their objections, he persisted in carrying off with him. His crews, embittered and fatigued, caused him great uneasiness and in his narrative of the voyage this great man superior though he were to all human weaknesses and a being whom adverse fate could not humble bemoans himself bitterly over this trial it was on the sixteenth of january that the homeward voyage commenced in good earnest and cape samana the extreme point of hispaniola disappeared below the horizon the passage proved a quick one, and no incident is recorded until the 12th of February, when the vessels encountered a fearful storm lasting three days, with furious wind, enormous waves, and much lightning from the north-northeast. Three times did the terrified sailors make a vow of pilgrimage to St. Mary of Guadalupe, to Our Lady of Loreto, and to St. Clara of Moguer, and at length, in extremity of fear, the whole crew swore to go and pray in their shirts and with naked feet in some church dedicated to the Virgin. But, in spite of all, the storm raged with redoubled fury, and even the admiral feared for the result. 
In case of a catastrophe, he thought it well hastily to write upon a parchment an abstract of his discoveries, with a request that whoever should find the document would forward it to the King of Spain. Wrapping the parchment in oilcloth, he enclosed it in a wooden barrel, which was thrown into the sea. At sunrise on the 15th of February, the hurricane abated. The two caravels, which had been separated by the storm, again joined company, and after three days they cast anchor at the island of St. Mary, one of the Azores. As soon as they arrived there, the admiral sought to further the accomplishment of the vows made during the storm, and with this object sent half of his people on shore. But these were unhappily made prisoners by the Portuguese, who did not restore them to liberty for five days notwithstanding the urgent remonstrances made by Columbus. The admiral put to sea again on the 23rd of February. Again the winds were contrary, and again, amidst a violent tempest, he took fresh vows in company with all his crew, promising to fast on the first Saturday which should follow their arrival in Spain. At last, on the 4th of March, the pilots sighted the mouth of the Tagus, in which the Nina took refuge, whilst the Pinta, caught by the wind, was carried away into the Bay of Biscay. The Portuguese welcomed the admiral kindly, the king even admitting him to an audience. Columbus was in haste to return to Spain. As soon as the weather permitted, the Nina again set sail, and at midday on the 15th of March she cast anchor in the port of Palos. After seven months and a half of navigation, during which Columbus had discovered the islands of San Salvador, Concepcion, Great Exuma, Long Island, the Mucaras, Cuba, and San Domingo. The court of Ferdinand and Isabella was then at Barcelona, whither the admiral was summoned. He set out immediately, taking with him the Indians whom he had brought from the New World. The enthusiasm he excited was extreme. From all parts, the people ran to look at him as he passed, rendering him royal honors. His entry into Barcelona was magnificent. The king and queen, with the grandees of Spain, received him with great pomp at the palace of the deputation. He there gave an account of his wonderful voyage, and presented the specimens of gold which he had brought with him. Then all the assembly knelt down and chanted the Te Deum, Christopher Columbus was afterwards ennobled by letters patent, and the king granted him a coat of arms bearing this device, To Castile and Leon, Columbus gives a new world. The fame of the Genoese navigator rang through the whole of Europe. The Indians whom he had brought with him were baptized in presence of the whole court, and thus the man of genius, so long poor and unknown, had now risen to the highest point of celebrity. End of First Part, Chapter 7, Part 2B Recording by William Tomko Section 16 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org recording by william tomko celebrated travels and travelers volume one exploration of the world by jules verne first part chapter seven part three christopher columbus the narrative of the adventures of the great genoese navigator had overexcited the minds of the hearers imagination already caught glimpses of golden continents situated beyond the seas all the passions which are engendered by cupidity were seething in the people's hearts the admiral under pressure of public opinion must set forth again with the most brief delay he was himself also eager to return to the theater of his conquests and to yet enrich the maps of the day with more new discoveries he declared himself therefore ready to start the king and queen placed at his disposal a flotilla composed of three large ships and fourteen caravels. Twelve hundred men were to sail in them. Several Castilian nobles, with firm faith in the lucky star of Columbus, decided to try their fortune with him beyond seas. In the holds of the vessels were horses, 
cattle, instruments of all kinds for collecting and purifying gold, grain of various kinds, in a word, everything that might be needful in the establishing an important colony. Of the ten natives brought to Europe, five returned to their country. Three, who were ill, remained behind in Europe. The other two were dead. Columbus was named Captain General of the Squadron with Unlimited Powers. On the 25th of December, 1493, the 17 ships left Cadiz with all sail set amidst the acclamations of an immense crowd of people, and on the 1st of October they cast anchor at the island of Faro, the most westerly of the Canary group. On sailing again, the fleet was favored by wind and sea, and after 23 days of navigation came in sight of new land. At sunrise on the 3rd of November, being the Sunday in the octave of all saints, the pilot of the flagship, the Marie Galante, cried out, Good news! There is land! This land proved to be an island covered with trees. The admiral, thinking it uninhabited, did not stop, but after passing several scattered islets, he arrived before a second island. The first he named Dominica, the second Marie Galante names which they retain to the present day. The next day, a still larger island was in sight, and, says the narrative of this voyage given by Peter Martyr, the contemporary of Columbus, when they were arrived, they saw it was the island of the infamous cannibals, or Caribbees, of whom they had only heard a rumor during the first voyage. The Spaniards, well armed, landed upon the shore, where they found about thirty circular houses built of wood and covered with palm leaves. In the interior of the huts were suspended hammocks made of cotton. In the center of the village were placed two trees, or posts, around which were entwined the dead bodies of two serpents. At the approach of the strangers, the natives fled in haste, leaving behind them several prisoners whom they were preparing to devour. The sailors searched the houses and found both leg and arm bones, heads so newly cut off that the blood was still moist, and other human remains, which left no doubt as to the food consumed by these caribbees. This island, which, with its principal rivers, the admiral caused to be partially explored, was named Guadalupe, on account of the resemblance it bore to one of the Spanish provinces. Some Indian women were carried off by the sailors, but, after having been kindly treated on board the admiral's ship, they were sent back to land, Columbus hoping that this conduct towards the females would induce the men of the place to come on board. But in this he was disappointed. On the 8th of November the signal for departure was given, and the whole fleet sailed for Hispaniola the present San Domingo, and the island upon which Columbus had left thirty-nine of the companions of his first voyage. In turning again towards the north, a large island was discovered, to which the natives, who had been kept on board after having been saved from the jaws of the Caribbees, gave the name of Mandanino. They declared that it was inhabited only by women, and as Marco Polo had mentioned, an Asiatic country which possessed an exclusively feminine population, Columbus was confirmed in the idea that he was sailing upon the coast of Asia. He felt a great desire to explore this island, but the contrary winds completely prevented his doing so. Thirty miles from thence, an island was seen surrounded by high mountains. It received the name of Montserrat, on the next day another, which was called Santa Maria la Rodanda, and on the day following two more islands, St. Martin and Santa Cruz. The squadron anchored before Santa Cruz to take in water. There occurred a scene of grave import, reported by Peter Martyr, in such expressive words that we cannot do better than quote them. The admiral, he says, ordered thirty men from his ship to go ashore and explore the island and these men, being landed on the coast, were aware of four dogs, and as many young men and women coming towards them, extending their arms in supplication, and praying for help and deliverance from the cruel people. The cannibals, on seeing this, fled, as in the island of Guadalupe, and all retired into the forests, and our people remained two days on the island to visit it. During that time, those who had remained with the boat saw a canoe coming towards them from a distance, containing eight men and as many women, 
To these our people made signs, but they, on approaching, began to transpierce ours with their arrows, before they had time to cover themselves with their bucklers, so that one Spaniard was killed by a shaft aimed by a woman, who also transfixed another with a second arrow. These savages had poisoned arrows, the poison being contained in the tip. Amongst them was a woman whom all the others obeyed, bowing before her and this was as they conjectured a queen having a son of cruel appearance robust and with the face of a lion who followed her ours then considering that it was better to fight hand to hand than to wait for greater evils in thus fighting at a distance advanced their boat by rowing and by so great violence did they make it move forward that the stern of the said boat came with such velocity it caused the enemy's canoe to fonder but these indians being very good swimmers without moving themselves either more slowly or more rapidly did not cease both men and women to shoot arrows with all their might at our people and they succeeded in reaching by swimming a rock covered with the water upon which they mounted and still fought manfully nevertheless they were finally taken and one of them slain and the son of the queen pierced in two places when they were taken to the admiral's ship, they showed no less ferociousness and atrocity of mien than if they had been lions of Libya, who felt themselves taken in the net. And such were they that no man could have even looked upon them without his heart trembling with horror, so greatly was their look hideous, terrible, and infernal. From all this it is clear that the strife between the Indians and the Europeans was beginning to be serious. Columbus sailed again towards the north, going in the midst of islands pleasant and innumerable, covered with forests overshadowed by mountains of various hues. This collection of islands was called the Archipelago of the Eleven Thousand Virgins. Soon appeared the island of St. John Baptist, now Puerto Rico, a place infested by Caribbees, but cultivated with care and appearing truly superb from its immense woods some sailors landed upon the shore but only found there a dozen uninhabited huts the admiral put to sea again and sailed along the southern coast of puerto rico for about one hundred and fifty miles on friday the twelfth of november columbus at last reached the island of hispaniola with what emotions must he not have been agitated in revisiting the theatre of his first success in seeking to behold that fortress in which he had left his companions what might not have happened in the course of a year to those europeans left alone in this barbarous land soon a great canoe bringing the brother of the cacique guacanagare came alongside of the marie galante and the indian prince springing on board offered two images of gold to the admiral still columbus sought for his fortress but although he had anchored opposite its site there was no trace whatever to be seen of it with feelings of the deepest anxiety as to the fate of his companions he went on shore what was his dismay when he found nothing left of the fortress but a few ashes what could have become of his compatriots had their lives been the forfeit of this first attempt at colonization the admiral ordered the simultaneous discharge of the cannon from all the ships to announce his arrival at hispaniola but none of his companions appeared Columbus, in despair, immediately dispatched messengers to the cacique Guacanagari, who, on their return, brought sad news. If Guacanagari might be believed, some other caciques, irritated by the presence of the foreigners in their island, had attacked the unfortunate colonists and had massacred them to the last man. Guacanagari himself had received a wound in endeavoring to defend them, and to corroborate his story he showed his leg enveloped in a cotton bandage. Columbus did not believe in this intervention of the cacique, but, resolving to dissimulate, he welcomed Guacanagari kindly when he came on board the next day. The cacique accepted an image of the Virgin, suspended it on his bosom he appeared astonished at the sight of the horses which they showed him these animals having been hitherto quite unknown to himself and his companions when his visit was over he returned to the shore regained the region of mountains and was seen no more the admiral then dispatched one of his captains with three hundred men under his orders to scour the country and carry off the cacique this captain penetrated far into the interior but found no traces of the cacique nor of the unfortunate colonists 
During this excursion, a great river was discovered, and also a fine sheltered harbor, which was named Port Royal. However, in spite of the bad success of his first attempt, Columbus had resolved to found a new colony upon this island, which appeared to be rich both in gold and silver. The natives constantly spoke of mines situated in the province of Cibao, and in the month of January, two gentlemen, Alonso de Hojeda and Corvalan, set out, accompanied by a numerous escort, to verify these assertions. They discovered four rivers having auriferous sands, and brought back with them a nugget which weighed nine ounces. The admiral, on seeing these riches, was confirmed in his idea that Hispaniola was the famous offer, spoken of in the Book of Kings. After looking for a site upon which to build a town, he laid the foundation of Isabella, in a spot at the mouth of a river which formed a harbor, and at a distance of thirty miles east from Monte Cristi, on the Feast of the Epiphany, thirteen priests officiated in the church in presence of an immense crowd of natives. Columbus was now anxious to send news of the colony to the king and queen of Spain. Twelve ships laden with gold collected in the island, and with various specimens of the produce of the soil, were prepared to return to Europe under the command of Captain Torres. This flotilla set sail on the 2nd of February, 1494, and a short time afterwards Columbus sent back one more of the five ships which remained to him, with the Lieutenant Bernard of Pisa, against whom he had cause of complaint. As soon as order was established in the colony of Isabella, the Admiral, leaving his brother behind as governor, set out, accompanied by five hundred men, to visit the mines of Tsibao, the country they traversed seemed to be splendidly fertile vegetables came to perfection in thirteen days corn sown in february was in full ear in april and each year yielded two abundant harvests they crossed successively mountains and valleys where often the pickaxe had to be used to clear a way over these still virgin lands at last the spaniards arrived at Tsibao. There, the admiral caused a fort to be constructed of wood and stone on a hill near the brink of a large river. It was surrounded with a deep ditch, and Columbus bestowed upon it the name of St. Thomas, in derision of some of his officers who were incredulous upon the subject of the gold mines. It ill became them to doubt, for from all parts the natives brought nuggets and gold dust, which they were eager to exchange for beads and above all for the hawks bells of which the silvery sound excited them to dance this country was not only a land of gold it was also a country rich in spices and aromatic gums the trees which bore them forming quite large forests the spaniards considered the conquest of this wealthy island a cause of unmixed congratulation columbus left fifty-six men to guard the fort of st thomas under the command of don pedro de margarita while he returned to Isabella, towards the beginning of April, being much hindered on the road by excessive rain. On his arrival, he found the infant colony in great disorder. Famine was threatening from the want of flour, which could not be obtained, for there were no mills. Both soldiers and workmen were exhausted with fatigue. Columbus sought to oblige the gentlemen to aid them, but these proud hidalgos, anxious as they were to conquer fortune, would not stoop to pick it up and refused to perform any manual labor. The priests, upholding them in this conduct, Columbus, who was forced to act with vigor, was obliged to place the churches under an interdict. He could not spare time to remain any longer at Isabella, but was in haste to make further discoveries. Therefore, having formed a council, composed of three gentlemen and the chief of the missionaries, under the presidency of Don Diego, to govern the colony, he set out on the 24th of April with three vessels to complete the cycle of his discoveries. The flotilla, sailing towards the south, a new island was soon discovered, which was called by the natives Jamaica. The highest point of the island was a mountain of which the sides sloped gently down. The inhabitants appeared clever and much given to the mechanical arts, but they were far from pacific in character, and several times opposed the landing of the Spaniards, who, however, repulsed them, and at length the savages were induced to conclude a treaty of alliance with the admiral. From Jamaica, Columbus pushed his researches more towards the west. 
he imagined himself to be arrived at the point where the old geographers placed the golden region of the west, Chersonesus. Strong currents carried him towards Cuba, along whose coast he sailed for a distance of 666 miles. During this dangerous navigation amongst shallows and narrow passages, he named more than 700 islands, discovered a great number of harbors, and often entered into communication with the natives. In the month of May, the lookout men on board the ships descried a large number of grassy islands, fertile and inhabited. Columbus, on approaching the shore, entered a river of which the water was so warm that the hand could not remain in it, a fact evidently of exaggeration, and one which later researchers have not authenticated. The fishermen of this coast employed a certain fish called the remora, or sucking fish, which fulfilled for them the same office as a dog does for the hunter. This fish was of an unknown species, having a body like a great eel, and upon the back of his head a very tenacious skin, in fashion like a purse, wherewith to take the fishes. They keep this fish fastened by a cord to the boat, always in the water, for it cannot bear the look of the air and when they see a fish or a turtle which there are larger than great bucklers then they loose the fish by slackening the rope and when he feels himself at liberty suddenly and more rapidly than the flight of an arrow he the remora assails the said fish or turtle throws over him his skin in the manner of a purse and holds its prey so firmly be it fish or turtle by the part visible beyond the shell that none can wrest it from him if he be not drawn to the surface of the water. The cord is therefore pulled up and gathered in little by little, and no sooner does he see the splendor of the air than incontinent he lets go of his prey. And the fishermen descend as far as is necessary to take the prey, and they put it on board the boat, and fasten the fish-hunter with as much of rope as is necessary for him to regain his old position and place. Then, by means of another rope, they gave him, for reward, a small piece of the flesh of his prey. The exploration of the coasts continued towards the west. The admiral visited several countries, in which abounded goslings, ducks, herons, and those dumb dogs which the natives eat, as we should kids, and which were probably either almigui or raccoons. As the ships advanced, the sandy channels became narrower and narrower and navigation more and more difficult but the admiral adhered to his resolution of continuing the exploration of these coasts one day he imagined he saw upon a point of land some men dressed in white whom he took for brothers of the order of santa maria de la merced he sent some sailors to open communication with them when it proved to be simply an optical illusion these so-called monks turning out to be great tropical herons to whom distance had lent the appearance of human beings during the first days of june columbus was obliged to stop to repair the ships of which the keels were much damaged by the shallow water on the coast on the seventh day of the month he caused a solemn mass to be celebrated on the shore during the service an old cacique arrived who the ceremony being over offered the admiral some fruits and then this native sovereign pronounced some words which the interpreters thus translated it hath been told us after what manner thou hast invested and enveloped with thy power these lands which were to you unknown and how thy presence has caused great terror to the people and the inhabitants but i hold it my duty to exhort and to warn thee that two roads present themselves before the souls when they are separated from the bodies the one filled with shadows and sadness destined for those who are harmful and hurtful to the human species the other pleasant and delightful reserved for those who in their lifetime have loved peace and the repose of the people therefore if thou rememberest that thou art mortal and that the future retribution will be meted out according to the works of the present life thou wilt take care to do harm to nobody what philosopher of ancient or modern times could have spoken better or in sounder language all the human side of christianity is expressed in these magnificent words and they came from the mouth of a savage columbus and the cacique separated charmed with one another and the more astonished of the two was not perhaps the old native 
The rest of his tribe appeared to live in the practice of the excellent precepts indicated by their chief. Land was common property amongst the natives, as much so as sun, air, and water. The mayum and tuum, cause of all strife, did not exist amongst them, and they lived content with little. They enjoy the golden age, says the narrative. They protect not their possessions with ditches and hedges, they leave their gardens open, without laws, without books, without judges. They by nature follow what is right, and hold as bad and unjust whatever sins against or causes harm to another. Leaving Cuba, Columbus returned towards Jamaica and sailed along the whole of the southern coast as far as the eastern extremity of the island. His intention was to attack the islands of the Caribbees and destroy that mischievous brood. But the admiral was at this time seized with an illness, brought on by watching and fatigue, which obliged him to suspend his projects. He was forced to return to Isabella, where, under the influence of good air and repose, and the care of his brother and his friends, he recovered his health. The colony greatly needed his presence. The governor of St. Thomas had aroused the indignation of the natives by his cruel exactions, and had refused to listen to the remonstrances upon the subject addressed to him by Don Diego, the brother of Columbus. He had returned to Isabella from St. Thomas during the absence of the admiral, and he embarked for Spain upon one of the ships which had just brought Don Bartolomeo, the second brother of Columbus, to Hispaniola. When the admiral regained his health, he resolved to punish the cacique who had revolted against the governor of St. Thomas, feeling that it would be unwise to allow his authority, in the person of his delegates, to be set at naught. In the first place, he sent nine men well armed to take prisoner a bold cacique named Caunabo, the leader Hojeda, with an intrepidity of which we shall have further instances in the future, carried off the cacique from the midst of his own people, and brought him prisoner to Isabella. Columbus afterwards sent Kawanabo to Europe, but the ship in which he sailed was wrecked during the voyage, and he was never heard of more. In the meantime, Antonio de Torres, sent by the king and queen of Spain to compliment Columbus in their names, arrived at San Domingo with four vessels. Ferdinand declared himself highly content with the successes of the admiral, and informed him that he was about to establish a monthly service of transport between Spain and Hispaniola. The carrying off of Caunabo had excited a general revolt amongst the natives, who burned to revenge the chief, so deeply insulted and unjustly carried away. The cacique Guacanagari notwithstanding the share he had had in the murder of the first colonists, alone remained faithful to the Spaniards. Columbus, accompanied by his brother Bartolomeo and the cacique, marched against the rebels and soon met with an army of natives, the numbers of which, with manifest exaggeration, he places at 100,000 men. However numerous it may have been, this army was quickly routed by a small detachment composed of 200 infantry, 25 cavalry, and 25 dogs. This victory, to all appearance, re-established the admiral's authority. The Indians were condemned to pay tribute to the Spaniards. Those living near the mines were ordered to furnish every three months a small quantity of gold, while the others, more distant, were to contribute 25 pounds of cotton. But rebellion had been only curbed, not extinguished. At the voice of a woman, Anna Kaona, widow of Kaonabo, the natives rose a second time, and even succeeded in drawing over the hitherto faithful Guacanagari to their side. The rebels destroyed all the fields of maize and everything else which had been planted, and then retired into the mountains. The Spaniards, seeing themselves thus reduced to all the horrors of famine, indulged their anger by terrible reprisals against the natives. It is calculated that one-third of the island population perished from hunger, sickness, and the weapons of the companions of Columbus. These unfortunate Indians paid dearly indeed for their intercourse with the conquering Europeans. The good fortune of Columbus was by this time on the wane. While his authority in Hispaniola was continually more and more compromised, his reputation and his character were the objects of violent attack in Europe. The officers whom he had sent back to the mother country loudly accused him of injustice and cruelty, 
They even insinuated that he sought to render himself independent of the king, and against all these attacks, Columbus, being absent, could not defend himself. Ferdinand, influenced by this unworthy discourse, chose a commissioner whom he ordered to proceed to the West Indies and to examine into the truth of the accusations. This gentleman was named Juan de Aguado, and the choice of such a man to fulfill such a mission, possessing as he did a mind both prejudiced and partial, was not a happy one. Aguado arrived at Isabella in the month of October, at the time when the admiral was absent on an exploring expedition, and began at once to treat the brother of Columbus with extreme haughtiness, while Diego, on his side, relying upon his title of governor-general, refused to submit to the commands of the royal commissioner. Aguado soon considered himself ready to return to Spain, although the examination he had made was a most incomplete one, when a fearful hurricane occurred, which sank the vessels which had brought him over in the harbor. There now remained only two caravels at Hispaniola, but Columbus, who had returned to the colony, acting with a greatness of soul which cannot be too much admired, placed one of these ships at the disposal of the commissioner with the proviso that he himself would embark in the other to plead his cause in person before the king so matters stood when the news arriving at the discovery of fresh gold mines in hispaniola caused the admiral to put off his departure covetousness was a power strong enough to cut short all discussions there was no longer any mention of the king of spain nor of the inquiry which he had ordered Officers were sent off to the new auriferous ground, finding their nuggets of which some weighed as much as twenty ounces, and a lump of amber of the weight of three hundred pounds. Columbus ordered two fortresses to be erected for the protection of the miners, one on the boundary of the province of Tsibao, the other upon the banks of the river Hena. Having taken this precaution, he set out for Europe, full of eagerness to justify himself. The two caravels sailed from the harbor of St. Isabella on the 10th of March, 1496. On board of the admiral's ship were 225 persons and 30 Indians. On the 9th of April, he touched at Marie Galante, and on the 10th at Guadalupe to take in water. Here there occurred a sharp skirmish with the natives. On the 20th, he left this inhospitable island, and for a whole month he had to contend with contrary winds. On the 11th of June, land was sighted in Europe, and on the next day, the caravels entered the harbor of Cadiz. This second return of the great navigator was not welcomed, as the first had been, by the acclamations of the populace. To enthusiasm had succeeded coldness and envy. The companions, even of the admiral, took part against him discouraged as they were with illusions destroyed and not bringing back that wealth for the acquisition of which they had encountered so many dangers and submitted to so much fatigue they became unjust and forgot that it was not the fault of columbus if the mines hitherto worked had been a source of expense rather than of profit however the admiral was received at court with a certain measure of favor the narrative of a second voyage doing much to reinstate him in public opinion and who could deny that during that expedition he had discovered the islands of dominica marie galante guadalupe montserrat santa maria santa cruz puerto rico jamaica had he not also carried out a new survey of cuba and san domingo columbus fought bravely against his adversaries even employing against them the weapon of irony to those who denied the merit of his discoveries he proposed the experiment of making an egg remain upright while resting upon one end and when they could not succeed in doing this the admiral breaking the top of the shell made the egg stand upon the broken part you had not thought of that said he but behold it is done end of first part chapter seven part three recording by william tomko Section 17 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 7, Part 4. Columbus had not yet given up the hope of pursuing his conquests on the further side of the Atlantic Ocean. No fatigue, no injustice from his fellow men could stop him. After having triumphed, although not without difficulty, over the malice of his enemies, he succeeded in organizing a third expedition under the auspices of the Spanish government. The king granted him eight vessels, forty cavalry soldiers, and one hundred infantry, sixty sailors, twenty miners, fifty laborers, twenty workmen of various trades, thirty women, some doctors, and even some musicians. The admiral obtained the concession besides that all the punishments in use in Spain should be changed into transportation to the islands. He was thus the precursor of the English in the intelligent idea of peopling new colonies with convicts whom labor was to reform. Columbus put to sea on the 30th of May, 1498, although he was still suffering from gout and from the various mental trials which he had experienced since his return. Before starting, he learnt that a French fleet was lying in wait off Cape St. Vincent, with the purpose of hindering the expedition. To avoid it, Columbus made for Madeira, and anchored there. From that island he dispatched all his vessels, except three, to Hispaniola under the command of the captains Pedro de Arana, Alonso Sanchez of Carabajal, and Juan Antonio Columbus one of his own relations, while he, with a large ship and two caravels, bore down to the south with the intention of crossing the equator and seeking for more southern countries, which, according to the general opinion, must be even richer in all kinds of productions. On the 27th of June, the small flotilla touched at the islands of Sel and of Santiago, which form part of the Cape Verde group it sailed again on the fourth of july and made three hundred sixty miles to the southwest experiencing long calms and intense heat on arriving abreast of sierra leone it steered due west and at midday on the thirty first of july one of the sailors raised the cry of land it was an island situated at the northeastern extremity of south america and very near the coast the admiral gave it the name of trinidad and all the crews chanted the salve regina in sign of thankfulness on the morrow the first of august at fifteen miles from the part of the land which had been first seen the three vessels were moored near to the point of alcatraz and the admiral sent some of his sailors ashore to obtain water and wood the coast appeared to be uninhabited but numerous footprints of animals were observed made as was thought by goats. On the 2nd of August, a long canoe, manned by twenty-four natives, came towards the ships. These Indians, tall of stature and paler in color than those of Hispaniola, wore upon the head a turban formed of a cotton scarf of brilliant colors and a small skirt of the same material around the body. The Spaniards endeavored to entice them on board by showing them mirrors and glass trinkets the sailors even executing lively dances in the hope of inspiring them with confidence but the savages taking fright at the sound of a tambourine which seemed to them a sign of hostility discharged a flight of arrows and directed their canoe towards one of the caravels whose pilot endeavored to reassure them by steering towards them but in vain the canoe soon made off and was seen no more Columbus again set sail, and discovered a new island, which he called Gracia, but what he imagined to be an island was in reality a portion of the American coast, and that part of the shore of Venezuela, which, being intersected by the numerous branches of the Orinoco, forms the delta of that river. On this day, the continent of America, although unknown to him, was really discovered by Christopher Columbus in that part of venezuela which goes by the name of province of cumana between this coast and the island of trinidad there is a dangerous gulf the gulf of paria in which a ship can with difficulty resist the currents which flows toward the west with great rapidity the admiral who believed himself to be in the open sea was exposed to great peril in this gulf where the rivers falling into the sea from the continent and being swollen at that time by an accidental flood poured great masses of water upon the ships 
Columbus, in writing to the king and queen, describes this incident in the following terms. Being up on deck at an advanced hour of the night, I heard a kind of terrible roaring. I tried to see through the darkness, and all at once I beheld a sea like a hill, as high as the ship, advancing slowly from the south towards my vessels. Opposing this great wave was a current which met it with a frightful noise. I had no doubt then that we should be engulfed, and even now the remembrance causes me a feeling of horror. By good fortune, however, the current and the wave passed us, going towards the mouth of the canal, where, after long strife, they gradually sank to rest. Notwithstanding the difficulties of the navigation, Columbus continued to explore this sea, of which the waters became gradually calmer as he sailed northwards. He discovered various headlands. One of them was to the east of the island of Trinidad, and called the Cape of Pera Blanca. Another was on the west of the promontory of Paria, and named Cape Lapa. Several harbors were also noticed, amongst others one situated at the mouth of the Orinoco, to which was given the name of the Port of Monkeys. Columbus landed on the shore, west of Point Cumana, and received a kindly welcome from the numerous inhabitants. Towards the west, beyond the point of Alcatraz, the country was magnificent, and there, according to the natives, much gold and pearls were to be obtained. Here the admiral would gladly have remained for some time if he could have found a safe anchorage, but as this was impossible, he felt it best to make for Port Isabella, especially as his crews were worn down by fatigue and his own health much affected. Besides the sufferings, he experienced from the bad state of his eyesight. So he sailed onwards along the Venezuelan coast, making friends as far as possible with the natives. These Indians were agreeable in feature, and of magnificent physique. Their dwellings displayed a certain amount of taste, their houses being built with facades in front and containing articles of furniture ingeniously made. The natives wore plates of gold as ornaments upon their necks. As to the country, it was superb. The rivers, the mountains, the immense forests made it a real land of delight. So the admiral gave this beautiful country the name of Gracia, and by many arguments he tried to prove that in this spot was situated that terrestrial paradise once inhabited by Adam and Eve, being the cradle of the whole human race. To explain to a certain degree this idea of the great navigator, we must not forget that he imagined himself all this time to be on the shores of Asia. This spot, which delighted him so much, he called the Gardens. On the 23rd of August, after having, at the expense of much danger and fatigue, overcome the perils of this bay, Columbus issued from the Gulf of Perea, by the narrow strait to which he gave the name, retained to this day of the Dragon's Mouth. Arrived in the open sea, the Spaniards discovered the island of Tobago, situated to the northeast of Trinidad, and then, more to the north, the island of Concepcion, now known as Grenada. They next steered to the southwest, and returned towards the American coast, after sailing along which for 120 miles, they discovered, on the 25th of August, the populous island of Margarita, and afterwards the island of Cubaga situated very close to the mainland. At this place the natives had established a pearl fishery, and busied themselves in collecting this valuable product. Columbus sent a boat on shore, when a very profitable traffic was carried on, the natives giving in exchange for broken pottery, or hawks' bells, pounds weight of pearls, some of which were very large, and of the finest water. The admiral stopped at this point of his discoveries. The temptation was strong to explore this country, but both officers and crews were exhausted. Orders were therefore given to start for San Domingo, where matters of the gravest moment demanded the presence of Columbus. Before his departure from Hispaniola, he had authorized his brother to lay the foundations of a new town. With this end, Don Bartolomeo had explored the different portions of the island, and having discovered at the distance of 150 miles from Isabella a magnificent harbor at the mouth of a fine river. He there marked out the first streets of a town which became later on the city of San Domingo. Here Don Bartolomeo fixed his residence, while Don Diego remained as governor of Isabella. By this arrangement, Columbus's two brothers had the whole administration of the colony in their hands. 
but there were many malcontents who were ready to revolt against their authority, and it was while this bad spirit was abroad that the admiral arrived at San Domingo. He approved of all that his brothers had done, their administration having been, in fact, marked by great wisdom, and he published a proclamation recalling to their obedience the Spaniards who had revolted. On the 18th of October, he dispatched five ships to Spain, and with them an officer commissioned to inform the king of the new discoveries and of the state of the colony, endangered by the fomenters of disorder. Meanwhile, the affairs of Columbus had taken a bad turn in Europe. Since his departure, calumnies against him and his brothers had been ever on the increase. Some rebels who had been expelled the colony denounced the encroaching dynasty of the Columbus family, thus exciting the jealousy of a vain and ungrateful monarch. Even the queen, until now the constant patroness of the Genoese navigator, was indignant at the arrival on board the vessels of three hundred Indians who had been torn from their country and who were treated as slaves. Isabella did not know that this abuse of power had been carried out unknown to Columbus and during his absence. He was held responsible for it, and to inquire into his conduct, the court sent to Hispaniola a commander of the order of Calatrava, named Francis de Bovadilla, to whom were given the titles of governor-general and intendant of justice. He was in reality meant to supersede Columbus. Bovadilla, invested with discretionary powers, set out with two caravels towards the end of June, 1500. On the 23rd of August, the colonists sighted the two ships, which were then endeavoring to enter the harbor of San Domingo. At this time, Christopher Columbus and his brother Bartolomeo were absent, engaged in superintending the erection of a fort in the province of Jaragua. Don Diego was commanding in their absence. Bovadilla landed and went to hear mass, displaying during the ceremony a very significant ostentation. Then, having summoned Don Diego before him, he ordered him to resign his office into his hands. The admiral, warned by a messenger of what was occurring, arrived in great haste. He examined the letters patent brought by Bovadilla, and having read them, he declared his willingness to recognize him as intendant of justice, but not as governor-general of the colony. Then, Bovadilla gave him a letter from the king and queen, couched in the following terms. Don Christopher Columbus, our admiral in the ocean. We have ordered Commander Don Francis Bovadilla to explain to you our intentions. We command you to give credit to and to execute whatever he shall order on our part. I the king, I the queen. In this letter, the title of Viceroy, appertaining to Columbus by the solemn convention signed by Ferdinand and Isabella, was not even mentioned. Columbus, suppressing his just indication, quietly submitted. Then arose against the fallen admiral a whole host of false friends. All those who owed their fortune to Columbus turned against him, accusing him of having desired to render himself independent. Foolish calumnies! How could this idea have occurred to the mind of a foreigner, a Genoese, alone in the midst of a Spanish colony? Bovadilla found the moment propitious for harsh measures. Don Diego was already imprisoned, and the governor soon ordered Don Bartolomeo and Christopher Columbus himself to be put in fetters. The admiral, accused of high treason, was placed with his two brothers on board a vessel bound for Spain. Under the command of Alfonso de Viejo, that officer, a man of feeling, and ashamed of the treatment to which Columbus was exposed, wished to strike off his chains. But Columbus refused. He, the conqueror of a new world, would arrive loaded with chains in that kingdom of Spain, which he had so greatly enriched. The admiral judged rightly in thus acting, for public opinion was revolted by the sight of him in this depth of humiliation, bound like a felon and treated as a criminal. Gratitude towards the man of genius asserted itself against the bad passions which had been so unjustly excited, and there arose a cry of indignation against Bovadilla. The king and queen, swayed by the feelings of the people, loudly blamed the conduct of the commander and addressed an affectionate letter to Columbus, inviting him to present himself at court. Thus a bright day again dawned for Columbus. He appeared before Ferdinand not as the accused, but as himself the accuser.
Then, his fortitude giving way under the remembrance of the unworthy treatment he had experienced, this unfortunate great man wept, and caused those around to weep with him. He pointed proudly to the story of his life. He showed himself to be almost without resources. He, whom they accused of ambition, and of enriching himself out of the government of the colony. Verily, the man who had made the discovery of a world did not possess a roof to shelter his own head. Isabella, ever good and compassionate, wept in company with the old sailor, and for some time could not make him any answer, so choked was she with her tears. At length she was able to utter some affectionate words. In assuring Columbus of her protection, she promised to avenge him of his enemies. She excused the bad choice they had made in sending this Bovadilla to the islands, and she declared he should expiate his guilt by an exemplary punishment. In addition, she desired the admiral to allow some time to elapse before returning to his government, in order that the minds of prejudice against him might return to sentiments of honor and justice. The mind of Christopher Columbus was calmed by the gracious words of the queen. He showed himself content with his reception, and admitted the necessity of the delay enjoined upon him by Isabella. The chief wish of his heart was again to serve his adopted country and its sovereigns, and he sketched out grand designs of what still remained to be attempted in the way of discovery. His third voyage, in spite of its short duration, had not been without fruit, but had enriched the map with such new names as Trinidad, the Gulf of Paria, the coast of Cumana, the islands of Tobago, of Granada, of Margarita, and of Cubaga. End of First Part, Chapter 7, Part 4 Recording by William Tomko Section 18 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1 Exploration of the World by Jules Verne First Part, Chapter 7, Part 5 Christopher Columbus Christopher Columbus saw himself now reinstated in favor, as he deserved to be, at the court of Ferdinand and Isabella. Perhaps the king may have still evinced a certain degree of coldness towards him, but the queen was his avowed and enthusiastic protectress. His official title as viceroy had not, however, been restored to him. But the admiral, with his usual magnanimity, did not demand it. He had the satisfaction of being Bovadilla, deposed partly for his abuse of power, and partly because his conduct towards the Indians had become atrocious his inhuman proceedings towards them being pushed to such a length that under his administration the native population of hispaniola sensibly decreased during this time the island began to fulfil the hopes of columbus who had prophesied that in three years the crown would derive from it a revenue of sixty millions gold was obtained in abundance from the best worked mines a slave had dug up on the banks of the Hena a mass equal in weight to thirty six hundred golden crowns it was easy to foresee that the new colonies would yield incalculable riches the admiral who could not bear to remain inactive earnestly demanded to be sent on a fourth voyage although he was by this time sixty six years of age in support of his request he adduced some very plausible reasons one year before the return of Columbus, the Portuguese navigator Vasco da Gama had returned from the Indies after having doubled the Cape of Good Hope. Columbus felt certain that by sailing to India by the much safer and shorter western route, the Spaniards might enter into profitable competition with the Portuguese traders. He constantly maintained believing, as he did, that he had been alongside the Asiatic territory, that the islands and continents discovered by him were only separated by a strait from the Maluccas. He therefore wished, without even returning to Hispaniola, and the colonies already settled, to direct his course at once to the Indies. It is evident that the ex-viceroy had again become the hardy navigator of his earlier years.
The king agreed to the admiral's request, and placed him in command of a flotilla composed of four vessels, the Santiago, Gallego, Vizcaino, and a caravel, as admiral's galley. These ships were of small tonnage, the largest being only of seventy tons, and the smallest of fifty. They were, in fact, little better than coasting vessels. Columbus left Cadiz on the 9th of May, 1502, with crews numbering in all 150 men. He took with him his brother Bartolomeo and his son Fernando, the child of his second marriage, and at this time scarcely 13 years old. On the 20th of May, the vessel stopped at Gran Canaria, and on the 15th of June arrived at Martinique, one of the Windward Islands. Afterwards, they touched at Dominica, Santa Cruz, and Puerto Rico, and at length, after a prosperous voyage, reached Hispaniola on the 29th of June. The intention of Columbus, acting on the Queen's advice, was not to land upon the island whence he had been so unworthily expelled, but his badly constructed ship was scarcely seaworthy, and repairs to the keel were greatly needed. Therefore, the admiral demanded permission of the governor to enter the harbor. The new governor, successor to Bovadilla, was a just and moderate man, a knight of the order of Alcantara, named Nicholas Ovando. His excessive caution, however, made him fear that the presence of Columbus in the colony might be a cause of disorder. He therefore thought it right to refuse the request. The admiral concealed the indignation which such treatment could not but cause him, and returned good for evil by offering wise counsel to the governor in the following instance. The fleet which was to take Bovadilla back to Europe, and to bear with it, besides the enormous lump of gold already mentioned, other treasures of great value, was ready to put to sea. But the weather was very threatening, and Columbus, with the sailor's penetration, having observed the signs of an approaching storm, implored the governor not to expose the ships and passengers to such danger. Ovando would not listen to the advice, and the ships put to sea. Scarcely had they reached the eastern point of the island before a terrible hurricane arose, causing twenty-one of the ships to founder with all on board. Bovadilla was drowned, and with him the greater part of the enemies of Columbus. But by an exception which may be called providential, the ship which carried the poor remains of the admiral's fortune escaped destruction. In this storm, ten millions worth of gold and precious stones was engulfed by the ocean. Meanwhile, the four caravels of Columbus, denied access to the harbor, had been driven before the storm. They were separated one from the other, and disabled, but they succeeded in meeting together again. And, by the 14th of July, the squall had carried them within sight of Jamaica. Arrived there, strong currents bore them towards the islands called the Queen's Garden, and then in the direction of east-southeast. The little flotilla contended for sixty days against the wind without making more than 210 miles, and at length was driven towards the coast of Cuba, which led to the discovery of Cayman and Pinos Islands. Columbus then steered to the southwest, sailing upon seas hitherto unvisited by any European ship, and throwing himself once more into the course of discovery with all the passionate ardor of a navigator chance conducted him towards the southern coast of america he discovered the island of guanaja on the thirtieth of july and on the fourteenth of august he touched at cape honduras that narrow strip of land which prolonged by the isthmus of panama unites the two continents of america thus for the second time columbus without being aware of it approached the real soil of america for more than nine months he followed the windings of these shores in the face of all kinds of perils and difficulties and succeeded in laying down the chart of the coast from the part since named trujillo as far as the gulf of darien each night he cast anchor that he might not be driven far from the shore and at length reached that eastern extremity of the coast where it ends abruptly in the cape gracias a dios this cape was doubled on the fourteenth of september but the ships encountered contrary winds so violent that even the admiral himself the oldest sailor of the cruise had never before experienced the like he relates this terrible episode in his letter to the king of spain in the following terms
During eighty-four days the waves continued their assaults, nor did my eyes perceive sun, nor stars, nor any planet. The seams of my vessels gaped, my sails were torn, tackle, boats, rigging, all were lost. My sailors, ill and frightened, devoted themselves to the pious duties of religion. No one failed to promise pilgrimages, and all confessed to each other, thinking that each moment might prove their last. I have seen many tempests, but never have I experienced any of such duration and violence. Many of my men who passed for intrepid sailors lost courage, but that which broke my heart was the pain of my son, whose tender age added to my despair, and whom I saw the prey of greater suffering, greater torments, than fell to the lot of any one amongst us. But it was doubtless no other than God who bestowed upon him such energy, that it was he alone who animated the courage, and reawakened the patience of the sailors under their severe toil. In a word, looking upon him, one might have fancied him a sailor who had grown older in contending with storms, an astonishing fact, almost incredible, but one which awakened some gleam of joy amidst the sorrows which overwhelmed me. I was ill, and several times I thought my last hour was near. To complete my misery comes the thought that twenty years of service, of fatigues and perils, have brought me no profit and i find myself to-day unpossessed of even a roof to shelter me in spain and forced to betake myself to an inn when i would obtain repose or food and when there i often find myself unable to pay my reckoning do not these lines indicate clearly the intensity of sorrow which overwhelmed the soul of columbus in the midst of such dangers and anxieties how could he preserve the energy needful to command an expedition throughout the duration of the storm the ships had been following the line of coast which successively bears the names of honduras mosquito nicaragua costa rica veragua and panama the twelve limonere islands being also discovered at this time and at last on the twenty fifth of september columbus cast anchor between the small island of huerta and the continent on the 5th of October, he again set sail, and after having taken the bearings of the Bay of Almirante, he anchored opposite to the village of Carriaz. There he remained until the 15th of October, the repairs of the vessels, meanwhile, going actively forward. Columbus now believed himself to be arrived near the mouth of the Ganges, and from the native speaking of a certain province of Tsiguare, which was surrounded by the sea, he felt himself confirmed in this opinion they declared that it was a country containing rich gold mines of which the most important was situated seventy-five miles to the south when the admiral again set sail he followed the wooded coast of viragua where the indians appeared to be very wild on the twenty sixth of november the flotilla entered the harbor of el retrete which is now the port of escribanos the ships battered by the winds were now in a most miserable plight it was absolutely necessary to repair the damage they had sustained and for this purpose to probing the stay at el retrete upon quitting this harbor columbus was met by a storm even more dreadful than those which had preceded it during nine days he says i remained without hope of being saved never did any man see a more violent or terrible sea it was covered with foam the wind permitted no ships to advance, nor to steer towards any cape. I was kept in that sea, of which the waves seemed to be of blood, and the surges boiled as though heated by fire. Never have I seen so appalling an aspect of the heavens. On fire, during one whole day and night, like a furnace, they sent forth thunder and flame incessantly, and I feared each moment that the masts and sails would be carried away. The growling of the thunder was so horrible that it appeared sufficient to crush our vessels, and during the whole time the rain fell with such violence that one could scarcely call it rain, but rather a second deluge. My sailors, overcome by so much trouble and suffering, prayed for death as putting a term to their miseries. My ships opened in all directions, and boats, anchors, ropes, and sails were once again lost during this long and painful navigation the admiral had sailed one thousand and fifty miles his crew were by this time quite exhausted he was therefore obliged to turn back and to regain the river of viragua 
but not being able to find safe shelter there for his ships, he went a short distance off to the mouth of Bethlehem River, now called the Yebra, in which he cast anchor on the Feast of the Epiphany in the year 1503. On the morrow, the tempest was again renewed, and on the 24th of January, a sudden increase of water in the river caused the cables which held the ships to snap, and the vessels were only saved with great trouble. In spite of all this, the admiral, who never forgot the principal object of his mission in these new countries, had succeeded in establishing regular intercourse with the natives. The cacique of Bethlehem showed a friendly disposition and pointed out a country fifteen miles inland where he said the gold mines were very rich. On the 6th of February, Columbus dispatched a force of seventy men to the spot indicated under the command of his brother, Bartolomeo. After traveling through a very undulating country, watered by rivers so winding that one of them had to be crossed thirty-nine times, the Spaniards arrived at the Auriferous Tracts. They were immense, and extended quite out of sight. Gold was so abundant that one man alone could collect enough of it in ten days to fill a measure. In four hours, Bartolomeo and his men had picked up gold to an enormous amount. They returned to the admiral, who, when he heard their narrative, resolved to settle upon this coast and to have some wooden barracks constructed. The mines of this region were indeed of incomparable richness. They appeared to be inexhaustible, and quite made Columbus forget Cuba and San Domingo. His letter to King Ferdinand evinces his enthusiasm on the subject. One may feel some astonishment at reading the following sentiment from the pen of this great man, one indeed which is neither that of a philosopher nor of a Christian. Gold! Gold! Excellent thing! It is from gold that spring riches! it is by means of gold that everything in the world is done and its power suffices often to place souls in paradise the spaniards set to work with ardor to store up this gold in their ships hitherto the relations with the natives had been peaceable although these people were of fierce disposition but after a time the cacique irritated by the usurpation of the foreigners resolved to murder them and burn their dwellings one day the natives suddenly attacked the spaniards in considerable force and a very severe battle ensued ending in the repulse of the indians the cacique had been taken prisoner with all his family but he succeeded with his children in escaping from custody and took refuge in the mountains in company with a great number of his followers in the month of april a considerable troop of the natives again attacked the spaniards who exterminated a large proportion of them Meanwhile, the health of Columbus became more and more enfeebled. The wind failed him for quitting the harbor, and he was in despair. One day, exhausted by fatigue, he fell asleep, and heard a pitying voice which addressed him as follows, words which shall be given verbatim, for they bear the imprint of that kind of ecstatic religious fervor which gives a finishing touch to the picture of the great navigator. O oh, foolish man! why such unwillingness to believe in and to serve thy god the god of the universe what did he more for moses his servant and for david since thy birth has he not had for thee the most tender solicitude and when he saw thee of an age in which his designs for thee could be matured has he not made thy name resound gloriously through the world has he not bestowed upon thee the indies the richest part of the earth has he not set thee free to make an offering of them to him according to thine own will? Who but he has lent thee the means of executing his designs? Bounds were placed at the entrance of the ocean. They were formed of chains which could not be broken through. To thee were given the keys. Thy power was recognized in distant lands, and thy glory was proclaimed by all Christians did god even show himself more favorable to the people of israel when he rescued them from egypt did he favor david more when from a shepherd boy he made him king of judah turn to him confessing thy fault for his compassion is infinite thine old age will prove no obstacle in the great actions which await thee he holds in his hands a heritage the most brilliant was not abraham a hundred years old and had not sarah already passed the flower of her youth when isaac was born thou seekest an uncertain help answer me who has exposed thee so often to so many dangers 
Is it God or the world? God never withholds the blessings promised to his servants. It is not his manner, after receiving a service, to pretend that his intentions have not been carried out, and to give a new interpretation to his desires. It is not he who seeks to give to arbitrary acts a favorable color. His words are to be taken literally. All that he promises he gives with usury. Thus does he ever. I have told thee all that the Creator has done for thee. At this very moment he is showing thee the prize and the reward of the perils and sufferings to which thou hast been exposed in the service of thy fellow men. And I listened to this voice, overcome though I were with suffering, but I could not muster strength to reply to these assured promises. I contented myself by deploring my fault with tears. The voice concluded with these words, Take confidence, hope on. The record of thy labors will, with justice, be engraved on marble. Columbus, as soon as he recovered, was anxious to leave this coast. He had desired to found a colony here, but his crews were not sufficiently numerous to justify the risk of leaving a part of them on land. The four caravels were full of wormholes, and one of them had to be left behind at Bethlehem. On Easter Day, the admiral put to sea, but scarcely had he gone ninety miles before a leak was discovered in one of the ships. It was necessary to steer for the coast with all speed, and happily Portobello was reached in safety, where the ship was abandoned, her injuries being irreparable. The flotilla consisted now of but two caravels, without boats, almost without provisions, and with seven thousand miles of ocean to traverse, it sailed along the coast, passed the port of El Retrete, discovered the group of islands called the Mulatas, and at length entered the Gulf of Darien. This was the farthest point east reached by Columbus. On the 1st of May, the admiral steered for Hispaniola. By the 10th, he was in the sight of the Cayman Islands, but he found it impossible to make head against the winds which drove him to the northwest nearly as far as Cuba. There, while in shallow water, he encountered a storm, during which anchors and sails were carried away, and the two ships came into collision during the night. The hurricane then drove them southwards, and the admiral at length reached Jamaica with his shattered vessels, casting anchor on the 23rd of June in the harbor of San Gloria, now called the Bay of Don Christopher. Columbus wished to have gone to Hispaniola, where he would have found the stores needful for revictualizing the ships, resources which were absolutely wanting in Jamaica. But his two caravels, full of wormholes, like two beehives, could not without danger attempt the ninety miles voyage. The question now arose how to send a message to Ovando, the governor of Hispaniola. The caravels leaded water in every direction and the admiral was obliged to run them aground. He then tried to organize a life in common upon shore. The Indians at first gave him assistance, and furnished the crews with the provisions of which they were in need. But the miserable and much-tried sailors showed resentment against the admiral. They were ready for revolt, while the unfortunate Columbus, exhausted by illness, was confined to a bed of pain. It was in these trying circumstances that two brave officers, Mendez and Fieschi, proposed to the admiral to attempt to cross from Jamaica to Hispaniola in Indian canoes. This was in reality a voyage of six hundred miles, for it was necessary to row along the coast as far as the port where the colony was established. But these courageous officers were ready to face every peril when it was a question of saving their companions. Columbus, appreciating the boldness of a proposal, which under other circumstances he would himself have been the first to make, gave the required permission to Mendez and Fieschi, who set out, while he, without ships, almost without provisions, remained with his crew upon this uncultivated island. Soon the misery of the shipwrecked people, for so we may fairly call them, became so great that a revolt ensued. The admiral's companions, blinded by their sufferings, imagined that their chief dared not return to the harbor in Hispaniola, to which Ovando had already denied him entrance. They thought his proscription applied to them equally with the admiral, and said among themselves that the governor, in excluding the flotilla from the harbors of the colony, must have acted under orders from the king. 
These absurd reasonings irritated minds already badly disposed, and at length, on the 2nd of January, 1504, two brothers named Porras, one the captain of one of the caravels, and the other the military treasurer, placed themselves at the head of the malcontents. Their wish was to return to Europe, and they rushed towards the admiral's tent, crying, Castile! Castile! Columbus was ill and in bed. His brother and his son threw themselves between him and the mutineers to defend him. At the sight of the aged admiral, the rebels stopped, and their violence abated. But they would not listen to the admiral's remonstrances and counsels. They did not understand that nothing could save them but general concord, and each, in unselfish forgetfulness, working for the public good. No. Their decision was taken to quit the island, no matter by what means. Poros and his followers ran down to the shore, took possession of the canoes of the natives, and steered for the eastern extremity of the island. Arrived there, with no respect left for anything, and drunk with fury, they pillaged the Indians' dwellings, thus rendering the admiral responsible for their deeds of violence, and they dragged some unfortunate natives on board of the canoes which they had stolen. Poros and his companions continued their navigation, but when several leagues from shore they were struck by a gust of wind which placed them in peril, with the object of lightening the canoes, they threw their prisoners overboard. After this barbarous execution, the canoes endeavored, following the example of Mendez and Fieschi, to gain the island of Hispaniola, but in vain. They were continually thrown back upon the coasts of Jamaica. Meanwhile, the admiral, left alone with his friends and the sick, succeeded in establishing order in his little world. But the distress increased, and famine threatened. The natives wearied of providing food for these foreigners, whose sojourn upon their island was so prolonged. Besides, they had seen the Spaniards fighting amongst themselves, a sight which had much destroyed their prestige, and convinced the Indians that these Europeans were nothing more than ordinary mortals. Thus, they no longer respected nor feared them. The authority of Columbus over the native population was diminishing day by day, and an accidental circumstance was needed of which the admiral cleverly took advantage to bring back a renown which was necessary for the safety of his companions. A lunar eclipse, foreseen and calculated by Columbus, was due on a certain day. On the morning of this day, the admiral sent to request an interview with the caciques of the island. They accepted the invitation, and when they were assembled in the tent of Columbus, the latter announced to them that God, desirous of punishing them for their inhospitable conduct and their bad feeling towards the Spaniards, would that evening refuse them the light of the moon. All came to pass, as the admiral had foretold. The shadow of the earth began to conceal the moon, whose disk had the appearance of being eaten away by some formidable monster. The savages, in terror, cast themselves at the feet of Columbus, praying him to intercede with heaven on their behalf, and promising to place all they had at his disposal. Columbus, after some well-feigned hesitation, pretended to yield to the prayers of the natives, under pretext of supplicating the deity he remained in his tent during the whole time of the eclipse only reappearing at the moment when the phenomenon was nearly over then he told the caciques that god had heard his prayer and extending his arm he commanded the moon to reappear soon the disk was seen to issue from the cone of the shadow and the queen of night shone forth in all her splendor from that day forward, the grateful and submissive Indians accepted the admiral's authority as one manifestly delegated to him by the celestial powers. While these events were passing at Jamaica, Mendez and Fieschi had long ago arrived at their destination. These brave officers had reached Hispaniola after a voyage of four days, little short of miraculous, accomplished as it was in a frail canoe they immediately made the governor acquainted with the desperate condition of columbus and his companions ovando in a spirit of malice and injustice detained these officers and after a delay of eight months under pretext of ascertaining the real condition of affairs he dispatched to jamaica one of his own followers a man named diego escobar who was an especial enemy to columbus Escobar, on his arrival at Jamaica, would not communicate with Columbus. 
he did not even land, but contented himself with putting on shore, for the use of the distressed crews, a side of pork and a barrel of wine. Then he again set sail, without having allowed a single person to come on board. This infamous behavior is not too real, although humanity almost refuses to believe in it. The admiral was indignant over this cruel mockery, but he showed no violence, used no recrimination. The arrival of Escobar somewhat reassured the shipwrecked men, for at least it proved that their situation was known. Deliverance was therefore only a matter of time, and the morale of the Spaniards gradually improved. The admiral was desirous of bringing about a reconciliation with Porras and the rebels, who, since their separation, had incessantly ravaged the island, and been guilty of odious cruelties towards the unfortunate natives. Columbus proposed to restore them to favor, but these foolish people only answered his generous overtures by advancing to attack him in his retreat. Those Spaniards who had remained faithful to the cause of order were obliged to take up arms, and they valiantly defended the admiral, losing but one man in this sad affair. They took both the brothers Porras prisoners, and remained masters of the field of battle, then the rebels threw themselves on their knees before Columbus, who, in compassion for the sufferings, granted them pardon. At length, just one year after the departure of Mendez and Fieschi, a ship appeared, equipped by them at the expense of Columbus, which was destined to restore the shipwrecked company to their homes. On the 24th of June, 1504, every one went on board, and, quitting Jamaica, the theater of accumulated miseries, both moral and physical, they set sail for Hispaniola. Arrived in harbor, after a prosperous voyage, Columbus, to his no small surprise, found himself at first received with much respect. The governor, Ovando, as a shrewd man not willing to go against public opinion, doing him honor but this happy temper did not last soon the quarrels recommenced and then columbus unable as well as unwilling to hear more humiliated and even maltreated freighted two ships of which he shared the command with his brother bartolomeo and on the twelfth of september fifteen o four he for the last time set out for europe his fourth voyage had increased geographical knowledge by the discovery of the cayman islands martinique Guanaja, the Limonere Islands, with the coasts of Honduras, Mosquito, Nicaragua, Veragua, Costa Rica, Portobello, and Panama, the Mulatas Islands, and the Gulf of Darien. During this, his last voyage across the ocean, Columbus was destined to be again tried by storms. His own vessel was disabled, and he and his crew were obliged to go on board his brother's ship. On the 19th of October, another fearful hurricane broke the mast of this vessel, which had then to make more than 2,000 miles with incomplete sails. At last, on the 7th of November, the admiral entered the harbor of San Lucar. Here, a sad piece of news was awaiting him. Isabella, his generous protectress, was dead. Who was there now to take an interest in the old Genoese? The admiral was coldly received by the ungrateful and jealous King Ferdinand, who did not even disdain to use subterfuges and delays, hoping thus to evade the solemn treaties given under his sign manual. He ended by proposing to Columbus the acceptance of a small Castilian town, Camon de los Condes, in exchange for his titles and dignities. This ingratitude and faithlessness overwhelmed the aged man. His health, already so much impaired, did not improve, and grief carried him to the grave. On the 20th of May, at Valladolid, at the age of seventy, he rendered up his soul to God with these words, O Lord, into thy hands I resign my soul and body. The remains of Columbus were at first laid in the monastery of St. Francis. In 1513 they were removed to the Carthusian monastery of Seville but it seemed as if, even after death, repose were to be denied to the great navigator, for in 1536 his body was transported to the cathedral of San Domingo. Local tradition affirms that when, after the Treaty of Basel in 1795, the Spanish government, before giving up to France the eastern portion of the island of San Domingo, ordered the removal of the ashes of the great sailor to Havana. 
a canon substituted some other remains for those of Christopher Columbus, and that the latter were deposited in the choir of the cathedral to the left of the altar. Thanks to this maneuver of the canon, whether dictated by a sentiment of local patriotism or by respect to the last wishes of Columbus, who had indicated San Domingo as his chosen place of sepulture, it is not the dust of the illustrious navigator which Spain possesses at Havana, but probably that of his brother Diego. The discovery, so lately made in the cathedral of San Domingo, on the 10th of September, 1877, of a leaden chest containing human bones, and bearing an inscription stating that it encloses the remains of the discoverer of America, seems to confirm in every particular the tradition which has been just mentioned. But after all, it matters little whether the body of Columbus be at San Domingo or at Havana, his name and his glory are everywhere. End of First Part, Chapter 7, Part 5 Recording by William Tomko Section 19 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 1. Exploration of the World by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 8. Part 1a at the same time that the king of portugal john the second dispatched diaz to seek in the south of africa the route to the indies he ordered two gentlemen of his court to find out if it would not be possible to attain the same end by an easier safer and more rapid means by way of the isthmus of suez the red sea and the indian ocean for carrying out such a mission there was needed a clever enterprising man well acquainted with the difficulties of a journey in those regions and possessing a knowledge of the oriental languages or at the very least of arabic this agent must be of a versatile disposition and able to dissemble capable in a word of concealing the real meaning of projects which aimed at nothing less than withdrawing all the commerce of asia from the hands of the mussulmans and arabs and through them from the venetians in order to enrich portugal with it there was living at this time an experienced navigator pedro de cobilum who had served with distinction under alonso v in the war with castile and who had made a long stay in africa it was upon him that john the second cast his eye and alonso de paiva was given him as a colleague they left lisbon in the month of may fourteen eighty seven furnished with detailed instructions and with a chart drawn according to bishop calcedilla's map of the world by the help of which the tour of africa might be made the two travellers reached alexandria and cairo where they were much gratified at meeting with some moorish traders from fez and tlemcen who conducted them to tor the ancient Ezion Geber, at the foot of Sinai, where they were able to procure some valuable information upon the trade of Calicut. Covalum resolved to take advantage of this fortunate circumstance to visit a country which, for more than a century, had been regarded by Portugal with covetous longing, while Paiva set out to penetrate into those regions, then so vaguely designated as Ethiopia, in quest of the famous Prester John, who, according to old travelers, reigned over a marvelously rich and fertile country in Africa. Paiva doubtless perished in his adventurous enterprise, being never again heard of. As for Covalum, he traveled to Aden, whence he embarked for the Malabar coast. He visited in succession Kenanor, Calicut, and Goa, and collected accurate information upon the commerce and productions of the countries bordering on the Indian Ocean, without arousing the fears of the Hindus, who could not suspect that the kind and friendly welcome they accorded to the traveler would bring about in the future the enthrallment and ruin of their country. Kovalam, not considering that he had yet done enough for his country, quitted India, and went to the eastern coast of Africa, where he visited Mozambique, Sofala, long famous for its gold mines, of which 
the reputation, by means of the Arabs, had even reached Europe, and Zyla, the Avalites Portus of the ancients, and the principal town of the Adel coast, upon the Gulf of Oman, at the entrance of the Arabian Sea. After a somewhat long stay in that country, he returned by Aden, then the principal entrepot of the commerce of the east, went as far as Ormuz, at the entrance of the Persian Gulf, and then again, passing up the Red Sea, he arrived at Cairo. John the Second had sent to Cairo two learned Jews to await the arrival of Kovalam, and to one of these, the rabbi Abraham Beja, the traveler gave his notes, the itinerary of his journey, and a map of Africa given to him by a Mussulman, charging Beja to carry them all to Lisbon with the least possible delay. For himself, not content with all that he had done hitherto, and wishing to execute the mission which death had prevented Paiva from accomplishing, he went into Abyssinia, where the Negus, or King, known by the name of Prester John, flattered by seeing his alliance sought by one of the most powerful sovereigns of Europe, received him with the greatest kindness and gave him a high position at his court but to make sure of retaining his services he constantly refused him permission to leave the country although he had married there and had some children Kovalam still longed for his native country and when in fifteen twenty five a portuguese embassy of which alvarez was a member came into abyssinia he witnessed the departure of his countrymen with the deepest regret and the chaplain of the expedition has naively re-echoed his complaints and his grief m ferdinand denis says by furnishing precise information upon the possibility of circumnavigating africa by indicating the route to the indies by giving more positive and extended ideas upon the commerce of these countries and above all by describing the gold mines of sofala and so exciting the cupidity of the portuguese Kovalam contributed greatly to accelerate the expedition of gama if one may believe an old tradition, but one which is unsupported by any authentic document, Gama was descended by an illegitimate line from Alfonso III, King of Portugal. His father, Estevan Ianes de Gama, Grand Alcalde of Sinez and of Silves in the Kingdom of Algarve, and commander of Sizel, occupied a high position at the court of John II he enjoyed great reputation as a sailor so much so that just at the moment when his own unexpected death occurred king john was thinking of giving gama the command of the fleet which he was desirous of sending to the indies by his marriage with doña isabella sodre daughter of juan de resende proveditor of the qualifications of santorem he had several children and amongst them vasco who first reached India by doubling the Cape of Good Hope, and Paul, who accompanied him in that memorable expedition. It is known that Vasco was born at Sinez, but the date of his birth is uncertain. The year 1469 is that generally given. But besides the fact that if this be the correct date, Gama would have been very young, not more than eight and twenty, when the important command of the expedition to the Indies was confided to him. There was discovered twenty years ago, amongst the Spanish archives, a self-conduct to Tangier granted in 1478 to two persons, Vasco da Gama and Limos. It is scarcely probable that such a passport would have been given to a child of nine years of age, so that this discovery would appear to carry back the birth of the celebrated voyager to an earlier date. It seems that from an earlier period of his life, Vasco da Gama was destined to follow the career of a sailor, in which his father had distinguished himself. The first historian of the Indies, Lopez de Castaneda, delights in recalling the fact that he had signalized himself upon the African seas. At one time he was ordered to seize all the French ships lying in the Portuguese ports, in revenge for the capture by French pirates during a time of peace of a rich Portuguese galleon returning from Mina. Such a mission would only have been confided to an active, energetic, and well-tried captain, a clear proof that Gama's valor and cleverness were highly appreciated by the king. About this time he married Dona Caterina de Ataide, one of the highest ladies about the court, and by her he had several children, amongst others Estevam de Gama, who became governor of the Indies, 
and Dom Christovam, who, says Gosher, by his struggle with Ahmed Guerad in Abyssinia, and by his romantic death, deserves to be reckoned amongst the famous adventurers of the 16th century. All doubt as to the precise date of Gama's first voyage is now at an end, thanks to the document in the public library at Oporto, a paper with which Castaneda must have been acquainted, and of which Monsieur Ferdinand Denis has published a translation in the Ancient and Modern Travellers of M. E. Charton. The date may be fixed with certainty for Saturday, the 8th of July, 1497. This expedition had been long ago determined upon, and all its details were minutely arranged. It was to be composed of four vessels of medium size, in order, says Pacheco, that they may enter everywhere and again issue forth rapidly. They were solidly constructed and provided with a triple supply of sails and hawsers. All the barrels destined to contain water, oil, or wine had been strengthened with iron hoops. Large provisions of all kinds had been made, such as flour, wine, vegetables, drugs, and artillery. The personnel of the expedition consisted of the best sailors, the cleverest pilots, and the most experienced captains. Gama, who had received the title of Capitam Moore, hoisted his flag upon the Sam Gabriel of 120 tons. His brother, Paul de Gama, was on board the Sam Raphael of 100 tons. A caravel of 50 tons, the Berrio, so named in memory of the pilot Berrio, who had sold her to Emmanuel I, was commanded by an experienced sailor, Nicolo Coelho, while Pedro Nunez was the captain of a large bark, laden with provisions and merchandise, destined for exchange with the natives of the countries which should be visited. Pero de Alamcar, who had been pilot to Bartholomew Diaz, was to regulate the course of the vessels. The crews, including ten criminals who were put on board to be employed on any dangerous service, amounted to 160 persons. What feeble means these, what almost absurd resources, compared with the grandeur of the mission which these men were to accomplish. On the 8th of July, at sunrise, Gama advanced towards the vessels, followed by his officers through an immense crowd of people. Around him were a number of monks and religious persons, who chanted sacred hymns and besought heaven's protection for the voyagers. This departure from Rastello must have been a singularly moving scene. All, whether actors or spectators, mingling their chants, their cries, their adieux, and their tears, while the sails, filled by a favorable breeze, bore away Gama and the fortune of Portugal towards the open sea. A large caravel and a smaller bark, which were bound for Mina under the command of Bartholomew Diaz, sailed in company with Gama's fleet. On the following Saturday, the ships were in sight of the Canaries, and passed the night windward of Lanzarota. When they arrived parallel with the Rio de Oro, a thick fog separated Paul de Gama, Coelho, and Diaz from the rest of the fleet, but they joined again near the Cape de Verde Islands, which were soon reached. At Santiago, fresh stores of meat, water, and wood were taken on board, and the ships were again put into good sailing order. They quitted the shore of Santa Maria on the 3rd of August. The voyage was accomplished without any remarkable incidents, and on the 4th of November, anchors were dropped upon the African coast in a bay which received the name of Santa Elena. Eight days were spent there in shipping wood and in putting everything in order on board the vessels. It was there that they saw for the first time the Bushmen, a miserable and degraded race of people who fed upon the flesh of sea-wolves and whales as well as upon roots. The Portuguese carried off some of these natives and treated them with kindness. The savages knew nothing of the value of the merchandise which was offered to them. They saw the objects for the first time and were ignorant of their use. Copper was the only thing which they appeared to prize, wearing in their ears small chains of that metal. They understood well the use of the sagayas, a kind of javelin of which the point is hardened in the fire, of which three or four of the sailors, and even Gama himself, had unpleasant experience, while endeavoring to rescue from their hands a certain Veloso, a man who had imprudently ventured into the interior of the country. This incident has furnished Camoens with one of the most charming episodes of the Luciad.
On leaving Santa Elena, Pero de Alemquer, formerly pilot to Diaz, declared his belief that they were then ninety miles from the Cape. But in the uncertainty, the fleet stood off to sea. On the 18th of November, the Cape of Good Hope was seen, and the next day it was doubled by the fleet sailing before the wind. On the 25th, the vessels were moored in the Bay of San Braz, where they remained thirteen days, during which time the boat which carried the stores was demolished, and her cargo divided amongst the three other vessels. During their stay, the Portuguese gave the bushmen some hawks' bells and other objects, which, to their surprise, were accepted for in the time of diaz the negroes had shown themselves timid and even hostile and had thrown stones to prevent the crews from procuring water now they brought oxen and sheep and to show their pleasure at the visit of the portuguese they began says nicholas velho to play upon four or five flutes some set high some low a wonderful harmony for negroes from whom one scarcely looks for music they danced also as dance the blacks, and the Capitam Moor commanded the trumpets to sound, and we in our boats danced too, the Capitam Moor himself dancing, as soon as he had returned amongst us. What shall we say to this little fete, and this mutual serenade between the Portuguese and the Negroes? Would any one have expected to behold Gama, a grave man, as his portraits represent him, initiating the Negroes into charms of the Parvain? unhappily these favorable dispositions were transient and it was found necessary to have recourse to some hostile demonstrations by means of repeated discharges of artillery in this bay of san braz gama erected a padrao which was thrown down as soon as he was gone the fleet soon passed the rio infante the furthest point reached by diaz here the ships experienced the effects of a strong current but of which the violence was neutralized thanks to a favorable wind. On the 25th of December, Christmas Day, the country of Natal was discovered. The ships had sustained some damage, and fresh water was needed. It was therefore urgent for them to find some harbor, which they succeeded in doing on the 10th of January, 1498. The blacks, whom the Portuguese saw here upon landing, were people of greater stature than those whom they had hitherto met with. Their arms were a large bow with long arrows and a zagaye tipped with iron. They were Cafres, a race very superior to the Bushmen. Such happy relations were quickly established with them that Gama gave the country the name of the land of good people, Terra de Bon Gente. A little further on, while still sailing up the coast, two Mussulman traders, one wearing a turban, the other a hood of green satin, came to visit the Portuguese with a young man who, from what could be understood from their signs, belonged to a very distant country, and who said he had already seen ships as large as ours. Vasco da Gama took this as a proof that he was now approaching those Indian lands which had been so long and so eagerly sought. For this reason, he named the river which flowed into the sea at this place Rio dos Bonis Signaeus, River of Good Tokens. Unhappily, the first symptoms of scurvy appeared at this time amongst the crews, and soon there were many sailors upon the sick list. On the 10th of March, the expedition cast anchor before the island of Mozambique, where, as Gama learnt through his Arab interpreters, there were several merchants of Mohammedan extraction who carried on trade with India. Gold and silver, cloth and spices, pearls and rubies formed the staple of their commerce. Gama, at the same time, was assured that in pursuing the line of the coast he would find numerous cities. Whereat we were so joyful, says Velho, in his naive and valuable narrative, that we wept for pleasure, praying God to grant us health, that we might see all that which we had so much desired. End of First Part, Chapter 8, Part 1A Recording by William Tomko.